The podcast on Haunted Hill will contain spoilers and swearing. I am the devil, and I am here to do the devil's work. I saw this Michael. Be one of us. I didn't tell you my name. Hang up. I didn't tell them my name. Hello and welcome to the podcast on Haunted Hill episode 93, 93! 93 baby! Let's get going to maths again, 7 to 100! Well done Gavin! Thank you! <laughs> Your maths is so good! As he uh, uses the abacus next to him. And uh, my name is Gav and this is Dan, we are your Hello. hosts... Uh, on this magical mystery tour. It's not a magical mystery tour at all, it's a podcast about horror movies. Um, we are doing an episode this evening covering more black themed um, films. Dan, what are we doing? Black representation in horror movies specifically. So, celebrating and discussing black representation in horror movies. The two main movies that we are reviewing um, are groundbreaking in their own ways uh, for that reason um, Candyman from 1992. Mm-hmm. Um, probably the first, and if not definitely, the first black supernatural sort of slasher killer. Boogeyman, as it were, in movies. It is a supernatural slasher. Supernatural slasher, isn't it? Yeah. He is. And the fantastic, critically acclaimed Oscar winning... Oscar winning, yes. We don't say that very often of horror, because Oscars sometimes don't... like to go, you don't like horror movies, we yeah, don't like any... them. Silence of the Lambs, um, Exorcist, can't think of many more, but Get Out is the movie that we will be also covering, and that also won an Oscar for Best Original Screenplay for Jordan yeah. Peele. Uh, so we are very excited to be covering both of those movies. I, I love the fact it did win an Oscar because Jordan is such a fucking horror nerd. Uh, the, the whole, I knew this before going into the movie, like research for the movie, but he's such a proper nerd. He's he's like one of us. He's one of the one of the fans, and it's so nice to have him go. I'm going to guide you in a way, but. You know, saying that, you know my uh, thoughts on us. I still struggle with that. I need to watch it again and go through it with more of a dissecting <clears> eye, I feel, but I still struggle with that. I don't want to get into it now. I don't want to get into it. Don't want to get into it now. Well, the reason we are cho- we've are we chosen this as our um, topic, as our theme for this episode, is obviously, as we talked about in the last couple of episodes, there is a lot going on in the news at the moment with Black Lives Matter, and we just wanted to show our support by firstly doing this episode and chatting about black representation within horror, in the horror genre. Um, we're not going to get too deep. At the end of the day, we are two white guys from England uh, in our 40s, uh, Bill and Ted, as it were. Well, this, this, this is this is fucking hilarious. I WhatsApp Dan and said, "Yeah, it's great, Dan, because we can talk about it because we grew up with black culture." He messaged me and says, "No, we we're a couple of white guys who grew up listening to hip hop." And it's like, yeah. I was like, "Ah, oh, <laughs> that's really true." But we've grown, but, but we've kind of grown up with uh, that sort of black representation, as in not a thing. You've grown up in a city. I've grown up in a town where it wasn't a. There wasn't a many of a different coloured apart from white uh, person in this town. It's a very yeah. old fashioned British town. You get the fucking very much the middle aged conservative type people, the sort of people who possibly even sort of uh, wrote Brexit and all that sort of shit. But we don't really. We uh, grew up in a city which obviously had a bit more diversity. Yeah, I mean, Bristol is extremely multicultural, but then at the same time, you know, in the news recently, I found out that it, sadly, it isn't as yeah, uh, that's, that's embra- crazy. all-embracing as I'd like. And Absolutely. I pride myself on, on well, know, being... Well, but... there's another way of looking at that. was just unfortunately just what happened because you had the uh, the water there and the boats for docking, etc., etc. Um, well, Bristol is extremely famous for being um, slave central, essentially. It yeah. was the place where uh, slaves were brought through. But, um, but you know. because of your city being like that, the first statue of the world was pulled down. And then this was, domino yeah. effect around the different cities and uh, around the world of that. So in some ways, that uh, good has come from that. You know, yeah. Then you had, but then you had. Oh my God, England! Yeah, hang on, United Kingdom, Great Britain. Hang on, what? 
United and great. Mm. We had like the races come out, and the guys were like, "No, we won't let you pull these statues down." Like, why? Why not? They if if they could maybe if you were, if it they had to come to in between, put them in a museum. Do you know what I mean? Well, I think that's what they're going to be doing with the statue that was torn down in Bristol. Well, exactly. With regards to that, I kill that argument any time I hear it. I know. And it's by saying, but when somebody says... Don't get too angry, by the way, because I know that me and you to. are fucking passionate when some, whenever, about whenever this. Whenever somebody says, uh, you're taking, you're erasing history, I yeah. just say to them, but what about the Berlin Wall? That was torn down. Did that erase history? No. And people we, still remember that and it's a hugely monumental we, thing that happens we don't need a statue of hitler no we don't you don't need a statue of jimmy savile do you no so we sort of basically sort of grew up with no prejudice whatsoever we just grew up with this uh, this music and like we started to be able to celebrate black culture and that's what it should be like, i think all sort of different different people in the world because really there's only one race you know and the human race the human race and really we should celebrate the different cultures and what these different cultures bring to the other world and infuse the other world with like check out these spices check out this do you know what i'm saying i don't want yeah, to say infuse exactly. in spices but i think that's what i know what you mean i know what you mean it's a metaphor, as in, like, you know, we should celebrate different things as a human yeah. beings, and that's about as simple as it goes. But then again, so then the WhatsApp conversation is quite hilarious. So, coming back to me, sort of saying, it's me and you are pretty much like Bill and Ted doing Black History Month, really, aren't we? <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Party on. Party on, Wayne. No, that's all right. No, no, that's, that's somebody oh, else. Wayne's Wayne. <laughs> That's a couple of other white right. guys. Oh god. So, like I say, we, we are we are going to go through this, and we're going to talk about you know the history of black representation in horror. But you know, I've I've done some research, Gav's done some research, but again, we're not going to pretend to no, know no, more than we know. Um, and we you know we've done research, and we know horror movies, and we know a little tiny bit about black culture, but we certainly but, don't yes. know anything about the struggle or anything else that's going on um, because we we are who we are. But that doesn't mean we cannot appreciate and empathize with people out there um but yeah it's really important for us to do this episode and i hope everybody listening knows that uh, and and you know we, we might lose listeners i doubt it very much but there are people that are worried about saying things I'd being thought, outspoken i'm pretty sure our listener base all, all you lovely listeners are pretty much with us with what we do on a for yeah i meant that more in a I know that some there's shows and there's things out there that people will speak out and then they'll they'll be worried that there'll be backlash. But it's like, do you know what? Though? That's, somebody... that's only if you're saying something negative, though. Yeah, we're not. But then people, even people don't like this is hearing the thing... this kind of shit either. It's which, like... it, which is it, which is silly because even you know, we may even make jokes and such, but we're doing it with, not at. Yeah, exactly. and that's the difference between us and a lot of other people out there. Uh, we, we don't see it as a problem, a thing, or anything. So we just joke and cr- make jokes as human beings. Do you know what I'm saying? That's, and that's how it really should be, and it's just a shame it got to where it is. Anyway, we are not going to get political in this episode, because we could... We're, we'll try not to. The only thing I will say is, uh, and this is the first time we've ever done anything like this, um, this month's patron payout, as it were, that we get from our patrons... We are going to be doubling that with our own money and then donating the entire amount to the Black Lives Matters movement. So just wanted to mention that we're doing that. That's how strongly we feel about it. And we figured, you know, what better way to do it, really, than on an episode where we can talk about two great horror movies um, and chuck a bit of money to a really good calls in our eyes. So there we go, guys. Uh, and the... well, if you listen to this and you want, because, you know, you said you're going to double it, that means, like, quickly... <laughs> join yeah, us I mean, patrons join us we usually say at the end but as always guys if you want to support us and what we represent and what we make and what we do and help the show um to grow and continue to make episodes that hopefully you're enjoying by all means you can join us on patreon uh if you really can't find it or us on patreon then just message gav or i privately on facebook and we'll chuck you the link but we're more than happy to you know have as many patrons as possible because it it helps us really at the end of the day even if you just want to chuck a pound or a dollar a month at us and i do say you can get hold of me on twitter and instagram as well and then on instagram and they're both films oh no sorry podcast on the horn hill on instagram as well indeed indeed and we'll cover give you all that information in the outro like we normally do when we wrap up i was gonna say something else and i totally forgot well, can I? The only movies I've talked, I've watched really, because I've not really been watching an awful lot. I've been quite busy with work. But I did on Sunday afternoon. My my wife did say, "You can have the TV 
for the afternoon and I had a bottle that, of red well, that wine. That was nice of her. And I thought, I know. And I thought, <laughs> with this bottle of red wine, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to watch It Part 1 and Part 2, the new It movies. So I double billed them. It was just over five hours, I think. So it's quite a lot oh, to take I, in. I, I thought it would have been more than a six. So that's not, I suppose, not too bad. Yeah, uh, it was really, really good to do. I know you still haven't seen part two, have you? No, I've only seen the original 90s TV show, part one and part two. And always part two was the one which was a little bit like, uh. Yeah, part two's my favourite out of them. Um, it struck a of real the, struck Of a, the modern uh, and the, uh, the 90s TV show? Or just the uh, modern? <sighs> just the modern. I yeah. only ever watched the 90s show as but one see, long the, see, movie. See, the thing is, the 90s show came out, you and I were going to be more the age of the kids. Yeah. Now you're more the age of the adult. That's true, actually. That's very true, and that's probably why it struck a bit of a, a exactly. nerve with me. Exactly. Um, you understand their perils more and all that jazz. But uh, what I would say is the the last sort of forty five minutes of part two is just off the wall effects, incredible effects, incredible acting, and it's oh. just everything that the book is to me as well. The book's my favourite Stephen King book as well. So I've got to check it out. Yeah. Have you been watching anything? Oh, I know what I was going to say now, very quickly. Uh, let me just quickly say, um, speaking, you're doing the Patreon, thank you very much and all that stuff. Um, I today w- I started working on a sort of possibly a new logo sort of idea. Oh. Because at some point we do need to get some T-shirts done and all that stuff and get some mugs and things. Um, so I started playing around with some stuff. Uh, okay, that's exciting. Little teaser there. Tease, tease. So, well, yeah, possibly just working with the old logo a little bit, but just uh, doing a bit of a revamp. Cool, yeah. Um, could do because you know the rate right we're going we could do that and unveil it for episode 100 now you're talking we could do like some t-shirts and things can we we could do yeah for 100th episode um, um, what have I been watching what have I been watching I have watched a few bits and bobs uh, I did watch Enter the Dragon after you and RJ talked about it I introduced Sarah to it and after she's like I I really, thoroughly enjoyed that. <laughs> just like really like, yeah, yeah I maybe. really like that. And I was like, yeah, straight away, we're like, I was like, just lying in bed Saturday evening, just sort of lying there. And I was like, here's John Saxon on a golf course, doing kung fu in the he- uh, hedges. Yeah, what, 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 what more do you need? What more do you need in life? He's beating up um, the referee from the Karate Kid as well. That one of those guys oh, is the okay. ref from the Karate Kid, which is cool. I, um, I yeah, love watching it again, but the thing was, though, I knew all of the dialogues. That I've watched this so many times as a kid. I knew all of the dialogue. <clears throat> I messaged you. We were messaging back and forth, and we were like, at some point, we've got to do the uh, the uh, New Zealand Bruce Lee. Uh, oh, what? 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 what, <laughs> what, what I know. Over there. Watch, no. Yeah. What's your style? What's your style? <laughs> what's, your, what's your style? <laughs> That guy's such a dick. Yeah. Um, talking of quoting along to things, I guess the only other thing I did watch, really, and it's no, no big news, really, but um, I watched The Burbs again last night, which I'm a massive fan of, as I'm are you. And I've not seen my Blu-ray still yet. And I've had, I've I was had feeling very low um, yeah. yesterday, uh, and my wife poured me a glass of red wine and said, I'm going to go to bed. Why don't you put on The Burbs? So I did, and it was my little comfort blanket, and it cheered me up immensely. And I was, I was on my own, but I was still saying out loud yes. the dialogue as yeah, it's yeah. coming it's so, <laughs> the so question here is garbage and who cleans up this mess you, you, you used to get drunk and just say that to me continuously I wouldn't be able to get you to shut up it'd be remember like when you when start we were, rapping or beatboxing when do you you're remember drunk. when we were writing a script in that hotel bar that time and I started shouting out lines to the point that whole family looked over us and well, you were like can you dude can you shut out yeah we were weren't we we were writing a, a, one of our scripts in that Bar in that Bristol. Was it, that was in security, wasn't it? It was, and uh, I just started shouting out random things from the Clopex. That so yeah, <laughs> it's nice to have those movies that you go back to, though, and you know off by heart. You were fairly drunk on an episode recently. Towards the end of the episode, you really. Whoa, I think it was last episode. Uh, cool. I think it might be the one before last. I did, oh, I did okay. listen back and thought, wow, I need to so, need yeah. to rank it in a bit. Well, I, yeah, yeah, especially as I'm sitting here with water, you know. Well, I am today. Coffee and water today. I did just notice. Yeah, well, you're on a caffeine high instead. Yes, that's what it is. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. What, so else, we, what else going well, on? Obviously, going to sneak in your smelly to- uh, uh, time machine capsule. Oh, yeah, of course. So we're going to 1993 to see yeah. what's been going on there. Um, we've also and got, as you um, said to me earlier, you're like, yeah, not much horror in 93. And I was like, see, see? Because we're waiting for Scream. I... We're waiting for Scream. So as as hip hop fans, we've started looking at um, 
what hip hop was coming out in, 19, in the the years that we visit as well in the time machine yeah. and we've noticed dear sweet listeners a correlation between the drop off in quality of horror movies and the increase in quality of hip hop and there is definitely a correlation between them it's we'll weird, see how that it? pans out yeah it's no, really they, weird they, they will still pan out it, it, they will both uh, the hip hop dips again late 90s as uh, horror rises up I know this yeah. you know it's, it's, there's definitely it's a correlation there it's but weird, this, this is only to, uh, uh, to our fellow uh, hip hop heads out there and no, I, I know there's going to be some of you like fuck off hip hop you know yeah but Gav it's our show so we do what we want indeed indeed but we are still uh, polite to our lovely <clears throat> listeners Daniel we have what well, I love the listeners I, know I love you, you all I know, I love you uh, all. we've also got a little word of the strange um, which comes courtesy of one of our patrons uh, which I'll oh we'll get to that all I'll say is the gentleman out there may be a little disturbed by it the gentleman okay Mm-hmm. I, I, you're speaking primarily to me being the uh, the voice of the audience, aren't you? Mm, I'm just saying. So that's yeah. what we got on this great little episode 93. It's going to be good. I it. even did watch the commentary for Get Out as well. Um, Exciting. Mm, well, funny enough, Jordan Peele is such an interesting character um, because he comes from comedy and sketch. Yes, and you, which comedy, works really well. Yeah, horror. and comedy and horror is one of those things. Some people say, obviously, trying to make a comedy horror film is a very hard thing to do. Um, but comedy and horror do work very well together. And it's so funny that he's quite seamlessly gone on to make a very serious movie, which is going to sit in and take the test of time and still be a, a, a powerful film for many, many years. But with some great comic relief moments in it as well and i feel oh. i don't know maybe this is why like when i watched us i was just so a, a little bit more disappointed it was, just it was quite, so, quite a lot more it serious felt I more suppose. convoluted and more complex do you know what i mean where get out was quite straight in I think a certain the reason, way the reason that he works uh, and the reason and comedy and horror quite often work well together and i'm gonna i'm gonna quote one of our fellow legion brothers court psyops here who appeared recently on um rj mccready's show bite size cinema he, they were talking about um uh return of the living dead and court said the reason they both work together is because they're similar in that there's a build-up of tension and then you get either the punchline if it's comedy or you get the kill or the gore if it's horror and that's the only kind of there's a very close parallel between them two you build up so you're telling the joke or it's an awkward situation and then someone falls over or you're building up and it's an awkward situation and then the man smashes through the glass and rips your face off and yeah so of course i thought it was very interesting and uh yeah i just thought i'd mention that there but we'll get into that when we talk about get out because we've got a lot to say on that movie a lot to say on that movie indeed um yeah okay cool do you want to get into it yeah should we take a wee break and then come back and have a chat about black representation in horror and run through the decades and have a little chat about some films indeed let's uh, All right, then. let's come back in a minute we'll be back in a sec <laughs> This is the Psychosemantic Podcast. Announcing the commencement of the annual purge sanctioned by the U.S. government. Weapons of class 4 and lower have been authorized for use during the purge. All other weapons are restricted. Government officials of ranking 10 have been granted immunity from the purge and shall not be harmed. A few days ago, I called the news the enemy of the people. And they are. They are the enemy of the people. We have Ben Jacobs. That's the Guardian Report. Body slam. Living with a six-year-old. I'm not able to uh, be rushed this fast. It makes me nervous. Well, then you two learned a very important lesson today. Cops don't help. I have this one big pile of shit. It's a prey! Can you fly, Bobby? In the 20th century, the Senate voted on seven Supreme Court nominees during election years, and it approved all but one. So just to, just to put a button on this, are you ruling it out 100%? Yeah. Are you crazy? Is that your problem? Politics, 
movies, political movies, the Psychosemantic Podcast, better known as the Psychosemantic Cast. He did what we all must learn to do. You and you and you and you. Yup. And cover. Cool. So we are back, guys. So what we're going to do before we get into our main reviews is just similarly a lot like we did with our women in horror episode. We're going to we're going to run through kind of like the decades uh, and look at black representation within horror. And obviously, as you guys can probably imagine, some of it isn't particularly well done, uh, particularly when we start off in the 30s and 40s. But it's important to kind of uh, talk about this and, and, and how it's grown and, and changed right up until movies like Get Out have really pushed pushing boundaries. Um, if I'm not going to pretend to know more than I do, and Gav isn't either, you know, like I mentioned in the intro to the show, that we are who we are. But we we know horror movies, and we've done some research uh, on this on this uh, topic. If you want to know more, I cannot recommend enough a documentary which is on Shudder called Horror Noir: A History of Black Horror. It came out last year, 2019. It's an absolutely incredible documentary. I love horror documentaries anyway, Gav. I loved the Friday the 13th one, the Halloween one, all those, all those, because as a horror fan, we're nerds and we love knowing all the silly little bits that go in and what people did and didn't do and me and how films got made. And, and so watching any documentary on horror movies is great, but this one is good as well. The passion that the, these guys have got talking and, and it's obviously they're talking to people like, Tony Todd, Ken Foray, you know, Keith David, that there's so many people in it that you recognize uh, and their their own personal stories of how they saw um, black people represented within horror uh, and then how they moved into that that field, you know. And there's a lot of interviews with with Jordan Peele. So I would say guys, if you want to know more, um firstly, we are going to be posting up a few bits and bobs on our Facebook page courtesy of our patron Kate Pollock. Um, so if you want to learn more about black culture or, or, or diversity or Black Lives Matter and you feel that you want to educate yourself, there is going to be some stuff on our Facebook page. So look out for that. It will be coming uh, on the Facebook page just after we drop this episode. But secondly, if you want to learn more specifically about black representation in horror, I, like I said, I cannot recommend enough this documentary on Shudder. So you don't even need to pay for it. I think Shudder's still got a free trial if you want. And it's called Horror Noir, A History of Black Horror. And it's brilliant. You've seen it as well, haven't you, Gav? I have. I saw it when it first came out. Um, yeah, it was, it was good. It was an enjoyable film. Uh, sorry, documentary. <clears throat> and like with any um, horror documentary, even though, even though this one is particularly about black representation, it's still fun to watch horror grow through the years yeah. and this time they do it through the eye as, yeah, as yeah. that guy so it's, it's awesome 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 um so if we we start off then in the 30s and 40s and we talk about how shit it was black representation was absolutely was, shit is this going to be like the uh, voodoo films yeah all you really had really was, was there were actually a lot of white guys in blackface white zombie stuff like that. they wouldn't they wouldn't even cast black people sometimes they just cast a white guy and black them up which is just ludicrous but it was the 30s and 40s man you know um they they had a real misrepresentation of the culture really the only guy, black people you saw on screen were servants voodoo priests tribesmen that kind of stuff um so yes there may have been horror movies with black representation in the 30s and 40s, that it wasn't great. A servant it was sad, or a bad person. Great. Yeah, or a bad person, mm -hmm. or a tri usually a tribesman. You know, yeah, you yeah, can yeah. just imagine the terrible stereotypes. Yeah. Um, weirdly, then, moving into the 50s and 60s, because that was the kind of era of science fiction and, you know, it came from the desert and uh, radiation, you barely got any black representation at all because... Black people couldn't be scientists in the eyes of Hollywood and filmmaking, so they didn't need to be in a lab while they were researching this giant spider or aliens or whatever it was. Even um, even if a producer, uh, a writer or someone, no more producer because there's the person who has the choice in these departments, if they themselves went, no, no, a black person should be a scientist, there's no issue of that at all, they, they, it's not their say. It's what they feel the mass audience are going to feel. Which yeah. meaning the mass audience feel uh, the fellow black person was an under um, below them, which is just 
you know, it's but, it's naivety and miseducation through the years and so much and just... Uh, the only way that black folk were represented in horror in the 50s and 60s, and it's very difficult to, to talk about, but these subjects need to be discussed because they are important and highlight where things have gone wrong in history. The only way they were um, represented was, unfortunately, as aliens or apes or ape men um, or monsters. Um, particularly during this documentary I've discussed, the Horror Noir, they discuss in there how even the, um, the creature from the Black Lagoon, and it's got the word black in that title, um, that is, is his features represent one of those cartoons you would have seen of a black person back then and there's movies about black people having sex with gorillas and then creating this race of eight men so actually really rough for, for black representation in these decades um so yeah the, not a lot going on here but until we get to the 60s of course um things started picking up a bit particularly with a little black and white movie um called night of the living dead and, and the, the lead, though, wasn't supposed to be black, was he? It was just... He was be, not, no. It, was, it wasn't supposed it was to be supposed anybody. supposed to be, yeah. Do you know, this is what I was thinking earlier. Like, I, I was writing a script, and I've got a character in it. Uh, this person, da 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 30s. I don't at any point say what skin colour. Do you know what I mean? In the scripts. And that can be the same with sex, you know. Um, I believe yeah. um, I believe Alien originally wasn't intended to be... Ripley was to be a woman, but... Sigourney Weaver was fucking great for the role, and mm. it worked. And mm. the same with the same with uh, Dwayne Jones. You know, um, uh, Romero has been asked millions of times, "Why a black guy? Why a black guy?" And he said, "Because he was the best actor yeah. out of all the people I auditioned. He was fucking great." It, it, that that answers the Benny Hill sketch of the film director when he's, "Why did you uh, do this?" Oh, it's because yeah, so all I had to do, and the camera fell over. I was like, oh, okay. It, it was he was the best actor. But, but he, what was Dwayne... doing, he was doing a job which needed to be done regardless of race. He did the good job, you know. But this is this is why Night of the Living Dead is such a film gods movie, as we like to say, because it really was fate. Because that movie now is obviously goes down in history as a fantastic horror movie. It's one. It's probably the first proper zombie movie. But also, it's one of the first movies in which a black guy was just a black guy. You know, he wasn't a, a monster or a Zulu warrior or a voodoo priest. He was a hero. He was a real man. He was a handsome bloke on screen and a real role model for black people to see in this movie. And although, you know, it was a very low budget movie, an independent movie almost, since gathered cult status, but for, 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 the, for them to see him on screen must have been so fantastic. But at the same time, that script was already written knowing that he was going to get shot at the end of the movie. I know. By, by guys that look like lynchers, lynch mobs. You know, they it, look it, like those rednecks. It, it's it's funny that it wasn't, it, you know, regardless, it's the best actor. But the best actor being black and being that character, this, it comes across as like the, the, the message accidentally comes out, but it is a message and it is extremely powerful. And the, it's, like, it's powerful. It's, the black guy cannot win it's is what it's saying to me. It's literally like, oh, oh it's probably probably one of them any he? he's probably a zombie yeah that's just it just kill him yeah just oh, it probably is and the other bit of fate with that movie as well is that as george romero drove the the reels in the boot of his car to the studio on the radio. He, yeah he heard on the radio that martin luther king had been shot so the movie had even more weight um having a black lead in it as well so Dwayne Jones, man, we salute you. What an absolute fucking legend. Uh, he did go on to make a couple of other horror movies, which we'll come up, come on to in just a moment as well. Um, so that was kind of the 60s, really. Really only one movie to talk about then. As we move into the 70s, now I've been quite naive about my... Is this black exploitation? Yeah, so black exploitation was a huge thing in the 70s. Like, and like, I've always... Like your black, black yellow and... Mm, less that. I'll get onto that in a moment. More things like Shaft and those kind like, of movies. Yeah, yeah. So I've always really championed black exploitation. I find it really entertaining and fun. But actually, you know, watching some documentaries and interviews and reading stuff, actually, although it gave a lot of black folk um, jobs, uh, put them on screen, you know, there was even some directors, um, it actually really, mis again, misrepresented, misrepresented them. They were all pimps hoes prostitutes gangsters there was that, yeah, that was all the yeah. black guy was and even though the, a lot of these movies were black made you know 
they and were just that that was that was it that's for them. what i'm saying a lot of them i uh, i think i watched the grindhouse documentary a long time ago and uh, they they were and so they said a lot of them were really happy they a lot of them had the freedom to do what they wanted to do in these these black productions um but again yeah misrepresentation because yeah. it's the mass audience again going to be a mass white audience and what they perceive and what they want to perceive even if it's not reality they and, want and that even to though, be fantasy and even though some of these movies would have been made with a black audience in mind yeah. um they still thinking about the, the the money and the white audience as yeah, well because yeah. you know that's where the money is the bigger audience is going to be the white audience and you're right though there's going to be some of them which are more aimed for the black market i guess and that's why that's why you get little moments in and some of gems. these movies. yeah where, and, and but you get little moments where they say things like fuck the man or you know you, you know the man's not going to get me down or, or sometimes it's white guys like that pam greer will kill or stuff like that so mm. you've got like these little moments in there but but, but, but they really aren't they are a cartoon um interpretation of, uh, yeah it is but then we did get a blackula i i, I uh, was saying i do like i do like the fact it did other things as well like they gave the careers to some of these people uh pam greer etc etc but you also got then Tarantino taking this stuff, this art form, and going, oh wow, I'm going to spin this because he's a very controversial person for using the N word. Samuel Jackson yeah, has yes. defended it before uh, him saying it and stuff. I can't give reasons for it. And I'm not going to even. There's an to argument paraphrase. both ways. There is, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. Um, but I love the fact that he's taken these films and put them into a modern edge and brought them to the the. I guess he's doing a white spin on it, I suppose. Well, I mean, black exploitation is just but, one of the many subgenres of exploitation films. But so the you've film got... he's doing, no, no, Jackie Brown, that was he's making that for an audience. He's not making yeah. that for a coloured audience. He's making it for yeah. as, in, as in any colour. I mean, he's making it for an audience, and it and it, it goes across and all audiences. And it, I love the fact that uh, Pam Greer had this amazing career from it, and people like that, you know. Indeed, indeed, definitely. And like I say, we did get some you know, horror movies in the 70s. We had Blackula, which, although sounds like a silly movie, because that is a silly title, really, realistically. It's just, a good but, film, isn't it? But it's a really good film. And and I was actually, uh, and again, I'm quite naive, but that's a black director. That yeah. was William William Crane directed that. Yeah. Um, and he, he said that him and William Marshall, who played Blackula, at times they were just the only two black guys on set for yeah. this movie called Blackula. Yeah. In fact, um, they almost lost funding for there's this disco scene in the movie where um you've got a real mix of, of black guys and, and white guys and girls all sort of dancing to a band oh what and they uh, what you're going to tell me that they didn't like the fact that there was a mixture of colored people on the dance so floor the, the producers wanted the black guys to dance with the black girls and the whites but themselves and, segregated it's ridiculous and, and william marshall said absolutely not uh, sorry william crane said absolutely not i, I want them mixed up Good i want him. everybody having fun and they they got really close to the producers pulling money uh, and eventually they went with it and so wow like he and put when it came out did anything happen because of that probably no, not nothing so so learn from your mistakes people and if you haven't seen Blackula, guys, it's a really fun, really great horror movie. And in fact, I think William Marshall in it is brilliant as Dracula. He's one of the best sort of Dracula really characters. Good hallway scene. Like oh yeah, with the slow motion, the girl running at you. Yeah, really that good. Was just disturbing. Really... Was, what the fuck is this film? It's like on the one of those horror movies you don't, good horror movies you don't know documentary type thing. Where Blackula was quite groundbreaking as well is that it showed. Blackula, or you know, I can't remember his real name in the in the film. There, the character's real name, but he it showed him back sort of in the 1700s, maybe, as this eloquent gentleman that had money. He wasn't a slave. He was an eloquent guy that moved away from that, and and you know that's why in the movie he's such a well spoken. See, I when watching Candyman, I was like, Candyman's basically Dracula, so he's basically Black bit, so yeah. He is. He is. Yeah. There's even one of my favourite bits, and there's comedy in Blackula as well. Is where they they're in a bar or something, and he says, "Would you like a drink?" And Blackula says, "I'll have a bloody Mary." I remember that scene. So actually, good. I remember that scene. So they all sit around the table, and he just he's like, it's, it seems a lot older and a completely different fashion. Comes and sits down. It's a bit, a bit like, who the fuck's this creepy dude? Like, <laughs> it is a bit weird. Um, talking to Pam Greer, they made a sequel to uh, Blackula called Scream, Blackula, Scream, which again is, is a good I've movie. I've not seen it. I've not seen it. Is yeah, she, is Pam Greer's in it. Oh, nice. And she uses voodoo for good. So almost like they're spinning it on its head. Voodoo doesn't have to be black magic. And I mean that in obviously, the, you know, the style of magic. Um, 
voodoo is used for good and yeah she's great in it it's a fun movie pam Grier is always good to watch i mean come on who didn't have a crush on pam Grier? jesus christ she's do you know not. what i mean yeah the voodoo that you do <laughs> um a couple of other movies came out in the 70s as well a movie called abby uh all about a girl uh with voodoo powers it's kind of a bit of a rip off of the exorcist in some bit in some ways but she's a bit of a sex maniac demon trapped in a black woman's body so okay. hey that's cool um sugar hill came out uh which is right, it? sugar hill's great it's a a woman um, raises slave zombies, so dead, the dead slaves, she raises them up as zombies to get revenge on white gangsters and white guys in her neighbourhood. Uh, and again, it's a great movie. And It's a not bad song. Uh, who's it by? Naz's mate. Sugar Hill, yeah, that's by... Uh, AZ. AZ. AZ, yeah, yeah. It's a good hip-hop song. I forgot about that, that song, actually. Yeah. Sugar Hill, baby. Sugar Hill, baby. Yeah, I forgot about that. Um, there's another movie that came out called Ganja and Hess. Uh, which I think starred um, Dwayne Jones, um, I... which I've never seen. Yeah, I've not seen it as well. I've it's heard David place... on the old Zavada podcast uh, uh, talked about it before, actually. He mentioned it, I remember, years ago, actually. It's, um, um, he was quite a fan. Vampire bit movie, essentially. Uh, okay. uh, a very, a very uh, well, I mean, I'll read you the synopsis. After being stabbed with an ancient German-infested knife, a doctor's assistant finds himself with an insatiable desire for blood. So it's kind of like uh, a, a vampire movie. And you've got Dwayne Jones in it um, as the main guy. He's a little bit older, obviously, because it's like almost 10 years later. But actually, what year is it? Yeah, 73. So it's like, um, well, like seven or eight years older than um, Night of the Living Dead. Great movie. Um, unfortunately, though, you did get some really low-brow stuff like Dr. Black and Mr. Hyde, you know, trying to cash in on this Blackula. Look, look, I, look, I see where we're going with Dracula. You're just changing the dirt to the burr. But come on, you're fucking pushing the boat out here, aren't you? What about Blackenstein? Blackenstein. That is just terrible, isn't it? And apparently, well, I've never seen that movie. Well, I'm think of Black and Decker. I don't know, Black and Decker, Black and Stein. Yeah. It sounds like it should be a name of a drill. Oh, I got a new drill the other day. The I've Black got and rid Stein. of my Black and Decker. I've got a Black and Stein instead. <laughs> Black but it's and just, Stein drill. It's almost, it's almost an offensive title, isn't it? Almost yeah, yeah. an offensive well, title. Uh, well, funny enough, though, I thought Blackula was, before I knew anything about the film, I thought it was like, oh my God. Like, I was just like, how the fuck you do it? That's just, that's taking the piss. I thought, and, and then, you know, it's not. As much as that. I don't know what I figured though, it was going to be a white dude blacked up or something. I don't know. Well, uh, I mean, you know what I mean, but that title. <clears throat> well, so the 70s ended on a bit of a high. There was some definite movement in black representation within well, the horror genre. Well, hopefully, because of the black exploitation type films, they sort of gave a platform and a market. Yeah, we had directors, we had actors. So that meant um, money. So that means, you know, other things went into production, yeah. Well, as we move into the 80s then, things are kind of in a bit of a weird. Uh, suspended animation here because although we're this, starting to get a lot more black representation within horror they're boom. being put in the same boxes now in the 80s aren't they and it's going to be a slasher boom so you're going to just get the uh, black dude that dies first in the group yep the, the token That's black guy we've all, the we've all heard dude. that phrase the token black guy so we get the friend the, the, yeah. or the guy that turns up so I'm thinking of Friday the 13th with is it Demon is that his name oh um, I don't know the, you know the one who's on the toilet um, what's the song Ooh. Hey, so, ba- hey, baby, do you want to sing to me while I shit? Ooh, <laughs> uh, what but you're fuck? right. You are right. Slasher movies in the 80s. So you, you did have a, usually one token black character who... And this is a common misconception. There's a lot of the time the black character would die first. And this became a joke, which I know you want to touch on in a moment, Gav. But um, uh, even sometimes it was just like the best, the girl, the main, the, what, the single white girl... Uh, what do you call it the the uh, final girl she would usually have a black female friend and her job essentially was just to say are you okay or oh if you've not been sleeping she'd always be checking up on the white person so the the black role was very much these you know token black you're a sidekick a lot of the time you were that was a, that's a good way of saying it they were almost like a sidekick in a lot of these slasher well, movies well, well they were in, Ca- in candy man we have the main protagonist uh, as a female white woman you have like the a sidekick yep. black friend in it um indeed yeah um 
this kind of goes on a bit into the 90s with like the screen movies you've got like the, the black friend in there i feel like there were a couple of movies where this this isn't the case i feel like there's a there's one of the friday that sorry one of the night run elm street movies where the guy called a character called kincaid a black character called kincaid i think it's dream warriors and he's a bit of a badass in it and he takes them on there's also that boxer in uh, jason takes manhattan yeah, who's yeah. a badass and he lasts boxer right the to roof. the end yeah, he's really yeah, yeah until guy. jason gets a punch fucking knocks his head off but i mean what a great way to go and i'm sure you know that actor was really i mean i'd been pleased with that role anyone would have well, been you've seen, fun, a, you've fun seen fun a massive documentary of friday family yeah yeah, of yeah course I he's have. on that stuff yeah no, but I, it's funny because i said to you earlier I, I, all of a sudden i was I thought oh, hang on scream's massively important film but actually the, it's the wayne brothers they are very very important i feel even though their movies are just at times you're a bit like oh my god you know raise mm. eyebrows but they were bringing all of these stereotypical things that the black person done which the what is in the, the white person fought the black person done they brought all the chicken to the cinema you know said I, uh, no uh, uh, no 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 you won't talk to me i'm on the phone blah 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 blah. get out of my face get out of my face yeah, all they that really... stuff they really sort of said look i know you're thinking this is what you think of, uh, and we're just gonna fucking play this and up. they shoved it in our face, they shoved it in your face and, the white and you're gonna laugh faces. at it and pay us and <laughs> fair enough <laughs> and when it comes down to it i think um like I think that's, they're quite important in some ways, even though they're fairly schlock. You know, I I, yeah, I, I, I love I, 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 right. I love the first scary movie movie though. To be fair, I do think they highlight you know that whole black guy dies. You know that 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 became a bit of a running joke. Even movies well, that's like it now. Evolution had that in it. That's and it. Stuff, you can't you know? do the token guy. Everybody knows now, especially in twenty twenty. Nothing's everything's changing now. You can't not. You'll never be able to go back and do anything because you'll be like you're shut down. You're shut down because everybody says so. We're st- all the executives like no, we're we're hostage now to the public on their Twitter and everything. Oh no, don't don't because they are now, which is brilliant. So you can never get rid of that. Twenty twenty completely changes everything. That's just why it is. The world's completely flipped in a positive way, which is brilliant. Um, but yeah, it was. It, you, you can't do that. To, it got to. You realised the token guy from like the early twenty two thousand, didn't you? Like you can't have the black token, dude. It's uh, just you, you can't, just can't do, do it. That. Man. And if you do have that, you do it meta. You do it because you know that that's going on, and you get the meta throwback type films. That are, Summer camp and, and a lot of these movies as well were all set, these slasher movies, particularly the late 80s, early 90s, were all set, set in predominantly white neighborhoods, you know, with the white picket fences and the rich families. And that just, that you know, there was no place for a black person there. They, how can they fit in there? Unless it's like, the, I'm thinking of like The Craft, maybe, where there's like one of the witches is black. Um, in fact, I found out again from She's watching hot. one of these documentaries that she is hot, but I found out from watching this that her character originally her problem wasn't going to be the fact that she's getting bullied for being black her character's problem is going to be anorexia and that was how that was her thing she was going to overcome when she became a witch but when they cast her they said do you mind if we change it and she said yeah hell yeah like that's that's great let's do that so you know and there are a couple of movies that are notable you know um Wes Craven was responsible for two of them, uh, Serpent and the Rainbow, um, although there's a lot of voodoo priests and stuff in that, did put a lot of black faces on screen, um, and that was that's a great movie, and quite a lot of people like that uh, movie. Uh, uh, what um, way, I don't, I, I'm not even sure if I've seen a movie yet, and how was the black faces, you say, represented? Just there were a lot of black people given jobs for that movie, and they weren't all misrepresented. Uh, you in know, the as bad film story. Okay, yeah, fine. Exactly. And, and the other movie that he did as well was People Under the Stairs, in which, for the first time ever, a young black boy was the hero and the lead in this movie, and it was a very ancestral, weird white family that were the bad guys in this, and in a black neighbourhood. And I don't know if you remember that. Have you seen People Under the Stairs? Yeah, of course. So the very end scene, you know, is um, the mum from Twin Peaks, you know, the wife from Twin Peaks. Not and she's about, she's about to drop the end bomb to the little black oh, boy. Yeah, yeah, and she is. Like, yeah. as she's about to say it, she's, just about to. she's suddenly surrounded by the whole black neighbourhood and it's like, they're going to take her down. So that movie's really important. And Wes Craven, you know, he just casually did that. I've heard he's he was really pushed diversity on sets of his films. Um, so great for Wes, if that's the case. Um, oh, Wes definitely. was supposed to be a very, very nice, nice gentleman. Um, and funnily enough, one movie I always think of is, um, and it's a terrible film, but I love it, Anaconda, where Ice Cube and a Latina woman, Jay-Z, uh, Jay-Z J- J-Lo, not Jay-Z, J-Lo, they both survive the movie, do you know what I mean? And, like, and uh, what's that shark movie where LL Cool J survives? 
Um, Deep blue sea. Deep blue sea. I want Jay Z now to be dressed as a woman. <laughs> I don't know. Dressed as a Latina Latina woman in a um, in a anaconda. I don't want to see that. Um, so sticking with the 90s then, um, obviously Candyman, we're going to be talking more about that, but that was the first black supernatural killer. It also kind of spawned that whole urban legend, don't say his name in the mirror, that kind of stuff. That's the, that's the funny thing with this movie. Uh, uh, that was something which, because it, it came out around the, oh no, urban legend that came out in 2000. It? Urban Legend was probably late late nineties, like ninety eight or something. The first Urban Legend okay. movie. But it's quite funny <laughs> though, because that is an Urban Legend. The whole that the whole don't look in looking mirror. You said I oh, had that story. The kids. Well, it was uh, based on Bloody school. Mary, wasn't it? If you say yeah, Bloody yeah, Mary, yeah, yeah. uh, ninety eight Urban Legend was so that was like so, uh, fairly close. Six years for this. Um, but yeah, that movie was you know groundbreaking for those reasons. Tony Todd is just incredible in that movie. What a presence! What a voice! Mm. And like you said, maybe, maybe you could. You know, you could say he's almost like a vampire. He's kind of like a Dracula type character, and very I eloquent. I can't help but see my friend Akash. I remember, you know, my 40th birthday, and everyone's could do horror. And he said to me, "What shall I come out as?" And I, I looked at him and I said, "Man, you got to be Candyman because you look <laughs> like Tony Todd." Man? No, he came as Itchy the Killer, but oh, nice. I didn't know because I was so pissed. He turned up, and I just kind of looked at him and just gave him a nod and a smile because I didn't know what he turned up as, and I didn't know if it's just like his clothes or what. I was a bit like, well, I don't know what. Well, I was very drunk on that party. You were. Yeah. Well, other reasons Candyman was important as well is because it also predominantly takes place in a very poor, poverty-stricken black neighbourhood. There's only a handful of white characters in it, maybe even one or two white characters in the whole thing. And the Cabr- whole Cabrini conflict. Cabrini Green. Oh, I was going to look up Cabrini Green, and then that place is supposed to be pretty gnarly, man. Like yeah, in, in, real, in, uh, in, in uh, real life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also the whole movie circles around an interracial conflict, you know, Tony Todd and um, what's her name, Virginia Madsen. Uh, but again, you know, we're, we're going to get into that in a bit more detail when we do talk about and review Candyman a bit later on. Um, so in the 90s, we also got some really powerful black guys behind the camera. We had Spike Lee, John Singleton. These guys were making movies. Oh, that boys in the hood. Yeah, man. Some of these movies were powerful and i know these aren't horror movies but but black representation within film generally was starting to really grow now and be taken much much more seriously yeah, yeah. boys in the hood was groundbreaking for that it really that's was. still such a powerful movie and it's, it's, uh, i know it's on uk netflix at the moment i don't know where else in the, the regions in the world um but uh if you've not ever seen boys in the hood it is worth a watch it's incredible. Um, and, and the, and the NWA movie, brilliant. Straight Outta Compton, that that was great to sort of see that see that uh, dramatised the, the the making of the fuck the police and that whole. I, think, I knew about it, but to see do you know what I mean, see and, and that dramatisation of that was like fucking hell. It goes back to what we were saying last time with ninety two and the, the the whole riots and all that sort of stuff as well. You know, LA with, with Rodney yeah. King. You know, well, um, it's shocking that we still we. Rodney King happened yet, and and yet in 2020 it happened again. It's just like, well, it what? is happening so, too often, really. To like even, what? Oh, well, oh, I'm so hoping that there's a change. So, with the 90s, we did get a couple of horror movies. Um, we had a movie called Death by Temptation. Um, oh, yeah, I've which never is... seen it. I always would see that shit in the video shop. I've ne- never seen it though. Yeah, I never got around to seeing it. Um, Wasn't it just but... like someone with a baseball cap on the front cover, and it always just looked a bit like. Uh doesn't look like something I want to get. Yeah, and it was directed by a guy called James Bond the Third, which I think is pretty awesome as well. Um, but it, the, the synopsis is Sounds an like evil a reggae succubus. Artist. <laughs> James Bond the Third. The, the uh, synopsis is an evil succubus is preying on libidious black men in New York City, and all that stands in her way is a minister in training, an aspiring actor, and a cop who specialises in cases involving the supernatural. Now that sounds fucking awesome. I I, I, I have a weird feeling I probably did get out of the video shop. That was 1990s, so very early 90s. We also got a movie called Tales from the Hood, which at the time was slated, but actually is really lo- loved now. People look back at that and they really like that movie, and it's an anthology. I, I'm pretty short sure stories. Tony Todd's uh, uh, going to be in a new one coming out soon. I was checking out what he's up to. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, yeah, Tales from the Hood, uh, 95, four short movies. Um, they did a sequel as well only two years ago. Uh, yes, you're right, Tales from the Hood 3, Tony Todd is in that. You are right. Hmm. 
very interesting. Tales from the Hood is good if you want to check that out. I've Black never seen it. Wim- Black women in the 90s. We've already talked about the craft, but black women in the 90s were starting to be a bit more represented as well. Um, what's the movie that, that Jada Pinkett uh, is in? Um, I thought you could say Whoopi Goldberg. No, no, no Ghost. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say, Ghost. <laughs> well, I guess in a way. She yeah, was, yeah. I, mean, I love the fact that Patrick again, Swayze fought for her to be in the movie. Again, though, she was the sidekick. And why didn't she? they want her in the movie? Racist. Um, she was the sidekick, though, in that. But she won an Oscar. Um, yeah, again, t- yeah, she's a sidekick, yeah. yeah. Here we go. T- Tales from the Crypt, Demon Knight, is the movie that Jada Pinkett is in. And not only was that, As I think, probably her first role, but also she was the lead, she was the hero, she was a black woman, um, which is awesome. Uh, it takes all boxes for I, me. I do like that one. Bord- Bordello of Blood just come on Netflix yesterday. UK I did Netflix. see that, yeah. Have you seen that one? <laughs> I've seen it before in, I in a long it time ago. It wasn't as good as uh, Demon Knight. Yeah, it's not the the effects for the um the crypt keeper are terrible in it, but it is what it is. You you go into that knowing what you're going to get. It's the crypt, yeah. So we leave the '90s and we come into the 2000s now. And the 2000s were a lot of hip hop inspired horror, very cheap, uh, you know, like hoods versus wolves. Well, and... again, we're going with where the money is at this point. Hip hop uh, became a fucking commodity, and then clothing limes came from all that sort of stuff as well. So that that. Yeah, they would have been looking at, oh, what are they hip hop artists? And you always get horror movies with people coming in all of a sudden, here's Method Man, or here's fucking Red Man, or. Yeah, LL Cool J popped up in a few. I know, Ice Cube. LL Cool J. Oh, and Ice Cube is actors. Um, Method Man, he's, he's all right. He's a bit hit and miss. 2001, though, we did get what I am always shocked is such a good movie, and that's Bones with Snoop Dogg. I've never seen and, it. Pa- and Pam Greer. Um, Has he got big dreads in it? And he's just like a food. Uh, he's got dreads. He's got long hair in it. Uh, um, okay. After good, 20, uh, over 20 years after his death by a gunshot, Jimmy Bones comes back as a ghost to wreak havoc on those that killed him and clean up the neighborhood. Yeah, I feel like I've seen this as well, but I don't remember it. It's cool, man. It's, it's all right. Um, so black characters in general now were getting lead roles. They were also being cast as heroes. As we move now into the noughties, we're looking at, I'm looking at things like, even though it's not a great movie, Will Smith and I Am Legend, you know, Will Smith sells those, sells tickets though now, doesn't he? You know, it doesn't matter what colour is. He sells fucking tickets, that guy. Yeah. Um, I think Attack the Blocks is a very important movie as well. Um, apparently really big in America as well as over here in yeah. Drum- John Boyega. I, I, you know, I tried um, watching it again recently, and I, for my, my second time, I just don't dig that movie. It's, I just I, find it. I just find. I just find the. Uh, uh, I don't like it as much as I wish I sh- I c- should. Yeah. I know it's got a lot of love, but it's still a good movie and very important movie as well, particularly for Black British people, um, because it's set in one of those sort of, you know, those council it's estates. Set in, it's set in Brixton, but at the time when that came out, like Johnny, you know, Johnny, he was living in. Exactly that, and it was yeah. it just it just seemed a no, no I don't know. Anyway, I'm not going to go on to that. Another movie which and we have covered on the podcast, which actually I've never really thought about how the, how important it is that the lead character and it's a little black girl, but that's the girl with all the gifts, um, and that's another um, one where they they didn't really count she, who she they were not, casting. She's she is just a very important person, the, the child, and isn't it because she's going to be the person that uh, um, populates the world again? Was it that? I can't know. God, uh, no, no, no. She's, she, she has some important thing she, going on. She is. They're going to learn from her about the zombies and how to defeat them and how to cure them. So they're looking at this little black girl. So there's the fact that a black girl was cast. Now there's an extra layer to that movie because she's basically treated like an animal. She's kept on a lead. Um, oh, she could turn on them and bite them. In. But that was never the intention with the movie originally. That was just like, who are we going to cast? She came in. Her audition was awesome. Boom. Next thing you know, it slightly changes. And that's why diversity is so important, because you add this extra level, this dynamic, like with, like we talked about with Night of the Living Dead, it just adds this extra layer. But if we didn't, if we, if everybody was in unison and everybody, everybody in the world got along with each other, bloody hell, that'd be amazing. Um, and we didn't have it and we all agreed on the one human race, that wouldn't have mattered and that wouldn't have been a thing, that film. Night of the Living Dead wouldn't be a thing. It'd just be a movie, wouldn't it? Yep. It would. Um, and that leads us nicely, really, to get out, really, which we're going to really, again, talk about in uh, quite a lot of detail later on in this episode. But that movie came out. I mean, Jordan Peele wrote that movie um, when Obama was president. And as that movie was coming out, it kind of was 
Trump coming into power, um, and I don't want to get into all of that, but so that movie has a lot of relevance. And at the same time, just as he was about to start, I think just as he was about to start production on it or wrapping production, the Black Lives Matter movement started. So again, even more impact. And again, this is just fate, you know. Uh, it's like when NWA released that song um, just as all the LA riots were kicking off. This is just fate, sort of, or, you know, or things just working with each other and, and elevating each other. Um, and Jordan Peele was a bit of a game changer and he won an Oscar for that movie. Um, one of the very few um, horror movies to win an Oscar. And I think he was the first, first black, black guy to be a screenwriter. Yeah, yeah. Um, Which is still, again, insane. And the Oscars. And, in, in, or, in, in that's, and that's going to be really, when it comes down to it, uh, black folk not being given a chance in Hollywood. And I don't know if it was the Oscars or if it was one of the other awards, but they, they didn't want to... They wanted to put it in the category of comedy or musical because they said they didn't really recognise horror, but there's a little bit of talk about is it because it's of its message and, the, you know, the whole black stuff behind it. But it won it won an Oscar. Man, I'll take that. That was great to see a horror movie, but also a movie directed by a, you know, a horror movie directed by a black guy about that subject matter being... Oscar winning it's fantastic and as we know Jordan Peele comes from comedy um, we've talked about why comedy and horror work well together he's gone on to make Us which most people tend to really like I'm a huge fan of it in some ways I prefer it to get out Gav I know you you don't have quite the same opinion but you're willing to give it another shot um, and I look forward to whatever comes next really uh, I know we've got Candyman coming up soon um, I can't remember the name of the lady but that's a black lady and I'll just look that up now so I don't yeah, and jo- I know John's producer I don't know I, I, I imagine he's quite a passionate person I would imagine that he uh, him producing would be quite a lot of his fingerprints <clears throat> or such not 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 saying like the Toby Hooper Spielberg type uh, <laughs> uh, thing going on there but I mean like as in like, I reckon he'd have quite a hand in production um, Nia, Nia, Nia da Costa is her name, so she's directing that. So that's again, you know, a black woman directing. And, and we talked about it that's, one of our previous episodes. That's great to give a black lady a chance in directing, and why the fuck not? So good. exactly, exactly. And, and again, Candyman. I think Jesus, if they do that right, particularly right now with the it's, way the world is, that could really be another get out. Really, if they hit that right, possibly it's supposed to be a significantly kind of sequel kind of well the latest trailer such but it's basically that's what it says it says it's kind of a it's kind of a sequel well the latest trailer has got tony todd's voice over the trailer um whether or not he is in it or anything he, he to do is, with it he's candy man he's candy man is he now does uh, he uh, i'm pretty sure he's in, on imdb i'm pretty sure he said he's uh have a look on imdb there quickly pretty sure it says candy man uh he's not he's not listed on it which is strange. That's I reckon it'll be a surprise. Weird. I, I reckon it'll be a little surprise. I, must have, I must have dreamt it. Uh, yes, but Jordan Peele, um, probably like the the, the 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 voice really for for black representation within and, horror right now, and, and he's a comedian, voice, which is brilliant, and a voice in horror as well. Yeah, and just uh, generally just of, a, yeah. Mm. Very original voice in horror. Um, that movie was just very out, out of there. Get, get Out was just so original. And in, in some ways, Us as well, very original. And that's what horror needs to be. It needs to be pushing boundaries. That's why we love it. That's why we got into it, because you don't know what to expect. You get on this, you press play, and you go on this crazy horror roller coaster. And I love it when you don't, you don't know where it's going. Although I do love, you know, the usual final girl and i love knowing kind of the roadmap to a horror movie it's always great to watch something new where you've no idea where that movie's going um Mm. so there we go that's kind of everything i wanted to sort of talk about really well Um, dude i think we i think we managed to do that conversation all right with a couple of white feathers (laughs) we did all right we did we did all right yeah (laughs) um well i think we should probably yeah we... Have a little yeah. Candyman session. Let's do it, man. Let's, uh, uh, here's the trailer for Candyman. Have you ever heard of Candyman? And if you look in the mirror and you say his name five times. In cities everywhere. Candyman. They whisper his name. Right. Candyman. It's just a story. Candyman. Candyman. Just a ghost story. Candyman. And 
entire community starts attributing the daily horrors of their lives to a mythical figure. The legend first appeared in 1890. He was attacked, mutilated, and burned to death. Poor Candyman. <laughs> Helen, a woman died in there. Leave it. Everyone knows he isn't real. That's modern oral folklore. Everyone. Except Helen Lyle. Where did I... It ain't safe around here. I don't scare too easy. Want no Balvutha Jane? They ain't never gonna catch him. Who? Candyman. Helen. Who is that? I came for you. Do I know you? Now, she is about to discover. Tell me. Get out! Get out! What's behind the mystery? You're sick. What's behind the legend? Listen, he's under the bed! And most terrifying of all... Come with me. What's behind the mirror? <laughs> He's here. Candyman, you don't have to believe. Just beware. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Cool. So, our first movie. Candyman from 1992. The Candyman, a murderous soul with a hook for a hand, is accidentally summoned to reality by a skeptic grad student searching the mon- sorry researching the monster's myth. It is really urban legendy, isn't it? It is. It is. It's um directed like, like by the, Bernard Rose. Like the hook, he follows me on Twitter. Did you know? Um, like the hook and the um. The uh, but saying the mirror five times. It's very urban legendy. So it's not, two I'm not saying legends. the movie urban legend. I'm just saying urban legends in general. Well, it's two urban legends spliced together. Mm. Um, one mm. of them is the urban legend of saying Bloody Mary five times in the mirror, and she will appear and kill you. The other one is of the hook, the man with a hook for a hand that kills people in who are having sex in cars, um, and they kind of splice them together. Um, and and, and hook? actually, Why I say hook, hook and sex. I say hookers. they hookers. Lucas, I say they. This was actually written by the one and only Clive Barker. Is Candyman a hooker? He is a hooker, yeah, in some ways. Um, yes, Clive Barker, who uh, this film was originally going to be set in uh, Liverpool. I think that's the... Is Liverpool! That a, Liverpool! Is that... Um, uh, go, on, go on, do your Liverpool puddle in the accent again. Hey, Liverpool, Clive Barker's going to do his Candyman in Liverpool. Now, like, to anyone from, not from the UK, that's not that too is bad. the Liverpool accent that's and you'll too... know the beatles were from there but they didn't quite sound like that no, but, well, uh, no no but that's quite bad for you being a bristonian fellow i didn't know what it'd be like for you to do that i can do Liverpool. most uk accents because um, i work i work on the phones so i, I speak to people from all over the uk so yeah, i can do I most UK accents Mm. But yeah, so imagine if this had been set in Liverpool. Is that, is that the um, original story, Chloe? Is that set in Liverpool? The, the book, I think the novel was originally, it was called The Forbidden, and it was set in Toxteth, which is a really rough part of Liverpool. Um, oh, so, so they so they just transformed it to uh, Borelli Green, which has been another gnarly project. Yeah, yeah, in, in Chicago, oh, isn't and this it? this had been so interesting. Imagine that with the fucking English, like, mush. With his fucking dog and like, yeah, the fucking I don't, I think it, I think it works council better. Council state. I think it works better in the projects here, you know, I don't know, I don't, I'm sure the book's great and I've never read it, but, yeah. but Clive Barker, man, we were looking at covering Clive Barker at some point and we were going to, we were going to do Hellraiser and Candyman, but um, when we decided to do, um, you know, our, our celebration of black representation movie, uh, episode, we figured Candyman, really, we've got to talk about that, it's, yeah, it's it, one of those ones people know. Yeah, and and uh, I think with Get Out, that's very obviously the the theme itself is about uh, 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 white's perception of uh, black people. Uh, and Candyman doesn't have that as such. It, it's it's coming from the the slasher boom. <laughs> it's a um, it's a <clears throat> obviously it's a very good writer has written the uh, book to, the novel the story to begin with so it's coming from that but w- w- is the is the uh, main character in that uh, any specific color in the novel he he's i think he's white in the novel because he's called the candy man because he's got yellow skin and a 
and a bright red beard uh, and he wears purple I think so that's one of the reasons he was called Candyman and they, they've changed sounds, sounds this like for the screen sounds, like, sounds like almost Father Christmas -y. well yeah maybe um, so they changed aspects of that they really didn't just transfer the story to America they did a lot to work in you know uh, a black project a predominantly black project in America and they changed it and on the surface this movie may look like a slasher of course but when you delve a bit deeper there's it's almost a gothic fairy tale a modern gothic fairy tale but underneath that even more then there's definitely there's a lot to say about um, poverty black communities poor black communities how whites are perceived how blacks are perceived crime that kind of stuff violence within these communities so there's a lot more to it but on the surface of it it's Tony Todd with a hook for a hand and bees coming out of his mouth. Holy shit. Yeah, the, um, the, bee, the yeah. bees is the uh, third element in that, really, which is the trimester of those things. Yeah, the original novel that is in, um, set in Liverpool, it, this is me going back to thinking it very much like Dracula, <clears throat> where he comes into the... Because Liverpool being next to the sea, um, the same with sort of mm -hmm. Dracula, the first place he comes into, very close to the sea, obviously, because he docks in on a boat. I really do feel this... Do you know what I mean? It's, it's it's having some. Yeah, totally. Well, we've we've talked about this in our last episode. I my theory about um, Ravenous as a movie is that it's a it's a low key vampire movie. You know, and that's you can what... look at that in a lot of ways. I knew we were speaking about something like that again recently, which is more like, oh, we can look at the vampire mythos, mythos, yeah. mythos, and mythos. Um, mythos, and it being um, uh, uh, representing something else, and and yeah, and I, I like I feel like that uh, Dracula is a bit of a uh, uh, influence in some ways, not totally. But as in the main character, his what he wants, where he comes from, he is like this power. He can, he, he almost has Obi Wan Kenobi's power of telling someone, "You're gonna come with me," or whatever. Yeah, you know? he's a really, yeah, he's a um, real. But he's, I think he's more supernatural than Dracula, though, isn't he? Because he can indeed, come through indeed. walls, through mirrors. He, yeah, yeah, yeah. and we'll get into that with the story. It's, uh, it's almost like it's one of those. It's like the Blair Witch for me. This movie in that he's, he's got more fun. The Blair than Witch, Dracula, isn't he? He's Dracula with funk. <laughs> He's like Blackula. Funkula. I want to see Funkula now. <laughs> What's Funkula? Is that a movie? I've just made it up, dude. Oh, dude. Funkenstein. Funkenst That's probably a DJ. That's probably a DJ. Fun I'd, I'd be Funk called Funk Funkenstein. Funkmaster but... Flex, but I reckon F F Funkula. <laughs> <laughs> Completely off topic. Get, let's get back on. Um, yeah, what I, was I going to say? Uh, uh, you're I was about gonna Philip, say Philip uh, Glass when you, you score. Oh, God, yeah. The Philip Glass score is just incredible over this movie. Uh, that's what I was going to say. Sorry. Um, one thing about this movie is it feels like they didn't just make up the Candyman legend for this movie. Like the Blair Witch Project. It feels like that it's felt already like it there. was based on a real law. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And this feels like that as well. So they've done a really good job. And in fact, now the movie is almost 30, 40 years old, actually. Oh, um, my God. It is. It's 30, 1992. So another two years, it'd be 40. So is that right? Yeah. yeah um, uh, 30? What's my mouth? Nine? Yeah, it's not 40. 30. Shh. Um, and another that... two years, it'll be 30. But it does feel very much cemented. That's why I was Both a bit years. shocked by that, because I'm only 43. Is that what? Um, I love the beginning of this. We get the um, aerial panning shots. Now, this is before drone. Yeah, I wonder how they did this. It was something <sighs> called a sky cam, I think. They must have set up a rig over a, a um, you know a crane to another crane with like a, um, a thing a bar of some description and then automo automotive uh, like motor control whatever and the camera panning across it I guess must have done like that it, it looks so lovely though with the Philip Glass score it's set this real it's funny you got this kind of city and cities can sometimes be represented kind of sort of dirty and a bit trashy sometimes going over a cityscape and and just having that music playing and the smoothness of that shot with that score playing gave across a more majestic feel to it, which I feel is really representative of Candyman's stature of what he was before the in his story before the uh, the the his wife's father got the people onto him and attacked him and stuff and he was quite yeah, a grand I person i feel this film with the music and just that opening shot sort of shows that without even you knowing that just while you're talking about that um 
it was the first time they'd ever used something called a sky cam. I just, uh, I knew I'd read about it. And it's it's a piece of machinery that, that was revolutionary at the time. And it basically can shoot up to 500 millimeters of lens, uh, sorry, through a 500 millimeter lens with no vibration at all. So it must have been, like you said, a huge track across the rooftops, no vibrations at all. And they use it a few times in the movie, don't they? 500 millimeter lens. Yeah. It's a super, super long lens. Yeah. Okay, I wonder why it's such a super long lens. You'd think it'd be a wide lens, I guess it must be, because unless, unless it was, like, really, really high up in the sky, that's straight interesting. Um, yeah, we could probably talk about this for a while. <laughs> you're, you're, you're very correct about... Um, I agree with you um, with regards to Candyman's status. So jumping forward, we are obviously going to be spoiling this movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I think uh, we have to, because it's well, nice, it's on, nice to know out. where he comes from uh, uh, going well, yeah. into his introduction for us when we talk about this film. Well, later on, we do find out he's a very elegant, well-spoken, well-respected artist from a couple of hundred years ago. Uh, he, his father was a slave, but he wasn't. Uh, but and... no, his father, no, his father was a slave, but he had worked himself up and found a way to distribute and export something. I have, I do have the. He was a somewhere. painter. Candyman was a portrait painter. But um, yeah, but he, he, he was. That's why Candyman was. Um, he was enabled him to go to prestigious schools. Get a formal education and like uh, uh, pronounces English very correctly, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, um, um, yeah, and that's how he got onto where he was. And then he met this white lady, which he fell in love with. Well, he was painting her portrait. He was commissioned to paint her portrait. Her and father, her father, to get her virginity. I believe her, her father virginity. was. Yes, indeed, weirdo. Um, I believe her father was like some really high slave trader or something like that. And basically, they fell in love. She got pregnant. You know, you know how it goes down. Next thing you know, we'll get into what happened to him. Get his hand cut off, bees, blah, blah, blah. We'll come back to that in a bit. Um, no, his father made a device to ship shoes out in the war. There we go. It's, it's a, that, because that that's comes up in the story of it. Candyman's dad was a shoemaker. And, and, and yeah, and Candyman, uh, uh, his, his ultimate device. Did you just say then what, what happened to him? Sorry. Yeah, his hand gets cut off. They, oh, yeah. they strip him and, naked. And they burn him and they scatter his ashes they, throughout the... Uh, uh, Cabrini, Cabrini Green. Green. That's, that is where he is coming from with this. Don't forget as well, they smothered him in, in honey, threw him into the oh. apiary, so the bees stung him to death. Yes. Then they set then his they body set him on fire. fire. And then scattered his ashes. So, you know, he knocks up a white girl and that's what they did to him. It's fucking brutal. Um, no wonder he's so pissed off. So this, in a novel, being a white guy, this wouldn't have had the power it does with a black fellow playing it at all. I'm sure. It? I'm sure it was a different backstory. I, I, I probably should have we, done some research, but we, I've only researched the movie, not the book. Probably should. We should have made Kate read it. She'd have read it, wouldn't she? <laughs> She's probably read it. Probably um, so we do start off with that classic Tony Todd voiceover um, over that that shot of the city and the score, and he's talking about "I'll come for you," etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he's very eloquent, very almost poetic with everything he says throughout this movie. And our first real scene, Ted Raimi, got Ted fucking Raimi in it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, the nineties movie, you always got Ted Raimi popping up. He's always popping up, isn't he? Well, he plays a boyfriend of a babysitter who he goes around there, you know. Typical uh, babysitter. She gets her boyfriend around you. Yeah, I, I yeah, watched this. Get. I watched this with Jay. Um, so this is. I said to her, like, you know, it's an eighteen. But do you want to fancy watch it with me? I need to watch it because I remember the film. And I was like, no, I'm Jay. Now, you know, the stuff that she's in, uh, they are into, is um, quite at times the like, makeup and that and. Jay knows this stuff already. It's not. It, I was just like, actually, you know, nowadays kids like looking at this sort of thing. Like, even though it's an eighteen, it does have some shocking stuff. At which uh, it was more shocking <clears> to me as an adult, especially a child in the toilet. That scene later on. But I didn't find and it the... so shocking when I was younger, and Jay didn't at all. She's like, uh, they were like, Ugh, you know. Still, one of the goriest moments for me in any horror movie. Like much, much later on with the psychiatrist. Um, but he's you don't see a lot of it, but he's ripped from groin to gullet, as Tony Todd says. I'll rip you from groin to gullet. Jay noticed at that point when that, that, that character died, he was the first white person to be killed. By Candyman? Well, we think by Helen. 
at first mm. but yes it is actually yeah. candy man so it's the first person a white person not i, I don't think actually any of that meant anything at all jay picked up on that and i was like oh, okay because jay thought it was helen going just after the black people because jay obviously didn't know about the candy man type thing at first you know what i mean it was mm. thought it was all in helen's head that's where it comes across well this story could you could look at it that way um that's one of the many theories and layers of this film really you could say that it's about a crazy white woman who decided to go into the projects yeah and start some trouble yeah uh and, and, and ends up killing a bunch of people what, what 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 do we call them now what's the term of that that lady nowadays karen karen <laughs> i knew you i knew you could know that Can, candy man's there going karen <laughs> karen's karen's there without a face mask in a supermarket shouting at everyone she's going i need to get my hair cut you can't make me wear a mask i gotta get my hair cut Candyman's like, come here, I'm going to have to fucking take you out, bitch. I'm going to hook you <laughs> up. Yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Ted Raimi arrives on the scene. His girlfriend is the babysitter. And they go off to the bathroom to get a little bit little bit jiggy with it, but not fully jiggy with it. But um, she gets her top off, it leaves her bra on. But then she says to him, do you know the story of the Candyman? And uh, he's like, no, what is it? And she's like, you say his name in the, mir- in the mirror five times and he appears and he kills you. So they... this, this is a good way of getting like, a teenage audience. If you went to the cinema to watch this, this is the perfect way. It's a couple of white folk as well. Do you know what I mean? It's a perfect way it's... to get... Get it's that. a gimmick as well because you come out of this movie and you're like i dare you to say it no way man you say it yeah yeah you remember the movie for it you know like beetlejuice 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 everyone knows that one but candy man five times in the mirror i've never had the guts to say it yeah i'll never do it, it, is, well, it, it yeah it's funny <clears throat> anyway they she they say his name four times and they don't have the guts to say it. the fifth ted Raimi goes back downstairs while she's in the, um, on her own in the bathroom she says it a fifth time and lo and behold Ted Raimi hears a scream and some tearing of flesh and some blood starts seeping through the ceiling. And then we realise this is a story being told to our main character, Helen, who is studying the myth of the Candyman. And she's going around doing lots of research on this urban legend. I kind of forgot about this. Uh, and really, you're going along with this. This is our protagonist who uh, goes on quite a journey, in fact. Um, but we, we're going along with her, and she's an investigative person. So really, you kind of got your kind of detective bit to it, but it's just a student detective or such. And I forgot <coughs> about that, and I like my little... those sorts of things, do you know what I mean? So it's a nice, another little, nice little element to have that to find our story. We're going to go on a story, uh-huh. a journey with her, an investigation. And for that reason, and there's like one or two reasons, um, this movie, for me, has... Almost the Silence of the Lambs feel to it in some ways. Um, another reason I say that is because we talked about black sidekicks when we went through, um, you know, our history of black representation. And we've got um, Cassie Lemons, who plays Bernadette, who's kind of like the sidekick or the best friend. And she actually was also Jodie Foster's sidekick slash girlfriend, as we discussed, in Silence of the Lambs. Oh, she was. What was the yeah. uh, what years are the difference in these films? Uh, I think Silence Lambs was 91. I should know I'm that. I'm pretty sure Silence Lambs is 91. And what was this? Uh, this was a lot later, wasn't it? 91. This is 92, so it's a year later. But it's a perfect role for her then, actually. Yeah, I mean, she's done it before. She's done it again. Two very different characters, but even so... Um, so, yeah, that, that's another reason this movie has that sort of tie to Silence of the Lambs for me. So, yeah, she's, like you said, Gav, she's going around. She's doing some investigations. Uh, she's a grad student, and she's basically doing research. She's doing a paper on this urban legend, specifically the Candyman, um, you know, this guy with a hook. Um, she, uh, we, we meet her friend, who I mentioned is played by Cassie Lemons, Bernadette, um, and they go to class, and this class is being... There's a class on urban legends being taught by a professor, and he's telling them all about alligators in the in the sewers and that kind of stuff. Um, and that's her husband. I I uh, no, I didn't know it was her husband until later on when I saw the photograph of her in a wedding dress and him holding her. I didn't know. I thought it was the boyfriend the whole time. So she's yeah. a, she's a she's a student. He's a lecturer, and they're married, and happen to be at the same place. Yeah, I think place. she's. I think she's like a grad student. Which <clears throat> so basically she's like oh, an she's older a, student. Okay. Um, and her husband Trev is not a great guy because when she turns up, he's sort of been chatted up by one of the young student ladies, and there's definitely some chemistry there's there. A bit which of flirtations, we... and Helen's correcting her 
thinking that uh, <laughs> yeah. that's going on, and uh, basically she she gets she gets her revenge on his cheating. But uh, well, all throughout the thing this is, movie, though, is he like cheating three in the morning? Already? Well, I think he is because all the all the way through this movie, there's occasions where she'll wake up like three in the morning and wonder where he is, and he's like, oh, I was uh, I had to write a paper, or oh, there was something urgent at the university. Okay, it's like, so he's already on, cheating. So, so, okay, cool, because she gets her revenge on him, so to speak. Doesn't uh-huh. she? She certainly does. So yeah, so we find out that um yeah, that's her husband Trevor. He's a professor. Um and uh whilst she's sort of in the university, she she's listening to some recordings of interviews with people and one of the cleaners, uh, a black lady, hears um hears this and says, Oh, are you doing some research on the candy man? And she says, Yeah, do you do you know anything about him? She's like, mm. I only like rumours, but I, my friend who's outside cleaning, she she knows much more. So they bring this girl in, and she tells them what she knows about it and about the Candyman. And why did you say a black lady and not just a lady? Uh-huh. Because she's a cleaner, and I thought that was tied in with you know what we're saying, like in representation within this movie. <laughs> I'm just joshing. And, <laughs> and most people in this movie are black. Um, you know, there's really it's just Helen. It is. It's, uh, the the, proje- and the projects are uh, predominantly uh, uh, black folk. Yeah, and I think it's Chicago, isn't it? This this takes place yeah, in I as don't, well. I think there was any white uh, f- families there actually. I don't think I saw any in the tower blocks or anything. I think the only time you see more than a couple of white people is in that restaurant scene later on, where they're all having dinner, mm. uh, and there's loads of professors there. Um, so yeah, she tells Helen about the Candyman. Uh, she tells him her about uh, a lady who was killed in her bathtub um, by a man with a hook. She was ripped, ripped open, gutted, um, and you know she there's talks of him killing babies and stuff as Cause, well. Because they even give her like specific address. Because she then, uh, by bloody coincidence, her <laughs> this is a this is a little bit far fetched <laughs> here. Her apartment happens to be the exact same design as the one which the person was killed in. But this is a really creepy and brilliant it bit of writing. It is really creepy. I love the, this. So to describe this to our listeners who may not have seen this or need reminding of it, these apartments are an old, very old project. Um, and by project, that's like a council estate in the UK. So they build these little boxes that people lived in who were poverty stricken. And she realizes that these apartments are all connected by a hole in the wall which essentially is where your bathroom mirror your bathroom cabinet is now that's a horror movie trope in itself you know that there's something coming through the mirror or behind you in the mirror so she shows bernadette you know i'll take the mirror down and behind it there's just a hole in the next apartment which is empty and she's like so back in the day people could just climb through rob you kill you it's really unsafe and her friend bernadette's like that's a bit worrying she's like ah, it's fine the apartment's empty it's all good but like you said she's given an address so she decides to go off and um, and do a little bit of investigation in this apartment where this woman apparently was killed well, by the Candyman. And you got to say, like, their first visit to Caprini Green, it's both of them, and the, the, the people that turn up, uh, the people that are there just hanging out, they're just like, uh, 5-0? You, you're, you're 5-0? Like, you're just yeah. saying that they're the police. You've got four or five black guys, um, probably a gang. They look like they are anyway. They want to be a gang. They're, some of them are very young. Um, and they're like, hey, ladies. They're really sort of intimidating them they're, and they're asking not, them. <clears throat> they're not too bad. And I've got to say, bull, the, the ladies have some big kahunas, really, because they just go in like <clears throat> like like nothing. They're just absolutely fine just hitting that, they're hitting that place without any intimidation. I've got to say, Helen later on goes back there by herself, you know, if, and, she know. Gets, and she gets beaten up. But you're like, wow, she does. like that's crazy that you would actually do that. But is that trying to say, like, the passion she has for this project? And then she's got the uh, the publishers interested later on, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, yeah, so they go there, and um, they, they go upstairs, and you've got people say, hey, uh, hey, everyone, uh, backstairs, 5 all coming up, 5 all coming up. Yeah, and then that works in their favour because they're both well dressed women. It um, does, and one of them's because white. then no one's going to so fuck it, just in case they are cops. Yeah, so yeah, exactly, exactly. So even though they've said they're professors, that means nothing to these kids. They just think, nah, you're police. You're police. What else would you be doing here? So they go up uh, into the apartments, and they, they're, as they're going up the stairs, there's some amazing graffiti everywhere. Yeah, yeah, totally. Before, very quickly before this, we did have our first jump scare of this movie. This movie is made up of jump scares. Oh yeah, with um, the the Trevor. husband just all of a sudden pounces up from the bed into bed really weirdly. Yeah, but so he's come back from his girlfriend's student's place at like three in the morning and then jumps on his wife. This guy's got some fucking balls, hasn't he? 
He's got some vert of, he's got some Viagra in him as well, I reckon. Oh yeah, maybe that as well. Maybe a bit of cocaine as well. It was uh, 1992. His, girlfriend, bit of cocaine, bit his of girlfriend's definitely high on coke later on when Helen comes back from the hospital and she catches him. And she, oh yeah, she falls off this. And she looks and <laughs> she's definitely high on coke. Well, there's graffiti everywhere up these stairs leading up to this apartment. And one of the ones that keeps coming back on the walls, and we see this throughout the movie, is a phrase, sweet to the sweet. And this is one of part of the Candyman's myth and legend and scare tactics. Um, you know, people know about, they call him the Candyman. They know about the honey and the bees and they, they say sweets to the sweet. So they go to this place where the woman died. Um, Helen climbs through because it's all boarded up. They have to climb through the mirror in the yeah, next door she, apartment. She, she pulls the mirror off and goes, see, this is exactly the same. She's like, oh my God, her friend's like, oh my God. And she goes, look, there's no one's in there. And she goes, what if they're like weighing up drugs? Hang on, let's listen. No, nope, no one's there. Like, hold this, I'm going to go through there. And she just goes, I love the fact that her mate though looks around and goes, I'm not going to sit on the bathtub, but uh, there's a towel on the floor here. I'll just put that towel up on the bathtub and sit <laughs> on it. Don't sit on the towel. The bathtub, the rustic bathtub's probably better than the cum soaked fucking towel. <laughs> I love that's what you were thinking of during this scene. I, I was just I, really nervous. I did actually think that as well. I was really with Bernadette on this one. I was like, why are you climbing through this mirror into this abandoned apartment where somebody that's, was apparently killed by the candy man? That's this what you were shouting out. And I'm, I'm there shouting out, don't sit on the cum towel. <laughs> well, she climbs in and she, this place is spooky. It's dark. There's graffiti everywhere. She sees another she hole in the wall this time. She comes out of the mouth, doesn't she? That is a great scene, isn't it? It's she, kind of cool. She, so somebody's drawn a great big, big mural of the candy man. Tony Todd basically on this wall on the other side but she doesn't know so she goes through this smashed bit of wall oval shaped and as she climbs out from the other side we see she's climbing out of his mouth almost like one of the bees later on in the movie and then she turns around and sees it she takes some pictures um, we do get another jump scare when she pops her head back through the uh, the mirror and says oh I've run out of film let's get some more from the car and Bernadette's like actually let's just fucking leave this is terrifying and Helen really, really wants to stay, but um, they, she, they do decide to leave. She find, when she went through that mouth, she looked down at candy she finds. She finds razor blades in the apples. Did she? Yeah. I did not see that. Yeah, there's razor blades in that candy. Wow, I did not see that. Um, well, there's a lady that lives in the apartment who's got a Rottweiler and a baby. Uh, we, we, um, by the way, we, we, we had our next jump scare. She pops through the, into the lady on the cum towel. Goes, ooh! That was our second jump scare, which is yeah. like, at that point, I'm literally, like, my eye, I'm just like, oh. The Rottweiler was a jump scare as well, wasn't it? Because they walk out the door that, and you... That's another jump scare, yeah. I guess it's trying to <clears> keep <throat> you on edge, but it's just a bit like, oh, stop doing the jump scares, please. So they talk to this lady who's got the Rottweiler and she's got a baby. She's like a single parent and she explains all about the violence, the gangs, the drugs. Um, and, he, and then he... she says... I was going to say, you feel kind of bad for this lady. Like, she, she's a single mother trying to do the right thing. She's got a Rottweiler for protection, which is a she good, lives good idea. In that, she's got this just basically apartment. a very opened two rooms. Um, and that's it. And it looks lovely, waste up. But you can see she's in working clothes, like a, uh, a convenience store type thing. And she's yeah. obviously got to try and like, raise this child. And she, and she really loves her kid. And it's becomes later on it's just for, for me being a parent and that as well it's a bit like oh my gosh later on when you come back to that bloodied room which we get to she's almost a bit she's definitely got some mental health issues because she talks about she heard the woman die now the woman definitely died it was all over the news whether it was Candyman or not we were not sure at this point so, but she says I heard her screaming I could hear her through the walls screaming and screaming and screaming and then she says he can come through the walls you know he can come and get you anytime she's talking about the Candyman so they get this is their first sort of almost eyewitness but not encounter with somebody that claims to have heard Candy and kill somebody I'm going to say also a, um, a theme here was that the, the dad wasn't around uh, uh, admittedly, the dad could be at work, but we don't ever see or hear or anything of a, a, a dad of this baby, you know, husband to this woman in this apartment. Um, presumably not, where it's a theme in Get Out as well. Our main protagonist in that, um, his father, left as well. And as John yeah. Bill said, this is quite a... Uh, un, a, a, a what I don't know what reasons this is quite a thing in uh, the black com it, community. It's a stereotype again, isn't it's it? It's not a stereotype. It, no, no, not a stereotype. This is a theme, which is like a, a lot of father figures do 
go and leave children. That is, you know, you look at Boys mm. in the Hood, look at all these movies. Um, yeah, I suppose, I suppose it, you're right. It's a theme a proper, running through. It is, it's not as in a film. This is real life. It actually happens. Jordan Peele says this is unfortunately the case. You know, mm. a lot of the yeah. fathers just go. They just fucking get out of there. Sure. Yeah, no, no, I agree. So I looked um, into that when she was just there with the baby. I looked into that whole thing and, okay, she's there by herself. She's got this Rottweiler for protection. She's trying to do it herself. And, like, that's so hard. But she's so passionate and in love with her baby. So it's quite a powerful thing. And especially what happens is so, just you know, distraught. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> we cut to a restaurant now. And this is probably where we've got uh, the most white people in, in the film really gathered in one scene. Not that that matters, but just worth pointing out in line with the, you know, the subject matter that we're talking about with this episode. And it's just a bunch of professors, and they're all talking about, oh, you're the lady studying Candy Man. Oh, fucking what? haircut. Oh, what an absolute dick. Um, he's the one, though, that does tell Helen the backstory of 1890, um, you know, and we find out that he was the son of a slave, blah, 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 raised in polite society. We've talked about this. His father was a shoemaker. He was an artist, painted portraits, fell in love with a girl became pregnant um they sawed off his hand with a rusty saw they smeared him in honey threw him naked into an apiary um he was stung to death burned on a pyre and then they scattered his ashes over cabrini green that is a hell of a backstory for candy man and uh, he basically uh, they're they're very confident that they're gonna be he's he's already done this before and um i think it was quite acclaimed possibly in some circles uh, I don't know what press or they're what, almost or they're guys. almost mocking her, aren't they? They're almost mocking her, really. They're mocking both of them because they're both working on it. And say, what do you want to give us your findings? Like, no, 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 but we will beat you. And so, well, really now, and this is where he calls it bluff and says, do you know about this? And it gives us the backstory. It's a great way of giving us a backstory for Candyman as well, actually. Um, and this is what drives Helen back to the projects on her own now. Exactly, you're She's right there. Determined. That's that's the driving force for that. Definitely. So she goes back on her own, and as we know, it's a scary place anyway. Um, and she goes back, and she meets a little boy. I think his name's Jake. It is Jake. Um, yeah, and she sort of says, oh, she tries to talk to me. He's like, I'm not supposed to talk about the Candyman. I'm too scared to talk about the Candyman. And I'm going to say here, check the gate, because uh, on this, this scene here, there's two big dots on the uh, the screen. It's like, fucking clean your lens, for fuck's sake. Oh, really? Sake. I, I didn't spot that. Yeah, check, check the gate, check the gate. Yeah. There wasn't there wasn't a um a fight club penis in the corner as well, was there? No, I didn't see that. It could be cock. It could be <laughs> cock all everywhere, I don't know. Um well this little boy says he's scared of Candyman, but he says, I can tell you where he was, I can tell you where he's been and she says oh, Okay. So this little boy takes her across the a few blocks really Sh- to this shows them making a bonfire. Yeah, well, yeah, They're there's a huge ready. bonfire yeah, being built. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um What's this celebration for, though? I don't know what that celebration's for later on. Uh, no, we don't I really find out, do we? Not really. No. Um, well, the little boy takes her to what we what looks like derelict toilet, like public toilets, but they're actually open. Um, and he says that was where Candyman, but and he tells us this backstory about probably from the seventies, by the looks of the clothes, where a boy went in there and was killed, and another guy went in and came out and said. That whatever's going on in there, I don't want anything to do with. No, 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 no. Let me tell it. Um, basically, uh, this 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 woman's in this department store of a kid, and the kid says, "Oh, mummy, I need to go to the toilet." And the kid was a little bit mentally ill, um, and the woman let him go over the road and go to the toilet. This, I guess, in the sort of time you would just let your kid cross the road and go over there, you know. And um, then she, there's a massive scream and everyone looks around and this big kind of guy, this kind of hard guy, goes over to the toilets and he comes out like seconds later and his hair goes white. Oh, that's right. He took his hair turned white. And, and it's because this it's kid just, uh, was it, lying on the ground. This was disturbing. Well, the, Jake, and this is told, a little boy telling Helen this story. He says he was holding himself and it was in the toilet. So his dick had been cut it's, off, thrown in the toilet. And the little boy says... Ain't no fixing that. <laughs> no, I didn't find this shocking at all as a kid. Watching this now, I'm just like, oh my god! The camera pans across the toilet from from uh, right to left, and as we go, we go by our first cube cause. A little boy just there, and you can't see his face really, but blood everywhere, and he's holding himself. And then it goes out to the toilet, and there's blood all in the toilet. That is fucking disturbing, dude. <laughs> I know, I know. I, sh- um, I was literally a bit shocked. I went, whoa, and I looked at Jay. Also, Jay's I, just I, I like, look, huh? 
you know. The whatever. fact that it's a little boy telling her the story as well. Oh, it is it's just really, really powerful, and that's that's nothing to do with black or white or anything. That's that's children's dicks being cut off in toilets. That shit yeah. is powerful, you know. Well, Helen, of course, goes straight into the toilets. It smells bad. She's almost thrown up from the smell, and it says on the wall, sweets for the sweet everywhere again. But this time it's smeared in shit. It's, it looks like shit. It looks it's like it on shit, the and it, it's in 3D popping effects as well. Yeah, it's got lumps on it and bits of sweet corn and but everything. She, she still like goes to the last <laughs> cube. She goes through all the cube calls, gets to the last one, pulls up the thing, and it's a, a toilet full of bees. Yeah, apparently they smeared Vaseline oil all over the rim of the toilet so the bees wouldn't go out of the toilet. They would stay within the toilet. Apparently, they were, the man on set um, for the bees for this was the same man who was in charge of the bees on uh, My Girl, that Macaulay Culkin movie where he gets killed at the end by a bunch of bees. And apparently, his Bee main piece of Exactly. And his main piece of equipment was a special vacuum that was soft that he could suckle the bees up in. Uh, they wouldn't get hurt. And that was how he sort of collected them up after each scene. So imagine a man with a big vacuum sucking up bees out of a toilet. I've never seen that Macaulay Culkin movie, but you've totally spoiled it for me. He dies at the end. You just told me you spoiled it for me, haven't you? And Bruce Willis is a ghost. Oh, fuck. So yes, a toilet full of bees. But um, outside, the little boy, while she's in there, the little boy sees a man in a long coat and he oh. looks up and he says... You just see his face. And... Yeah. But you don't see who the we guy don't know is. who it is, yeah. And while Helen's in the toilet, a man walks in, a tall black fellow with a long coat. Long trench, leather trench coat and a hook. And a big hook. And she she doesn't seem scared because even though Candyman's got a hook, she's know, not scared she's, of that. She's st- yeah, she's in a toilet full of shit by herself in the projects with a dude there with a fucking hook and a trench leather. The fact he's got a leather trench coat, that's kind of scary. He could be Blade, you know. She, she says, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll get out of here now. I was just taking some pictures. That's fucking weird. Why are you taking pictures in the men's toilet, Why love? are you taking pictures of shit on the door, love? What's going on <laughs> with you and your fucking fetish? Well, he then... Uh, all then of his, the gang come in, though. Yeah, and I believe some of them are the gang from earlier, which is why I said I thought they were a gang. I think they're some of the kids from earlier. If I hadn't known... If I was watching this for the first time, I'd have been like, uh, they're going to rape her, aren't they? That was my first yeah, thought. But I did good, this because I knew it. I knew it's not, but... Well, they surround her, don't they? And he says, um, I heard you're looking for the candy man. And she says, yeah. And then he sort of, I can't remember what he says. I'm the candy man, bitch. Something like that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, And he just fucking knocks her out with the hook. Like, you don't know. At this point, we don't know, Gav. Like you said, are they going to kill her? Are they going to rape her? We don't know what's going on. There's a gang of blokes surrounding her. I feel bad for the little kid who goes in afterwards to just find her there. What if she'd actually been, like, cut up and killed? That would have fucking disturbed him. Well, she has got one hell of a black eye hasn't her face is popping the effects are brilliant for the makeup um it she goes like a large the anus station. oh really anus eye <laughs> um she goes to the police and the police are actually quite pleased because she does the whole like you know line up where they've got five suspects yeah, and they all yeah. step forward and say yeah. i'm the can i heard you're looking for the candy man bitch i heard you're looking for the candy man bitch I heard you're looking for the candy man, bitch. And they all have to say it. <laughs> I wish it was you doing the lineup. <laughs> and eventually she picks out like number three or four. And the police are like, this is a guy that we have been after for years. He is a, a rapist, a murderer, a drug dealer. And he uses the Candyman urban legend to terrorize the community. It's them. It looks like it's this gang that are spraying this sweets for the sweets everywhere. Uh, and, you know, he uses that hook and he has killed people. And, you know, thank you so much. You've helped us to catch this guy. I was a little bit so, shocked. And uh, she's like, how did you get him? Uh, wait, well, we went into the projects and flushed him out. Oh, what do you mean you flushed yeah. him out? Uh, what? What? Flushed them out of the, the shit all over the wall. I'm pretty shocked that they managed to find him, to be honest. But uh, conveniently, they did, which is good because it enables us to move forward in the story fairly quickly. And I like these cops. These cops seem nice. Later on, though, they turn on Helen, and we'll, we'll come back to that. Fairly, fair, good, due, due reason, though. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. That's that's that kind of bit done, really. And they, so they say that he did the killing. He did the killing department, and he did the killing of yeah whatever else yeah but bear in mind we are a good 40 45 minutes into this movie and we apart from the very brief backstory of Candyman's 
death, you know, back in 1890. Um, we haven't really actually met him yet in the present day. So this is really the first time we see him. So it's a bit like Bernadette, Jaws, isn't it? It is. It's exactly like that film. <laughs> um, so Bernadette says, hey, Helen, I saved your camera. Um, so, you know, here's all your negatives. So she's walking through the car park looking at all these pictures she took of all the graffiti. And and as she and, gets... And, and, towards... she's, and she's found out publishers are interested in the story at that point. So she's oh, yeah. super, super happy. Basically, she's so happy. She's on a massive high and it's all literally going to flip 180 in a moment. Well, suddenly we see these absolutely splendid shoes, probably made by his dad, as we find out in the backstory. And... We just hear this voice, Tony Todd. Helen. I came for you. <laughs> and she's like, do I know you? Uh, hello? And he sort of stood quite far away and he says, you doubted me. And he's basically saying to her, you have basically brought this on yourself because you doubted me. You've been sticking your nose in, asking all about me. Well, here I am. And he says, be my victim. And he shows his bloody stump. Is that a little joke of it? Be. <laughs> Be my victim. She's in a little trance as well, so this is a little bit like Dracula and the way he speaks. Do you know about the trance for this movie? No. So for quite a few scenes, they experimented with hypnotising Virginia Madsen. Oh. So that, so that when she spoke to Tony I, Todd... I have read so, this, but yeah, go on. And that is why this scene and a couple of other scenes, she is in a she's in a genuine trance in fact she said to the director i don't want to do this anymore because it's really freaking me out um but they did experiment with actually hypnotizing yeah, yeah they did that's right i remember his interview on adam and joe's um podcast the movie isn't that fucking crazy yeah yeah yeah. they um um yeah he was on there and he did actually say that she hypnotized that's right i remember now yeah there's bees um buzzing around and, and she and then she wakes up well this is this is where things start to go quite wrong for Helen now. Just b- bearing in mind what Gav's just said, guys. Um, you know, oh, it looks like your photos are going to be published. You're in a great position. You've escaped with your life after having the shit kicked out of you in some toilets. But don't worry, you're all good. Your husband might, might be cheating on you, but don't worry about that. She wakes up after Candyman sort of makes her black out. And she is covered in blood. With really quite full on screaming of someone who's like in really desperate. screaming it was very good screaming it it set the scene of in like she wakes up and obviously waking on that situation he has a knife there she picks a knife up because yeah she might have to defend herself she doesn't know where she is what's going on and she's covered in blood she looks to the left and the first thing she good sees, though, is it? Yeah. well the first thing she sees if she looks to the left is a uh, a dog's head a hollywood <laughs> Killing dogs in Hollywood was always a no-no. This has yeah. had a child's cock cut off, yeah, and, and a dog's no, a head dog. chopped off. So we are in the apartment of the single mum from earlier with the Rottweiler and the baby, and the Rottweiler has been beheaded. Helen is woken up, covered in blood. Is it the dog's blood? Is it, is it somebody else's? We, we're not sure yet. And as she sort of stumbles into the other room, we see the single mum screaming, looking into her baby's cot. Now there's blood all over the walls. This One comes across, think. though, yes. This comes across yeah. as the baby's been killed. So, And I always, not so much the last few watches of this movie, but when I used to watch this movie a lot back in when I was a teenager, I would always forget that the baby isn't dead. Spoiler alert, guys, but, you know, we always warn you of that. And you think you, they trick you. They do keep you going for a few seconds that the baby's gone. She's like, why? Why would well, you I, do this? Why? I, I still thought it was. I didn't realise that the baby's just gone missing. Um, I didn't know catch that. If at any one point said, where's my baby? I missed it. So I was still under that impression. And I was just like, oh, my God. Child knob cut off, dog's head cut off, and now a baby dead. That's just... That's so... Uh, shocking to me nowadays when I was yep. a kid it wasn't shocking at all when I was about 12 or when I watched this where I, have very I think <clears throat> this is a movie that ages well because as you get older as you, you realise the older, yeah. yeah as you get older the, the layers are there and as I said it's a gothic fairy tale it's, it's really quite quite sticky and gritty this, this movie um, it's, it's not a knife it's a meat cleaver by the way Sorry, you're right, because then the she's attacked by the single mum. She chops the single mum in the arm with the meat cleaver. They, the, the meat cleaver sort of gets struggled between them, and the cops kick the door in. And there she is with a meat cleaver. And she's been arrested. She's covered in blood. There's a dead 
dog and blood everywhere and, and a missing totally, baby. She's totally in shock. She's at the next scene. She's there just taking, having to take her clothes off, which is for her, uh, which it wouldn't, doesn't really bother me and I'm sure it wouldn't bother you, but for her, it's her dignity taken completely now. She's lost everything. This well, is. imagine the confusion. She's gone from that elation to suddenly meeting this mythical character in a car park to waking up in a murder scene, essentially, what she thinks might be a murder scene with definitely a dead dog. And now this policewoman is saying to her, take off this, take off that. She's saying, can't I just have a shower, please? I'm yeah. covered in blood. She's like, no, take your bra off, lift up your left breast, lift up your right breast. She's checking her for weapons everywhere. And this, she, you know, we, she's our hero, we think, you know, this poor girl, like, she surely hasn't done anything. Helen, yeah. poor, poor Helen. Um, yeah, she's really, really had her dignity ripped away from her here. Um She's under arrest. She's crying. And this is where the cop from earlier, who was really thanking her for flushing out that gangster, slams his fist down on the table and he says, you're under arrest. Do you understand what's happened? And she's like, I really, I don't, I don't remember anything. I just woke up in the apartment. You feel like a story. You do feel really bad for her. Yeah. He says to her, you know, the dog was beheaded. The baby's missing. What have you done with the baby? Um, she doesn't know. She, what can she say? She can't remember. She can't tell him, oh, I met the candy man in a car park and I woke up in a murder scene. They're not going to believe that. They don't believe her anyway. So she gets a phone call and she uh, she tries ringing her husband. And he's not no there. But, no answer. And he says that he was having a sleep, but like, to be fair, he he might be somewhere else. But I think, well, I assume she she's, turns, wait, I, I expect she's assuming because it's before mobile phones. Are so, well, she so turns much. to um, the cop and says, well, there's no answer. What time is it? And she's like, 3 a.m. Well, where's her husband at 3 a.m.? Oh, 3 a.m. Sorry, I thought it was 3 p.m. I'll okay. tell you where he is, Gav. A deep in clunge. Oh, boy. I can't believe I just said clunge. <laughs> Jesus Christ. We get some visions of, um, while she's in the prison cell, we get some visions of um, the baby crying seemingly in that apartment that Helen visited earlier with all the graffiti and the, the apples and the razor blades. We get the candy man hovering near the baby. Finally, though, the husband did get the answer machine message because he comes to pick her up from the police station. He takes her home. Just before that, that, that shots, what, why is the baby having a strobe party? A strobe party? The baby's just like hanging out with a strobe party, just a strobe going off continuously. The baby just like quite happy just sitting there. Yeah, this is all right. Because it was the 90s? I guess so. Strobe, baby, strobe. Um, so she goes home with her husband and it's all over the news at this point you know she's had to cover herself up with a blanket yeah, to get yeah, the police yeah, station yeah, yeah, yeah. and the community which is predominantly black are up in arms about this you know I, this I think, white woman I think done generally this. everybody is at this point you know yeah definitely definitely she says to her husband I don't know what to tell you I just woke up there was blood everywhere and you know what kind of a story is that it's, you know to be fair through this he uh, it's still like like with her at this stage and it's quite obvious that she's done it because I know obviously in realistic terms the candy man is a fancy thing this in the if all of these things came together you would look at this person and say yes you have done this absolutely 100% do you know what I mean he's mm -hmm. he is quite supportive then later on when it's she's seen over the top of her friend when her friend's dead later on with the knife he, she's seen by people like they walk in, it's like you must have done that. Obviously, he still like hugs her, which is so funny that he's cheating on her. There's, yeah, he is very, very supportive. Unless, he, a unless he's on a power, there. unless he he is later on, he's in the bathroom crying at the end mm. of the movie. So he does have this thing for her, and he know. I think he knows he's wrong doing this. Uh, this thing. Well, she does student. confront him at this point. She says, "You know, where were you the other night? Where where have you been? Some of these late nights?" And he's like. I was doing, he gives his excuses and he says, I just thought you were at Bernadette. So he kind of plays it off. He's almost gaslighting her really. He's kind of like, there's a little bit of mental abuse there almost. Like he's, That's like, what I'm saying. it's he, all in your head. It's all in your head. He's he's definitely a abuser. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. no, no doubt. Yeah. She goes through the photos that she took and she sees in one of the photos that she's taken of herself in a mirror, just behind her, she can make out the candy man just behind her, which is quite creepy. She seems fairly... I know she's got a cigarette and a drink and that, but she does seem kind of calmish about the fact that she's probably going to go down for life. You know? 
Yeah, it's not looking good. Well, this next scene's quite interesting because Virginia Madsen did not know that they were going to do this. So the reaction that she has when Candyman's hook hand smashes through the bathroom mirror is real. Uh, she didn't know that they were going to do that, and she ran off set crying, apparently. So I don't know if that <laughs> is a good thing, but... Um, that's a, Sim- yeah. that's a Simpsons reference, by the way. A what? <laughs> that's Simpsons. from Simpsons. It's a, Simpsons? It's, a, it's a TV show from the 90s. Ah, okay, cool. Right. Uh, I'll have to check it out. Um, is it on Netflix or anything? No, no. there's a couple of episodes. In, yeah. Okay. So, uh, yes, uh, where are we? Sorry, the hook. Slide, she runs off. show photos. He's in her apartment. He comes through the mirror. He's in her apartment. And it's daylight. What I like about this scene is it's broad so daylight. Basically, he, did another, in her apartment. he did another jump scare then. Are we saying yep. another jump scare? Another jump, jump scare, scare number four. Okay, cool. Ding. He says to her, I have the child. He basically gives her an ultimatum and says, come with me and I'll free the child. If you don't, I will kill the child. Come with me. I'll be immortal. He's saying to her, let me kill you. Let me have you. Um whatever it may be and is it in her head is it not it's very interesting um bernie's outside the door this is that scene now bernadette has turned up with flowers now at this point i thought yes, she was a baby killer so i'm thinking do you take babies to flowers to baby killers is that do you the take, norm do you take babies to flower killers <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was, oh, damn it i stepped on some daffodils earlier here's a baby oh, here's okay. a baby <laughs> <laughs> but do you take flowers to baby killers or baby kidnappers? Is that well, the right thing to do? Bernadette's her friend and she believes her, I think. Mm, okay. Um, so Bernadette uh, is outside and suddenly... She hooks up the candy man. She, she does hook up the candy man she like that. in the worst way. And just as this happens, Trevor walks in and finds Helen holding a knife covered in blood. And Bernadette is lying on the kitchen floor and she's been opened up from uh, groin to gullet, which is Candyman's speciality. Uh, it's quite a lot of blood. And the police sort of sedate her. Um, she, they cuff her on her own bed. Um and yeah, she's found on the husband. floor by her husband, by, by old Trevi, mate. Oh, Trev. And they take her to hospital and they strap her to a bed. And you, get this, you get this great scene, scene there where Candyman is floating just above her, isn't he? And he's talking to her. And later on, she has the privilege of watching the CCTV footage back. And he's not there. No, and this he's... is, this is uh, it goes back to you us going when you're watching it, like, it's in her head. Is this all in yeah. her head? At this point here, it's affirming to her and everybody else is her head. This is why later on when she gets wheeled into the dude's office, the white dude, she, uh, I, uh, he gets killed. And I remember as a kid going, yes, that's really good because her arms are still strapped in. She can say, look, how could I have done it? And yeah. I'm like, yeah. Then he comes around exactly. and goes, he comes around and goes, uh, uh. And he got, and that's her and he go, no <laughs> it's a really good really good it is really good yeah, it yeah. is really you're good you're really with her Helen on this journey Candyman says to her just give me one kiss one divine kiss um, and we get some flashes of him feeding honey to the baby basically um, so that's how he's keeping the baby alive and, me, yeah, that right, baby's going to be bouncing off the walls <laughs> she's taken to see Dr. Burke uh, the psychiatrist Dr. Burke and he, she finds out, she still thinks it's the same day that, that she was brought in. And she says, what time is it? And he says, you've been here one month. Imagine that. Yeah, one month. Didn't realise. And he says, you've been sedated. You probably don't remember she, much of it, really. I, I was confused at this point, though. When she's there, she's very, very awake. She's very, very alert. Well, they've let her come off of the sedation a bit so that she could... Because the reason she's having this meeting is so that's they the want first her to stand... time since probably it's taken her a few days to come back round. So that's probably the first time she can initiate a conversation then. And they need okay, now cool. to establish whether or not she can stand trial or whether she's insane. So this is what this meeting is. She's going to be assessed by this psychiatrist. Okay. They talk about Candyman and she said, it wasn't me. And he's like, prove it. She's like, all right, I'll prove it. And there just so happens to be a mirror to her left. What does she do? She looks in it and she says his name five times. Not, not much happens initially. 
and then all of a sudden we hear a, a terrible ripping sound. And the dog's Tony... blood comes out of his mouth. And it's quite nice he's behind. We don't actually have a jump scare. Yay! No, Tony Todd just gradually stands up from behind the doctor. And again, it's... gullet, it's... groin to gullet. This scene always makes me cringe because that ripping sound of the hook as it tears this guy up the back from his arsehole up to his back. The sound, the sound design throughout this movie is very good. Like Tony Toll's reverberation of his um, voice whenever he's like narrating, it when, you know, when he's doing it in his mind. It's a, it was really good sound design, actually. How excited were you when you went to watch Final Destination in the cinemas and Tony, Tony Todd. Todd turned up with that voice in the mor- in the morgue? Yeah. So good, so so good. <clears throat> anyway, that's enough of that. Going back to this. So yes, you're right, Gav. After he kills this doctor, we are thinking, well, at least everyone will know that she's strapped to the wheelchair. But Candyman cuts her loose. Then he jumps out the window, basically saying to her, "Follow me." Now, whether she's doing this herself or whether Candyman's actually Follow doing me. this. Is he a, lepre- is he a leprechaun? Is he warm? Oh, oh, use a pogo chair. Pogo stick on your chest. <laughs> <laughs> Who would win out of the leprechaun candy and the candy man? Candyman and leprechaun. Well, Candyman, he's just going to step on leprechaun, isn't he? Yeah, leprechaun ain't got a chance against him. That's that's nothing to little people. No, not at all, but it is to leprechauns. Well, Candyman's quite a big lad. Yeah, he is a big lad. <laughs> he's a big lad. Candyman, he's a big lad, isn't he? <laughs> and he's got a fucking hook for a hand. Um, <laughs> so, yes, she smashes, she climbs out of that broken window and she does a daring Jackie Chan move now where she sort of scales down yeah. the building. And it kind of reminded me of the Joker in the second Batman movie of Christopher Nolan's. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then she jumps in a window, knocks a nurse over, smashes her head into the ground, steals the nurse's outfit. And yeah. now I'm starting to think... Helen doesn't seem quite as good as we thought here. She's just cracked that nurse's head open and stolen a uniform. She, she has all of a sudden got some ghetto-ness in there, hasn't she? Yeah, she's, she's, got, bit, she's bit gone of... full on. Yeah. Um, she goes home. I love this scene. She goes home, back to her apartment. Now, bearing in mind, it's only been a month. She walks into her apartment, her I, and Trevor's apartment. I'm never horroring, it, horroring that, that girlfriend to paint my apartment. She's shit at painting. Well, shit. It's all over the place. What are you doing, love? She walks in and the girl, the student that she caught flirting with her husband months ago is painting her kitchen in like a little t-shirt. And she turns around and she sort of screams a bit and Trevor, not knowing that Helen's back in the apartment. She screams in last. That's why she's well coked up, definitely. Um, Trevor walks in and he goes, what is it, my little honey bunny? What is wrong with you? Did you get a boob? And then he sees Helen stood there. That's great. And she's in a nurse's outfit as well, just to throw weirdness into the mix. Um, they're very scared of her, obviously. She's potentially a killer. She's killed Bernadette. I she's have, kidnapped the baby. Can I have a quick tangent with you? Yeah, yeah. I love. Oh, we haven't done a tangent really, have we? Um, Le- Leprechaun, I guess. Bernard Rose, who directed this, do you know how he got his first gig, his first job? Go on. He was a student, living in a student accommodation type of thing with other sort of filmmakers. This is back in the day in England. He's English here. And uh, he answered the phone, and it was um, uh, they they um, it was I think Duran Duran, maybe girls on the film or something like that. I think it's Duran Duran or a band like that, and they're just like, oh yeah, we need you. Oh, I think it's Frankie Goes to Hollywood. You need to relax or something like that. And they said, oh, we just need someone who can make a make a video for us. And he's well, like, so he directed that. Uh, he he directed um, I think he directed Girls on the Film. What's the one which has? No, which is not Girls of Astran Dran. The movie which has uh, the show that has all the uh, all the men. It's all men. Oh, Wild Boys. It's not Dran Dran. It's um, Frankie Goes to Hollywood. The main song oh, Frankie does. Yeah, he did. He did. Relax, so relax, he, isn't it? Relax. He did relax. He, he did also relax. did. He also did the UB40 song Red Red Wine, the music video for Red Red Wine as well. Oh, that's it. That, was that the first video he did? Uh. Which, which yes, music video. UB40, Red Red yeah. Wine. He answered the phone, it's UB40, and they wanted someone to make him a video. So it, it, just because <laughs> just because he was there and he answered the phone, he managed Brilliant. to make music videos. That's how he got his, got his way in life. What a, way to get, what a way to get into the business. He answered the phone. Alice, Alice has met some of UB40, because they're from Birmingham, where she's from. And um, when she was younger, um, one of the girls at her school was the daughter of one of UB40. And uh, she went round his house once, and her dad was sort of quite excited that Alice had been round someone famous's house. And she said, "Yeah, it smelled funny in their house because they were smoking the ganja. Ga. Smoking the ganja, they were." You be forty two. You be forty three. Yeah, I was wondering if you. Hey, 
white jokes. Dum. White men jokes. Dad <laughs> jokes. Um, where are we? Oh, yeah, so they're afraid of Helen. And he says, call the hospital, honey, to his girlfriend. And she sort of has a chat with him. She says, oh, you can not even wait, could you? And she kind of ends up just leaving the apartment. She realizes all hope's lost. She crosses the city, goes back to the projects, back to the apartment. And she sees, and this is where I agree with you, Gabby, he is like a vampire. She sees Candyman asleep on a table like Dracula would be, doesn't she? Hmm. Definitely. She picks up a hook off the ground. She sneaks up on him while he's sleeping and she stops him in the chest with it. Yeah, I don't know if I can imagine just having a little nap. <laughs> well, he's a bit tired. He's been feeding that baby honey for he's the last He's fucking day. high on sugar and candy. <laughs> he's a big lad. Um, <laughs> Candyman, he's a big lad. I wish that was on the video. <laughs> that could be the, the Candyman, he's, he's a big lad. Candyman. He's a big lad. He'll have you. Um, yeah, so she stabs him with a hook, and we talk about the child. The child is not there. Um, where the hell is the child? Uh, he says, surrender to me, and the child will live. The pain will be exquisite. This, this is kind of that Clive Barker Hellraiser yeah. pleasure and pain thing now, isn't it? Yeah, come with me and be immortal. Dracula, he opens, Dracula. He opens his coat, and his ribs are all hanging out and all his guts, but they're all full of bees, aren't they? Mm. Apparently, uh, he signed his contract, said... For every bee sting, his lawyer's got it. So that for every time he got stung, he got a thousand dollars extra. So he got stung twenty three times in this movie. So he got an extra twenty three thousand on his paycheck. So are you saying once he got out of costume, he was there with one of his <laughs> uh, one of his guys and the like, producer and probably the director, and they were counting? No, that's not one. That's a Scott. No, that's a sting. And, uh, oh, yeah, that's apparently sting. throughout the, the Candyman trilogy, he got stung almost 90 times. So he made almost 100 grand off of just bee stings alone, Tony Todd. No, that, no, he got that in his first contract for the first one. I, Candyman 2 and 3, I, I imagine yeah. the budget probably went down, my friend. I should imagine you're right, actually. But yeah, on this one, anyway, he got his lawyers to, to do that, which is cool. Fair play, sunshine, um, fair play. I know, right? He knew what he was doing. Um, and also, he had bees in his mouth for real, so he opens bee his mouth kiss. to kiss. Yeah, he opens his mouth to kiss Helen, and he was apparently wearing um, like a um, like a dent. They call it a, a dental dam, which you wear in the dentist and stuff at the back of your throat to stop things going down your throat. They filled his mouth with bees, and they he opens his mouth and the bees come out. I mean, I would. How much guts have you got to do as an actor to have a mouthful of bees? Jesus Christ! Well, they definitely is going to be a stinging on your tongue and stuff. They were apparently or very. Did they have very... Sting st- or were they docile? No, they were very young bees, and apparently once they're a certain were, age, they don't sting as much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then she's covered in bees as well, because as he kisses her, her face is covered in bees, so both of them were, you know, getting bees all over them. Um, and she wakes up again, alone. It the baby's gone. always you, Helen. It's brilliant. <clears> she, grabs <throat> the, uh, she grabs the hook again. And she sees the, yeah, the writing on the wall says it was always you, Helen. She finds the baby outside. She hears it crying. And it's somehow been placed, Wicker Man style, in, yeah. in this gigantic bonfire. She gets in. Candy she gets Man in. Uh, all of a sudden appears as well when she finds the baby. They have a bit of a tussle. Um, the community set the bonfire ablaze yeah, because... They, they, as she's Someone's in there, all the community start coming out, and someone's got a torch. And is it Jake actually sets it up? I said on fire. No, no, he wouldn't do would it. I think he sees. He doesn't. He's there anyway, Jake, the little boy. Yeah, um, yeah, and so watching. is the single mum, um, who's lost yeah. her child, obviously. And Helen manages to crawl out of the fire. It's quite gnarly, actually. She's on fire. Her hair's on fire. She's on fire. She's got the baby safe. They take the baby off of her and they put her she, out. She's she's done a lot of work. Uh, the actress who plays Helen. Virginia Madsen, yeah, she it looked like that was actually her on fire. Don't know. Do you know what I mean? Um, it was very good, Prophet. The way the way they've done it, I don't think that she is on fire. She's not a stunt lady. Jesus Christ! If if, if Tony Todd was getting a stung for a bee, Virginia Madsen getting <laughs> set on fire, I want fucking five mansions. She's like, hang on a minute. He's had twenty three grand off these things. What You've just I set got? my fucking hair on fire. What have I got? A fucking bald head now, son. What's going on? I don't know why she's all of a sudden not fucking from London, but yeah. Then the um, 
the bonfire, basically a billion bees sort of blast out the top of the bonfire and mix, mixed in with the smoke, which is quite a cool image. And we get our final scene now, really, which is, well, one of our final scenes, which is Helen Dyke, our that, hero. Is who is, uh, yeah. And with, there's only. With Trevor with his girlfriend. There's only about four people there. Trevor because obviously and his girlfriend. She's, why did he take the girlfriend? It's support. He needed, yeah, support. My wife's been killed. Girlfriend, come with me, support. Then suck my penis. Oh, Jesus. But then um, a procession, the black community turn up from the project, and they just kind of come up just to basically... <laughs> they all come up and you think, oh, man, they've sort of... They, they're Are they like, forgiving they're like, her? They forget, they're like saying, thank you for giving us the baby. They're like, nah, there's the hook, bitch. And then yeah, fucking they just turn around the and get the fuck out of there. Jesus. Um, and then we cut to the final final scene, which is um, Trevor is back in his apartment that he used to live in with Helen. Now he lives in with his girlfriend. He's in the bathroom, sat on the toilet. Not actually sat on the toilet taking a shit, but he's sort of sat there crying. He's very sad because, you and know, he, it was his wife. His, uh, his non-bra-wearing girlfriend. I know. What the hell? Swinging all over the place she was. He's just getting so annoyed that he won't come in prep for salad. She's like... I'll make, she actually says, I'll make you a nice dinner. He's like, nah, I'm all right. And then she starts throwing meat on the counter and it's like, come on, make the salad with me. God, I've, bastard. Had, I've, had, I've had girlfriends like that. <laughs> come and make the fucking salad. They haven't said that to me, but yeah. <laughs> and then what an amazing bookend now, because he looks into the mirror and he's so sad and he says, oh, Helen, 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 Helen. I know, Jay's like... Five times. He's going to say and it five course, times. I was like, yeah. And of course, she appears behind him with a big old bald, scarred head. Big old bald head. She says, she says something like, did you miss me? Or something along those lines. Um, and it recycles and goes round because a, a, a big nippled girlfriend is out there with um with a knife, holding a knife, and she's screaming. So yeah. the police are turn up, she get done, and be like, oh no, look what happened. And then as the credits start, we go back to that apartment with all the graffiti, and, and there's a it's, mural it's of a Helen. It's a mural, yeah. With a big slash down it, possibly made by a hook. Yeah, mural, not muriel, that's someone. Not, not muriel, that's a lady. Um, and I that reminds me of the Dracula myth, you know, like in Fright Night when or something, you know, where they meet somebody that reminds them of their girlfriend they had 400 years ago. So I'm wondering if Candyman maybe saw something in Helen that reminded him of... Of course, that's why. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, Did you not it's know never, that? It's, it's never mentioned once in oh, the whole thing, that's, but no, that's for me, ob- that's, that's what I got no, from that last scene. That's obvious. No, 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 no. All right. I, I, I'm I, stupid. I did watch Fright Night again the other night. Very good movie. Don't get too started on that. Fucking jumper. Friday night. Oh man. On the sweat. That disco Jerry sweater. Dandridge West. Jerry Dandridge sweater in a disco. We could, we could do a whole episode on that sweater. I've got nothing to say about that sweater. <laughs> a bit quiet, quiet podcast. Um, so you, that's can. Do you give it thumbs up or thumbs down? I give it a hook up. I give it a hook up too. It's um, like I said at the beginning, it. It's more than, as a kid, you would have just heard about this, say, in the mirror five times, and a guy comes with a hook and he kills people. But actually, there's so much more to the story. It is genuinely a gothic fairy tale told, you know, in the modern way, in the 90s, in a very poverty-stricken, predominantly black neighbourhood. It's got so many layers and elements to the storytelling. Uh, wouldn't have worked in Liverpool, <laughs> in England, I don't Liverpool. think. Well. I don't think it would have worked Candyman. as well. Hey, sweets for the sweet, Helen. Sweets for the sweet. Come on, be with me. Give us a kiss. Come on. <laughs> Get <laughs> when it works. Yeah. But um, yeah, great movie all round. And like I said, I've come to realise that as as I and as you get older, like you mentioned, it gets better and and gets more. You you realise there's more to it than just a silly slasher movie. So uh, awesome movie. And the reason we wanted to cover it, obviously, it was the first appearance of a black supernatural slasher killer. Um, so Tony Todd go- went on to be a. I mean, he was in movies before this, but and he's was Candyman two and three. Just two and yeah, three. Yeah, Can- Candyman, Farewell, Farewell to the Flesh, to the flesh. and Candyman Day of the Dead. Um, I've they, got. Have you seen them? I've got the first two on VHS. I don't think I've ever seen the third one. If I'm honest with you, and What's apparently it's not like? very good. It's all right. It's another girl. Um, it's very similar story. You get actually the second one. What I would say about it is, it gives you a hell of a lot more backstory. There's a lot of scenes set back in the day when he was a human. So, so he just sort of extended the story. That's never really yeah. that good though, because if you're doing that, you're putting stuff out which could be okay, but you're kind of just 
grasp its jaws a little. I wouldn't you? bother. I wouldn't bother seeking out two and three, I'm but not, this is definitely yeah. a gem and a horror legend, and very excited to see what uh, Jordan Peele as producer does with this this lady directing it and yeah. with the remake really or right, whatever I'm it is for, it is, it is uh, put back because of the older corona um, mm. um but i still feel it's coming out in september i might be wrong well we look forward to that and maybe we'll cover it someday because it's uh, it's looking like it's going to be from the traders it's looking like it's going to be good if it's in the cinema and if it's a time when i'm going to be seeing sarah uh, we will definitely watch it and i will tell you what i think you could hook up Hook up with a hooker. Don't do that. And have some candy. Razor blade candy. Oh, yeah. So there we go. Tony Todd. What a legend. Can I get into your smelly capsule? Well, I've just started it up, actually. Is it... Uh, have you? Did you put oil in it? It sounded a bit... I'm just... It, oil, it sounded just, a bit of a ticking sound the last I'm time. Gonna be just op- let me just open this up. There we go. You ready? <laughs> Oh, I'm ready. You ready? You ready for 1993? That sounded like you're being sucked off. Was that you putting oil in the uh, machine? There's a special device I've got underneath the um, dashboard. Don't worry about it. Are you ready to, to head back to 1993? Yeah. Are we not wearing helmets this time? No, no helmets this time. Well, not well, on our heads anyway. Why have you anyway. got so cavalier with this time travelling? You were so much... You were so I'm like crash test dummy there. last time. Yeah, but I'm very confident, especially now with the new hip-hop button that we added about four episodes ago. It, I just know what I'm doing, though. It's been good. Okay, cool. I can't wait. Let's get let's get going. Ready? Yep. <laughs> Whoa! What's this machine? This is my time machine. Your yeah. time machine? Yeah. For the next five minutes, we are going to be the time team. The time team! Whoa! Whoa. What's this? Look at that! Look at that! Oh, he's been dead a hundred years! Look at that! Look at that, that's the Statue of Liberty coming out of the sand! Oh, there's a dinosaur! Oh my god, look at that! It's something else! Uh, oh. Oh. Here we go, 1993! Just do a little stretch, just gets a bit cramped in it! Oh. Right, here we go. So, what was going on, Gav? What was know. going on? What was 93? Oh yeah, it's, I'm supposed to tell you that. Mm. Well, I'll tell you one thing that was going on. We're definitely like Bill and Ted, aren't we? We are like Bill and Ted. You're right. Gavin, we just don't have Gavin, Dan, Dan and Gav. Gavin, yeah. Bogus journey. Tell you one thing that was going on. What? Beanie fucking babies. Beanie babies. Everyone was collecting them. You could get them in McDonald's Happy Meals. Every film that came out, Disney. And people thought they were going to be this fucking... Like almost like a, if you bought a shitload of them, they'd be worth something in about fifty years. Why? They're not worth the, I don't know. I don't know. I see them at car who, boot sales all the time. Who gives a shit about Beanie Babies? I have no idea. But in 1993, that was all that kids wanted. All that they want. That was the number one selling toy in 1993. Just a, a, a teddy, essentially, like a full of beans. What was going on with the children of 93? <laughs> I don't know. Very, very strange. Very strange. Well, what else was going on in 1993? Waco. The Waco siege happened. Mm. That was pretty gnarly, wasn't it? Mm. That's the oil... Yeah. oil uh, 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 um, what they called... Uh, what they called in the sea? Oil. No, 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 no. Waco was the... Oh, the, no. Sorry. The Davidians. David Koresh. That's it. The David his Koresh. followers. Of course it is. What might you think of? I don't know what you're thinking of. I think it's I might think of someone taking over like one of those oil rigs at sea. Isn't that like a Die Hard movie or something? Yeah, I don't know. Well, it ended with um, 76 people dying, 25 children, two yeah. pregnant women, and the leader of the cult, David Koresh himself. It's pretty gnarly. And was that the one of the, the, the people with the trainers? People with the trainers. Oh no, it wasn't that? That's Heaven's Gate. Heaven's Gate is the uh, people that died wearing these fresh pairs of Nike, Nike trainers. They're all on their oh. bed commit suicide and they're all wearing Nike trainers. Sounds dope. <laughs> fresh sneaks. <laughs> well, that was Waco. Um, Canada broke, uh, made history by having their first female prime minister. Her name was Kim Campbell in 1983. And Buckingham Palace, and I've, I didn't realise this, Buckingham Palace first opened opened its doors to the public to have a look around in 1993 so it was up until then you couldn't it was all a mystery 
Hmm. Could go in there. Now you can go in there and use the queen's toilet if you want. Is it golden? It's golden. I'm joking. She doesn't have a toilet. She doesn't shit. She's the queen. She has no anus. One does not poop. Um, pretty pretty gnarly tennis match for Monica Seles in 1993 because um, a crazy fan uh, during a match in Hamburg stabbed her in the back while she was mid-match. Really? Lent over, lent over the railing, stabbed this, her in the back. This is interesting. The stuff you're telling me is quite full-on stuff. You've got a massive cult committing suicide and like a tennis player. And what was this was being filmed, was it? Well, yeah, it's on television. There's pictures of so it. So you can probably watch it on YouTube. Yeah, I mean, the, the person stabs her in the back and she, she's all right. She's fine, but fucking yeah, hell, Yeah, he man. tried to kill her. That's what he was stabbed her. He wasn't doing it for a laugh, was he? Was that, was that a the, disgruntled fan? It was a, an obsessive fan. Oh. And if he couldn't have her, then no one could. One of those sort of fucking... Oh, God. Get over that, that was, it. Don't you, don't you remember the joke at school? What? You keep, your, you keep your wine in the wine cellar. You keep your cheese in the cheese cellar. Where'd you keep your knives? In the Monica cellars. I didn't know, no, that had gone over my yeah, head as a child. Distasteful joke. Um, we mentioned uh, last time we went back to 1992 that the internet was sort of created. In 1993, they named it the World Wide Web. So they they sort of, that www had sort of become a thing now. Um, so the internet was really taking off no, by now. No turning back now. No turning back. Porn Central. My gosh. And talking to Porn Central, the first child abuse allegations against Michael Jackson wow. started in 1993. That's the segue I didn't expect you to do. I'm very sorry, but Michael Jackson was not a very nice man from what well, I hear. Well, no, you can't. Yeah, that is not actually still proven. You cannot say this. <laughs> the podcast on ha Haunted Hill does not <laughs> say that Michael Jackson's a pedo, okay? Dan is just joshing, okay, everybody? Okay, if, you, if that's what you think, that's fine. No, you're all right. I probably shouldn't say that. No, you cannot say that. <laughs> There's going to be some fans of this show who are possibly fans of Michael Jackson. There's got to be, possibly, maybe. I, don't well, know. I, was a, I was a massive Michael Jackson fan. And then uh, I had an argument with uh, last year when I was booking my wedding. Did I tell you about this argument with the DJ? I do remember. You told yeah, me I'll all about it. I'll tell it. our listeners about this on a little tangent. I, I was, me and Alice were, you know, having our conversation, our meeting with our DJ for our wedding, and he was like what songs do you want what songs don't you want what types of music and, and he this said, was just when Michael Jackson had just been very much in the media for allegations that, uh, and that the documentary, documentary had come out yeah, <clears throat> ne yeah. Uh, Finding Neverland was so, it so it was very in the zeitgeist of the public right at that moment yes so I said to the, the DJ I don't want any Michael Jackson songs played at the, at the wedding and he, he sat back in his chair and he looked at me angrily and he said what do you mean I said well you know is potentially he's been a, you know it's coming out now that he's a kiddie fiddler and, and i've been a michael jackson fan since i was a kid but i just don't feel comfortable having his any of his songs playing at my wedding and he went he leant over the table and he said to me he's dead yeah and there's no evidence i went right but it's my wedding and i you just asked me what songs i do and don't want and then i said would you would you want me to have a rolf harris song playing there as well <laughs> And he went, well, fair enough. I said, what, am I going to have Gary Glitter playing? <laughs> and, then he, and then he sort of saw the fun, he saw what I was saying. But the fucking sneaky DJ still managed to sneak. I think at some point he snuck in a Jackson 5 track. Very, no, very no, late. he probably didn't. He's, your, your DJ was a bit shit. I'm, I wish I didn't have so many jobs to have done. I would have DJed for you happily. And well, you our know. DJ had a heart attack just before our wedding, so yeah, yeah. we got replaced. <laughs> So and that's a true story as well. <laughs> yeah, um, but imagine you could go off DJing and like go like right, I'm gonna do a pedo set. You could go go get a pedo Rolf. set. Go get a Rolf. Bit of R Kelly in there. <laughs> um, we he said laugh, to me, his other sure. thing he was angry about. He's like, what do I say if one of your guests comes up to me and says, I want Thriller? I said, then you tell them you'll play it and you just don't play it. They're gonna be drunk. They're not gonna know. Yeah, is it? Have you never worked with a drunken crowd? Fucking hell, just listen to me. I'm paying you shitloads of money to play music <laughs> at the wedding, you bastard. Yeah, I love it when a DJ, uh, uh, some weddings especially, everyone smashed out their faces. And you get, you always get, it's always a woman as well, always just wants me, she's 
to be a victim. She just keeps coming relentlessly. She's like the Terminator. And she just keeps coming back and you say, I don't have it and I don't have access to the internet. I have records, yes? And then she keeps coming back and then she just starts to look at you and putting faces like, eh, and making sure song, you can see. Do they and it's always something like... Um, um, it's raining man. No, 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 no. It's, it's it's more modern stuff, and I'm like, I don't have it. I don't have it. And then it gets to the point you just go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got it. I found it. I'll, I'll put it on in a bit and do like what you said. And then they they, they don't know what's going on. They well, get what so we're talking much about... drunk they fall over and hurt themselves. So it's fine. Well, while we're talking about music, we should probably have a quick chat about music from 1993, and then I'll get into the hip hop section oh, of the time travel. It's going to be hip hop. We're excited. What other 93 tracks were out? Uh, so, um, before we get to hip-hop, people like Garth Brooks, Rage Against the Machine, UB40, who this we is, discussed this, earlier. This is our cultural history part of the show. Kind of is, yeah. It's turned into that, hasn't it? Okay. Aerosmith, Mariah Carey, Nirvana, Meatloaf, R.E.M. Ah, oh, Smells Like Teen Spirit came out, and uh, never mind, yeah? Mm. That, that, well, that changed everything. Grunge became huge. So, hip-hop and grunge were m- predominantly taken over mainstream music at the time. And Garth Brooks with some country. And Garth Brooks. Fucking hell. Well, here we go. We have got some hip-hop albums that came out this year. Return of the Boom Bap, KRS-One. Yep. Enter the Wu-Tang, uh, Enter the Wu-Tang 36 Chambers. That's uh, for Wu-Tang's first coming out. Probably one of my favourite hip-hop albums of all Not time. Not coming out as gay, coming out as uh, with their <laughs> album. Imagine that. This is our coming out album. <laughs> That'd be old, weird. Old Dirty Bastard. What is the Old Dirty Bastard up to? Inspect your dick. <laughs> Jizzer. Jizzer. Oh. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm supposed to be inspect the deck. Uh, Jizzer. I've always said Jizzer anyway. Jizzer. Um, who else came out this year? Cypress Hill released an album called Black Sunday this year. Incredible album. Really good. Um, Midnight Marauders. It's Tribal, Tribal Quest. Quest. Um, second or third album. Um, Back to Fuck Up by Onyx. Onyx. Which it's a great it's album. It's not now. <laughs> Listen to it now. You'll be like, oh my God. I know, I know. But at the time, I loved it. Naughty by Nature dropped their album 1993. The, one of, we can actually say it on this episode. It, it seems fine to say it on this particular episode. The, one of the songs in Onyx, the chorus being The Black Vagina Finder. Yes, that was one of the songs. Like, oh album. my God. That's the chorus of your song. You have Vagina, yeah, no. the word Vagina in your chorus of your song. <laughs> like, no one's done that. What the fuck? And no one has ever since, funny enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, Naughty by Nature dropped 1993, great album. And Snoop Dogg dropped his solo album, Doggy Star, which is just a classic. It's an amazing album, Absolute but that artwork, he, he said to his mate, yeah, you can have the artwork, is the most shittest artwork you've ever seen in your life. Yeah, it's not very good, it's is it? It's fucking appalling. Um, Run DMC had an album called Down With The King. Down With The King is a great track. That's them coming yeah. back, all in black, and they were like, all they're like in black, like, uh, literally toe, head to toe, like, that's all their outfit, because they used to be obviously classic, big hat, glasses, the Adidas shell toes. Indeed. Yeah, they come back for a new look at that point. Yeah, and I, I prefer them in their Adidas tracksuits. Yeah, and, and that's when they realised that went back to, but then he got re- run and it turned into a reverend. He's a rev yeah. run now. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Souls of Mischief you touched on them earlier 93 to Finney amazing what song what an awesome song and Ice Cube released Lethal Injection another great album I've Ice ta- Cube is banging them out in a couple of years I've talked to Souls of Mischief I, I chatted to them about um, how great that song was and I first heard it on the first, I heard it on the skate video I was pissed out my face <laughs> then they tried to get weed from me and I was like I don't got any <laughs> brilliant um, who else uh, 14 Shots to the Dome and Hello Cool J album. yeah good album that one yeah uh, oh, and 16 there were a couple here. of other ones. This, this is this is prime for me. Prime, like all the hip, all that hip hop, I knew very well. All those albums. So that was me, like literally getting everything that's coming out because I don't do that anymore. It's about a thing when you get older. I just literally don't listen to that much. I did listen to RJ, <clears throat> um, RJD two, RTJ, uh, Run Jewels. Um, uh, oh, Run the Run Jewels. Jewels' new album. Um, Really fucking good. Check out the new album. Zach Delaroche is on that quite a bit as well. Fucking I do like Run the Jewels. I do really like really them. Really good. Check it out. Yeah, yeah absolutely. A very necessary. A really good album by Salt and Pepper, who don't often get the credit they deserve. I, I feel. Yeah. Code Red by DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. Another fantastic album. Uh, really almost like a bit album. poppy that one. Yeah. Um and Mob Deep 
dropped Juvenile Hell as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, what a year for hip hop. Hibbity hibbity hop. But uh, what's going on in horror movies then? Well, let's have a look at movies first of all, uh, just to give you a taste of where we're at in movies. We have Mrs. Doubtfire, The Fugitive, Sleepless in Seattle, Schindler's List, Cliffhanger, Philadelphia. Not really. You know, some of these are classics now, like Mrs. Doubtfire is considered like a comedy classic, but none of these are really, maybe other than Schindler's List, I guess. <clears throat> but if you want to know what was going on on horror, I'm afraid you're going to be really disappointed. As I said to you, the correlation between fantastic hip hop and shit horror movies is definitely there because the only decent horror movies I can start off with really are probably Jurassic Park, which doesn't even really count as a horror movie, but it does. Um, Jurassic Park is a good film. Leprechaun came out this year. Oh my God. (laughs) This is the top of the list, is it? Jurassic Park is not even classed as really horror. So, So the top of the list is Leprechaun. Hocus Pocus, which is gets gets a lot of love. Um, it's a it's more of a children's movie, but <laughs> it's not horror. Um, it's kind of it. Leprechaun, the, da- the dark half, I guess you could count that. <laughs> so you say Leprechaun was the ruling film horror film of well, ninety three? Pu- Puppet Master Four. Do you want some of that? That was out this year. <laughs> I'm Maniac Cop Three, Maniac Cop Three, The Badge of Silence. It, it, it's gone joy, hasn't it? Amateurville 22 or whatever it is by now a new generation because oh, the last one was probably called Amateurville the end or something yeah. um, a movie that I do really like that came out this year is called The Good Son with Macaulay Culkin and um, Elijah Wood where they're little children and Macaulay Culkin's a little bit of a murderous child and Body Melt came out this year which is fucking weird um, Attack of the 50 Foot Woman with Daryl Hannah the remake Return of the Living Dead 3 Needful things, and I'm afraid, Gab, that is literally it. Oh, Adam's Family Values to the sequel. I've totally tuned out, to be honest. Yeah. So, like I said to you, um, if you're talking about what you want to watch from 1993, it's got to be Jurassic Park. Um, I'd probably also say Leprechaun if you want to crack a few beers open and have a bit of a laugh. Other than that, I can't really recommend anything else, to be honest. Okay, then. Well, Isn't that terrible? That's our worst year ever. Since we've done the time machine, that's our worst year. It's really interesting that we're doing this. I find it quite fascinating. Um, right, let's get out of 20, here. Twenty nine. Hang on, twenty nine horror films this year, and that was it. That's Some crazy. of those don't even really count. Um, we've got to talk about Get Out. I think we need to be. Let's get out. This is this is like a conversation, a big conversation we're about to go into. So let's get out of here. Can we get let's out get of not ninety three? Yeah, let's get out. Oh, I like what you're doing there. You got your toothbrush? Check. Do you have your deodorant? Check. Do you have your cozy clothes? Got that. What? Do they know I'm black? Should they? You might wanna, you know. Mom and Dad, my black boyfriend will be coming up this weekend. I just don't want you to be shocked that he's a black man. <laughs> I ain't never seen you like this before, bro. Meet family and Taking road trips, don't come back all bougie, man. Come back, get your damn pants up to your damn stomach. (laughs) (laughs) So you guys coming up from the city? Yeah, we're just heading up for the weekend. Can I see your license, please? He wasn't driving. I didn't ask who was driving, I asked to see his ID. Call me Dean and you're hungry, my man. So how long has this been going on, this this thing? (laughs) We hired Georgina and Walter to help care for my parents. When they died, I couldn't bear to let them go. Do you smoke in front of my daughter? I'm gonna quit. She'd take care of that for you. How? Hypnosis. I'm good, actually. Are you ready for this? I'm back in the beat. So look, I go do my research. Apparently, a whole bunch of brothers been missing in this suburb. But it's cool. Bro, how are you not scared of this, man? Couldn't see no brother around here. Chris was just telling me how he felt much more comfortable with my being here. Get out. Sorry, man. <laughs> Get out! Yo! <laughs> Bros, we gotta go. Is everything okay? Bros, the keys. Just get the keys. I don't know where they are. Rose. Sink into the floor. Wait, 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 wait. Sink. Mom. 
terrible thing to waste. Terrible thing to waste. If there's too many white people, I get nervous. <laughs> Get out to 2017. A young African American visits his white girlfriend's parents for the weekend, where his simmering uneasiness about the reception of him eventually reaches a boiling point. There we go. Thought, what a synopsis. I thought I was fuck that up. <laughs> As we've said, it's directed by Jordan Peele. Um, it's starring Daniel Kaluuya, who is actually British. Uh, he was in um, I think he was in an episode of. You are? He was oh yeah, he's in... What's that show called? Um, uh, not Extraordinary... Um, not uh, League of Gentlemen. Is it League of Gentlemen? Uh, no, no, it's... Um, it was... Um, oh, I forgot he was in that. Oh, what's he called? I, saw, I can see it, and I can't say it. It's called... Go on, go on, go on, go on. Psychoville. Yes, and he was in Skins. Uh, he was also in Black Panther... Uh, and he's been in a few big movies now, but um, it's all about his eyes, man. It's something about his eyes. And Jordan Peele, and I'll come on to the other cast in a minute, something I've noticed with us as well is that Jordan Peele is, does something with the eyes in his movies. Uh, the main actress in Us, she's got huge eyes, and they just convey so much. And the same with, with Daniel Kaluuya, and this who plays Chris, there's something in his eyes. Jordan Peele's very good director. I watched the, you know, the lady who's the grandmother in this, the, playing the maid. Georgina, yeah. I saw her in another film, and um, I was a bit like, oh, really underwhelmed. Um, I, I think he's got a, he's got <clears throat> amazing performances out for all of his characters. Apparently, Apparently, he would often direct whilst doing impressions of Obama, uh, Obama and a couple of other people that he does impressions of. Because Jordan Peele comes from the Key and Peele show, um, him and his comedy partner, and so some of the they're comedians are, and impressionists. Uh, hilarious. Have you ever seen the um, the school bully sketch? It's really good. I've seen pretty much everything they've done. I'm a huge Key and Peele fan. So you say the school bully. So why, um, why, why are you doing that to me, man? He says, "It's well, really, it's because." And the buddy uh, starts yeah. saying, "Why, really? Uh, it's because my dad says bad things to me. It makes me negative and puts me down. That's right. And I haven't got a good role model. It's <laughs> so cleverly done. They're very, very funny. So do um, check that that's, out. It translates well. Yeah, check out Kim Peel, guys. It's yeah, hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sketch show. Um, it's also starring Alison Williams, who plays um, Chris's girlfriend Rose. Um, she was in a, a show called Girls on HBO, which my wife is a huge fan of. And actually, I did watch along with her. It was, for the most part, quite a good show. And also, the only the real notable person in this is Bradley Whitford, who you will probably know from Cabin in the Woods. Adventures um, in Babysitting. Yeah, he was in um, Billy Madison with Happy Gilmore, uh, with um, Happy Gilmore, <laughs> with Adam Sandler. Uh, and he plays the dad in this Um so yes, it's a great movie. Uh, it's won an Oscar, and for off the off the bat, we're going to be spoiling this. So if you haven't seen this, because I went into this movie the first time I saw it, I didn't know anything about it, uh, other than it was about a black guy going to visit his white girlfriend's family. I didn't know it was a even a horror or a science fiction movie, whatever you want to call it. I just assumed it was going to be like a bit of a social commentary movie. <clears throat> um, so I was quite privileged to. <laughs> It's a Blum house. That I say yeah, that. Yeah, the, Blum, the Blum house does give it away a little bit. It's possibly going to lean in towards the horror. Mm. Um, this is funny. This is a funny thing with Blum house because Blum house seems to be nowadays. It does seem to be almost a bit of quantity over quality. It seems to just be churn out, churn out, churn out. Like 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 old school. You know, I know that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. You yeah. can do that. That's, it's just a shame because once you saw the Blumhouse name for film, after watching, say, films like this, you think, oh my God, the quality is going to be amazing. This movie's going to be incredible. And then you're just so let down because it's not. Yeah. It's such a shame because it's a shame they went that route. But Well, luckily, this movie is far from that. And like I was just saying, we are going to be spoiling this from the very start really because there's so many links from the beginning to the end and all throughout this movie in ties plus lots and lots of commentary on black representation racism so we're going to just like go into this and just <clears throat> as we break it down we're going to touch on everything really right from the very first scene really you like touching on things don't you 
I do like touching on things. So the very first scene um, is a, a black fellow called Andre walking down the street. Now, this is the guy that we will meet, meet again later on who's got a new name, yeah, Logan. We, we don't know that. It's the first we time viewed in this. When you, when you come across the, this character later on, you, you don't see it at all. He's, um, Jordan says even in the commentary how... We're on first name terms here. That's what I'm saying, just Jordan. <laughs> Jordan, you and George. Uh, oh, Jordy, Jordy says, um, <laughs> he says it's uh, absolutely fine to uh, uh, no, he says it's um, he was really amazing the way he could just uh, sort of do that, and it shows the range people can have. And the guy was kind of in the shadows anyway, um, and he had a bit of a goatee. Whereas when you meet him later on, he's wearing, wearing very different clothes and acting very differently. But yeah, this this guy's on the phone to we assume his girlfriend maybe, and he's sort of saying, you know, I'm in this white neighborhood, I'm a bit lost, I don't really know, I'm sticking out like a sore thumb here. And this car, this white, shall we say, it's a white car, pulls up slowly behind him and it's playing Run Rabbit, Run Rabbit. Out of the, it's, uh... it's so good to have this. And it's so, um, uh, yeah, the, the car's supposed to sort of represent uh, Jaw, Christine, Jaws, that sort of thing. Mm. And uh, okay. it's so good to uh, uh, just have this have this music playing you're just like oh shit you're like oh man get out get the fuck out of there you know this is not good and he knows it's not good he's just like right okay puts his phone in his pocket does a quick turn goes to another room he says to himself out loud which is something that is very clever which a lot of people watching horror movies always say which is not today i'm going back the other way and i'm this is not going to happen to me he's seen enough horror movies to know the black guy's going to die in this also, horror movie. Do you know what I mean? Well, also, straight away, this shows what sort of film this is. And this film is trying to go with, no, we're not taking a piss. We're going quite seriously. Because you didn't know when you started watching this movie what this film was going to be. You could have thought it could have been comedy. You, had, it plays, you didn't know because it's coming from a comedy director. So this it, way, straight away, shows you what's going on in this film. It keeps its cards close to its chest for quite a lot of the first third of the movie going into the middle. And also, it, 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 for the first time you see it, it's going to trick you because you're going to believe certain characters are the way that they are portrayed until this midway point. Um, so this guy, as you say, he turns around. His name's Andre. He turns around and he, then he sees the car. There's no one in the car. The door's open. And suddenly a man with like a knight's helmet grabs him, puts him in a jujitsu slash choke hold that's so good and puts him in the trunk of his car do, do you know um the helmet is, is um because the, the whole the whole armitage thing eventually they originally sort of came from knight's templar mm -hmm. yeah that's, there are that's lots of layers so, yeah it's so weird it's like well, what the jordan fuck? peele the, the reason this movie is so layered is because he wrote this for himself he didn't ever think he would make it into a movie and he ended up doing he estimates over 200 rewrites of this screenplay you're joking and he ended up realizing that when they said they were going to make it and they made it into a movie he's now says i have for me, I'm I perfected the art of screenwriting because if I can write a movie that that was going to get made, this was just something I wrote for myself. Uh, you know, uh, almost as a bit of a piss take, just to practice his writing. Got made into a movie, won an Oscar, so now he's so confident in his writing. So it's been fantastic for him. Um, yeah, so many layers to this, and like you say, the Knights Templar and all that kind of stuff, and it all comes back in. It's all layered. The more you watch this movie, the more you realise how clever the screenwriting is no wonder it won an oscar mm. and um, he, he's he's knocked out put into the car and that's it cut of woman and then we get a lovely folk song with a nice it is like a nice funky... shot going along the uh it's like it's got like it's got like african chanting mixed in with like folk horror it's like a re really interesting score yeah it feels like african folk horror, yeah you know there we go african folk horror um it's, it's almost like that, Gav, actually. This is almost like a bit of a folky, because it's out in the country with a, a strange family and it, it, fish out I, of water. I, I, would, I would argue with someone that this is a folk horror film, I think. Yeah, I would, I would say you could definitely argue that. It's like well, you say, mean, it's going out into the country, it's, it's someone being taken and they're, they're going to be sacrificed. It is kind of like that. It, it, that's, for, that's the elements of folk horror. We meet Chris and we meet Rose. Uh, so Chris is our main hero, certainly. Um, he is... Well, Daniel Kaluuya pay, plays this character so well. He's a genuine guy. He's trying to quit smoking. He's a normal guy. He's a photographer. Well, he's got this white girlfriend. He's we, just such a normal guy. 
when we cut to this scene I love it after that folk song we go into the uh, Childish Gambino song and it's kind of that kind of laid back kind of R&B stroke hip hop track mm-hmm. and you got yeah. black and white photographs of street stuff like uh, yeah. uh, people fighting in the street dogs barking or whatever and then it cuts to him and it, and it again was straight away finding who this character is straight away like that he's a creative photographer who's taking these quite stunning photos so he's probably doing quite well for himself and it's it's, it's like you say this writing's a ma- I think as we go through this I'm just going to be more and more blown away by the writing from this film and everything in this movie means something even to the point the first time we see Chris he's shaving and he's putting white shaving foam over his black face which is kind of a little bit of a giveaway as to what we're looking at later like, Jordan Peele's put all these things in here well late, later on when you've got um, uh, Rose, when she's later on sitting on a bed, all in white, uh, no, drinking white milk with a black straw, mm-hmm. it's just stuff like that, you know. So, him and Rose, they're in this relationship, and we establish that they've been together for about four or five months. She is taking him to visit her parents. And See, it could be a comedy now. <clears throat> it could be. It could be Meet the Fockers. <laughs> <laughs> um. Robert De Niro sat there like, do oh. I have nipples, Chris? Oh, you, you. Could you milk me, Chris? I got my eyes on you. <laughs> he has this awkward moment, which I, I guess is very, it's something that mixed couple, mixed relate, uh, race couples would have to have at some point, maybe. Have you told your parents I'm black? It's... And you think, wow, that is something that people have to say sometimes in their relationships, you know? And, and well, she says, no, I haven't told them. Yeah, uh, well, Why he, would I? he 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 asked her that because oh, <clears throat> she's a little bit. Well, what's the problem? And his intimidation of the weekend of meeting them is just like, yeah, but I'm black, and it's such a shame that someone should have to feel there could be an issue with just them being them. Well, even though that's quite an intense question, it's still there's elements of comedy around this because she says, "Look, my parents aren't racist. Dad's not going to greet you with a shotgun on the." You know, on the lawn, and he, if he, he says, she says, if he could have voted for Obama for a third yeah, uh, yeah. time, he would have done. And I'm sure he's going to tell you that. Don't worry, it's going to be so awkward when he tries to tell you that. Well, well <clears throat> that was the thing. Like, uh, uh, you'd you'd get a, a black person chatting to a white person in a social party, and the, the white person trying to the best to go. Oh, I'm not. I'm not racist. Um, uh, I would vote for Obama again. It's that. Yeah. It's that. Yeah. It's, totally, it, this, it's funny. It's just incredibly well written. Um, obviously, you, you because it's written by this. a black guy, we so you get that black perspective. Later on at the party scene, when he's been introduced to all these people, I know Tiger Woods. It's like, oh, God. fuck off, you cunt. <laughs> well, we find out a bit more about them. Chris smokes, and he's trying to quit. Um, while they're driving to visit her parents, who live out in this huge house in the country, he speaks to his buddy Rod. I love Rod. Rod is so <laughs> fucking hilarious. Sex slaves. <laughs> Sex slaves. <laughs> Rod is airport security. Rod has seen all the horror movies. He knows not to trust certain situations. And he says to him, why the fuck are you going out to the middle of nowhere to visit a white family? Come on, man. They're going to turn you into a sex slave. Come on, man. Don't do it. And he's just winding him up, really. But also, he's kind of concerned for his mate as well. Yeah, and also, he's on to it. He's not on the right path, but he's on the path of like yeah. don't go there he's literally saying like this isn't going to end right and it's it's a shame that he, he calls it and it's it happens it's he's airport security and he he's like he, he sees himself as some kind of like detective cop I don't know he's cool he's very funny he's, I love him. he's hilarious you know the bit later on he says about the Jeffrey Dahmer stuff he freestyled <laughs> that Man, the kids coming over there, they just want a bit of dick sucking, maybe a bit of bar jiggling, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like... he freestyled that. <laughs> then he says, and then he cut their heads off. It's a whole decapitated head blowjob thing, man. It's not me, it's Jeffrey Dahmer's business. It's nothing to do with me, come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Oh, I didn't know he uh, he just did that off the top. Yeah. I, 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 I'm pretty sure he did. <clears throat> I'm sorry if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure he did. 
Um, so they they hit a deer. They're distracted slightly, and a deer runs out, and, and uh, they hit a deer. Now this this falls into a couple of things. Um, be, be f- just very quickly before, just a quick thing. Nick got sneak in there. Uh, he goes to smoke a cigarette, and she uh, says to him, "Listen, words. Well, I thought you were going to quit. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah." And he throws it out the window. There you go. Uh, she throws, takes it off, and throws it out the window. And that's yeah, a, he's, that's a dog he's he's thrown away. He wants to smoke. We just need to chuck that in there because that's obviously going to aid the story along of where he gets to in a certain seated position later on. He um he certainly he wants to quit you know he does want to quit smoking um she yeah so they hit a deer and this this deer isn't dead uh, in fact we hear it sort of making little whimpering sounds from the woods so they pull over Chris goes off and he, he finds it in the woods uh, and he's now this gives him a little bit of and we don't know this at this point this is only because I've seen the movie a bunch of times but this reminds him of what his must have happened to his mum because his mum was killed we find out later on in a hit and run and she was left in the side of the road and not found for hours and she died eventually of her injuries and bleeding um, so yeah. that reminds me of that but also he's a deer in the headlights later on in this movie as well so so many layers to this fucking movie it's ridiculous and I love it well he um, he, he, he later on when uh, look we're going to spoil this movie we have to go back and forth with this later on when the, uh, Rose is lying in the road he's driving away he's driving away from someone dying in the road he's getting his uh, uh, not revenge on that he's getting his um, closure it's like closure yeah um, they call the cops, or Rose <laughs> Rose calls the cops, because um, they don't know what to do. They've hit this deer. Their car's got a little bit of damage on it. So the cop arrives. It's a white cop, and that comes into it a little bit more in a second. And he sort of says, look, next time you need to call animal control, not the police. But you're okay as long as you guys are all right. You've got a bit of damage on your car. And then he says, he looks over at Chris, and he says, hey, can I see your, uh, your, registra- your license of registration? And Rose is like, why do you want to see his? He wasn't driving. And he's like, look, I've got every right. She's like, you don't have every right. You've got no right to ask him for it. It's me who was driving. You've seen mine. Why do you need his? You don't. And she's in really defensive of her boyfriend. And, uh, this cop seems a bit racist. And this works in two ways, which is really cool because, well, not really cool, which is really good for Rose, really. One way, she, she doesn't want the cop to see his identity because she knows what's going to happen to him. She's, yeah. she's keeping that from him. The other way <clears throat> Otherwise, is... There'd be a record of Chris being there. The other, so. the other thing is, this is the second time now she's proven to the audience her uh, allegiance for yep. Chris. Uh, the first time saying, my parents are, my parents are going to be fine with you. No worries. This is her saying, why are you doing that? Just because he's black, well, that's you being a racist cop. And it's interesting that in this, because... Um, you know, uh, he the cop's not involved in it. Him. When I first started watching this, first of all, I thought the deer was thrown into the road on purpose. Then I thought the cop was involved. I thought, oh, is all the town involved? What's going on? Do you know what I mean? It's that sort of movie. Because later on, it's a lot of people involved. The movie really tricks you um, by layering so many little things throughout. Because it's fantastic. That group of people look like, because apparently they they come from a long line of antique uh, sort of people who swap antique collectors. That's, that's the family lo- line comes from okay and um surely the, the, you'd think that the uh, uh this massive group of people the money they wealth they have they would buy off the police department as well do you know what i mean i mean yeah they're, they're obviously extremely rich because we arrive at their house and it's absolutely huge gorgeous old house out in the middle of nowhere a lot of money a lot of old money and the first person that they see as they pull up is a black gardener um, a groundsman called Walter. And she's like, oh, that's Walter, the groundsman. And he sort of gives them a bit of a funny look. And Chris thinks, oh, okay. Doesn't think much else, really. He just thinks, oh, okay. And they pull up and we meet Rose's parents. Um, and it's pretty awkward because her dad's like, hey, my man. How you doing, my man? But, yeah, but at this moment <laughs> in time, uh, uh, this is, it just comes across as the white dude who lives in the town with no black people and he doesn't know how to do it and he's trying to be the best he can he doesn't come across as a bad person they come he comes across really nice the dad initially doesn't he even though he's like come on you've got to come do a tour of the house i hate that when people say come do a tour of my house why the fuck do i want to say how much just money tell me you've where made? the toilet is that's it, all i need to know it's literally why do i want to know how much money you've made show me i've had this before people say come do a tour of my house like oh well, he gives this. This is a great opportunity now for him to try and show Chris that he doesn't mind that his daughter is going out with a black guy. So he wanders around the house and he shows him the house and he shows him. I pick these up and I do a lot of traveling and I buy a lot of antiques and I've been to a lot of places. I really love 
other cultures and i think it's important that we embrace other cultures and it's chris is just like for fuck's sake i get it i get what you're trying to do you're trying to be nice then, but then it's brings, coming out a bit then he brings up obama and he would have voted for him yeah exactly exactly as um rose said he would for a third, uh, I would term. Have voted a third time i'd vote him for a third term oh bless him um and, and another then... fact that the bait that goes by the basement uh oh yeah can't go down there. there's black mold down there mm. it's, it's, it's all boarded up it's it's, it's it's that thing for I find this nowadays when I when before I say it's like it's, you know you can't say certain things so bef- but I know that I can say the word black like I've bought some paint recently I had to buy black paint but I always think before I say it because I'm like I, I because I just try to be uh, correct for it, people I don't want to offend anybody by accidentally saying something it's just you know it's one of those things you kind of do and um uh, where am I getting with this? Yeah, the fact that he goes black mold it's straight away. I was just straight away. Why does he have to say that? And it, it, it and in this movie context, he he says the word black, and it's as soon as you hear that, it's just like a, almost a trigger point for this movie. It's like, why is he saying that? Is he actually racist? You don't know where. He well, the is. first one, one of the first things he says is, they say, "Oh, we hit a deer," <clears throat> and he says, "Well, I, I think there's too many of them around, and I every time one of them gets killed, I'm always pleased because, to be honest with you." There's too many of them. And the way he's talking about deer is almost like he could be talking about a particular <clears throat> group of people. Do you know I, what I mean? I, I did catch up. Do you think you've thought that because you're looking at this as in like they are? So you saw that more than it is? Because I hadn't, it's just I hadn't a even very, seen that. I hadn't even thought of that theory or anything. It's just a very weird thing for him to bring, for the dad to bring up. As they get towards the kitchen, he says, um, my mum loved... Uh, loved being in the kitchen um we always keep a piece of mum here um she was a great cook and as they get there we meet georgina now that is i won't say it now but um i mean that's that's his mum basically in a, in a black woman's body uh that that shot by the way is supposed to be um like when the twins are revealed in the shining or when hannibal's first seen in science of the lambs that when you first as you kind of side scrolling yeah. yeah, that's what that's supposed to be. Because he's basically taking so many of his favourite things from horror movies and put it in, you know. And he says, he, so this is the second person now that works for them. So that she looks like she's a cook and she's black. And now Chris is thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is where he's just like, hang on a minute. Yeah, hold up. And then, uh, but he addresses it. The dad addresses. Yeah, I know what you're think- thinking. He says, I know how it looks. I hate how it looks, but let me explain. They used to care for my parents when my parents were old. My parents passed away, and we wanted them to carry on working for us. We didn't want to just kick them out. So Walter's the groundsman. He does all the gardening. He does all the prepare work. And Georgina is our cleaner, and she's our cook. But I know how it must look to you. And he went, yeah. I would. And Chris says, you know, I appreciate you saying that because it, does, it doesn't look great. But actually, I trust you a bit more now. You've, you've, you've brought it up. And, you, you know, and again, we're being tricked a little bit here. Um. He's been listening to the full sense of security. They sit down outside and have a nice drink. Um, we find out that he's a doctor and Rose's mum is a therapist, and that'll come back into it later on. And they sit and they're having a drink, well, and they say... Well, she says, what are you going to say, like, can help you with the smoking? Well, first of all, they say, um, oh, it's so great that you're here for this weekend with a big party. And Rose is like, what do you mean big party? And, oh, not grandpa's party. And they're like, yeah. So basically, we had a massive party for Rose's grandparents. And even though they've passed away, we still have this huge party in memory of them and all of their friends come along. And it's just people from the area, business associates. You people think that you'd be like, you, you would have known this. Could you have told me this? I'd have brought my right pair of party pants or whatever, you know. She's like, oh, God, I'm so sorry, Chris. It's going to be so awkward. And he's like, oh, God, all right, whatever. And then they then they notice that Chris is sort of picking his nails and his hands are a little bit twitchy. And the dad, being a doctor and being down that sort of, that's his sort of job to know these things. He looks at him and he says, you smoke, don't you, Chris? And Chris is like, uh, what? And he's like, I can tell that you smoke and you, you're trying to quit because your hands are shaking there. Uh, and he says, my wife can help you with that, can't you? His wife's called Missy. <laughs> And he says, Missy can help you with that. Because I used to smoke. Don't get me wrong, I used to smoke years ago. But um, one session with her, I can't even look at a cigarette without feeling sick. And Chris is like, "Mm, I'll do it my own way. Thank you, though. But I don't really want to do any hypnosis or anything like that. It's all a bit new age for me. I think I'll just quit my own way. So that's kind of nice little just left there, isn't there? A little 
thread, as it were. I love uh, Brother Jeremy turns up. Oh, fucking Jeremy. Uh, Caleb. Um, uh, that, that's actually, sorry, Caleb's actually real name. Funny enough, I was watching a movie the other night and I was, so this character came on and I was like, that's the dude from, because he's in... Um, He's in that movie which I couldn't remember the name of, which I can't remember the name of again. Brilliant. Oh, the, That's the, really, really good information. I'll tell you what it is. The Last Exorcism. There you go. He's in that, is he? Yeah, uh, that's the movie I couldn't remember before. I was trying to say to you, yeah, um, no, um, I was watching. I, I saw him in a movie the other night, and I was like, "That's him," and he's a little bit chubby and stuff. And it's No Country for Old Men. He's right. At the, have you seen No Country for Old Men? Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Right at the end, when um, the, the baddie's been uh, in the car accident. Oh yeah, is and that he, him in that? Is it? He's given some money to the kids. He, the kid is yeah. That's it. That's all he is. He's just a kid there, and that's it. But yeah, um, I really like this actor. His brother turns up. I'm um, sorry, Jeremy. But Jeremy turns up, and he is a little bit unhinged, a little bit, you know, he's a cheeky brother initially. Um, he sort of they sit around the table, and it seems so normal, you know. He's sort of saying to to Chris, "Oh, she used to bite her toenails when she was younger. Did she tell you that?" And he's sort of revealing these things. A proper brother and sister, and Chris feels a bit more comfortable now. He's having dinner with the family, um, and it all seems a little bit normal until they start asking about. Jeremy starts asking Chris about sport, and he says, uh, no, you must no, play no. sport. No, no, you're missing stuff here. Right, they're all sitting together. It's absolutely fine until the mum leaves the dining room table and goes to the kitchen. Now, the mum represents the person that keeps control of the family. And each one of those members of the family are actors playing in. The kids were groomed when they were younger into doing, mm-hmm. the, doing the roles that they have to do. She has to go out. Rose has to go out and get the men and bring them back. Then Caleb, um, fucking, what's he called? It's not Caleb. What's Jeremy. It? Jeremy. He has to actually um, uh, do what he does, but he's the only one that doesn't have a fake side. So as soon as mum walks out, he's straight away like, I'm going to play with him. He's a bit like a cat and a mouse. Yeah. He says to him... Um... He says to Chris, do you play sport? Do you play basketball? Like, assuming because he's black, he plays basketball. And he's like, well, I play a few sports, but I'm not really that sporty, really. And Jeremy's like, do you like MMA? And he's like, what do you mean, like UFC, cage fighting? He's like, yeah, yeah. Because with, and then he says this really weird thing. He says, because I'm thinking with your genetic makeup and your DNA, you could, and you were, if you worked out properly, you could be a beast. And he's basically implying that because he's black, he's much more athletic and could be a good like fighter or a cage fighter. And it's like, yeah. this is Chris's first real uncomfortable moment there. He's like... <clears throat> and the dad's, okay. the dad's just sitting there smiling away. And then Jeremy stands up really quickly and says, come here, stand up. And he goes over and he starts putting his arms all over Chris and says, let me show you some moves because I do jujitsu. And... Really good line here, which I must say more often, really, if I'm at parties and drunk and fools find out that I'm, I do kickboxing and stuff, because people will quite often go, come here then. And Chris says to him, I've got a rule. I don't play fight when I'm drinking. And that's a brilliant rule. And Jeremy's like, come on, come on, come on. And then mum comes back in, like you say, Gab, and she puts order back in the room and everyone sits back down. But that was quite a tense moment because it looked like at one point that Jeremy was going to start wrestling Chris. Yeah. and testing its strength very strange so we, get, uh, so we get back to their bedroom and uh, Rose again shows her allegiance to him by bringing up how racist her family is she's like oh I can't believe dad brought that up why was he calling you my man and at one point <laughs> her dad says so how long has this been a thang and she's like why did dad say thang what going down why is he saying things like what's going down my man he's never talked like this oh it's so embarrassing Chris I'm so sorry and you're right we do think Wow, she really is like annoyed at her family here. She must be, must be a goodie. Well, Chris wakes up in the middle of the night. Can't sleep. Des- desperate for a fag, isn't he? he Absolutely wants- desperate for a cigarette. He wants a, he wants a fag. So he thinks, well, fuck this. I'll go outside and have one. Goes outside, having a little cigarette. Suddenly, Walter comes sprinting at him full blast how weird would that be if you go outside you're a bit a bit like oh you have a you've had a few glasses go, of wine then you just look a bit like is that the gardener why, why is he running at me why, full blast why is he running at me really really fast one thing we probably should mention is um when he was getting a tour uh 
Dean, the dad, said, my dad was a runner and he raised, raced against the, I can't remember the black guy's name now, the guy that raced in front of Hitler. But he lost. And he lost. He said, but don't worry, my dad, my dad got over it. No, he, my dad never quite got over it. And that's well, that, him using his new portal, body. his, his, his yeah, body. His body to run around. It's very clever. Yeah. Uh, yes, Chris. It's a really nice way of doing a scare without it being a jump scare like in the Candyman. And this is still keeping us on edge because it, we can see it coming. It's just weird. It's getting weirder, isn't it? Well, Chris heads inside after this weird moment with Walter running out past him. And he, for some reason, Missy, the mum, is still awake. And she she says, what are you doing up? Come here. Come and sit down. And he's like, oh, I don't really want to. She's like, come and sit down. And she says to him, like, why do you smoke? And he's like, oh, I don't know. It's just a habit. She's like, you smoke in front of my little girl. Come on. Now, really, what she's saying is you shouldn't smoke. Cause we really want you to be really, really healthy. We want your body to be super healthy when we do this thing later. But she's making out like she doesn't want him to smoke in front of her daughter. Da, da, da. And she says, you should really try the hypnosis. He's like, I really don't want to. And this is where she pulls out the silver spoon. You see what they did there? Silver spoon. Born with a silver spoon. Yeah, of course. Very good. Does, does this mean eventually, once they everybody's got too old and they've changed them all you, you're going to have some of the normal young people it's just going to be loads of strange talking black folk <laughs> yeah just loads of black kids or black people living in this mansion but they all talk like old white people yeah that would be just so like the whole village though it's not just the people in the mansion is it yeah, it's strange, isn't it? It's really weird because that, that, that dude's going to be in, the guy who gets it wins the bingo game later on. He he's an art dealer, so he's just going to go back to the city and be the art dealer in his new body. Yeah. So eventually yeah, they're guess. they're going outside of where their little compound is doing this thing. They're going to start going worldwide. How big does maybe, this operation maybe, go? Maybe it goes huge. This could be going on in different countries. She she makes so the mum now while they're doing this like chat about hypnosis she really delves into Chris's mum because they found out his mum died and his dad was never in the picture and she says tell me about the night your mum died and he's like I don't really want to and then suddenly she does a little ding ding on the cup with her spoon and he suddenly starts telling her the whole story he says she says was it raining and he's like yeah it was raining that night she says listen can you hear the rain and then he starts imagining himself he hears the rain this was supposed uh, to be Hannibal and the Clarice scene from Silence okay. of the Lambs Jordan Peele's such a horror nerd isn't he yeah he's a proper nerd <laughs> <laughs> um, he's Spielberg she, of the fucking horror world I tell you she then says to him can you move and he says no I, I can't move and he's he sort of, he's got, this is what I was saying about the eyes earlier. Daniel Kaluuya's eyes are huge and he's got tears streaming down his cheeks. And she says, okay, now I want you to sink into the floor. And he's like, what? No, what? Sink. And then he just goes into the sunken place. So good. Um, this in the cinema. Did you see this in the cinema? I didn't see this in the cinema. I'm sorry. This in the cinema was incredible when it went into that talk, 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 and goes into there. Then there's that music score comes in. Dum, yeah, dum. it's like that inception sort of noise. And he's seeing a cinema screen going fading away from him, which is actual his head and his eyes. And he's going to his sunken place, this place where he has no control. And you are with him 100%, and you feel like you have no control. What a horrible place to be. Yeah, he's and he's paralysed like in his body, but this is what he's seeing. Oh, it's crazy. He wakes up, though, in the morning in the bed. And he's like, oh, fucking hell, that was a weird dream, man. So he decides to go out and get some air with his camera and take some photos. Um, he goes over to speak to Walter. And Walter talks, like a, funnily enough, like an old white man. And he says, oh, how, how, nice to meet you, Walter. How are you? And he's chopping wood. And he says, um, she is a special girl, isn't she, Rose? She's a one in a million. Top shelf. Top of the line. <laughs> no. And he's like, what? That's a bit weird. And one thing to notice is that Walter and Georgina are both wearing, well, we find out Georgina's wearing a wig and Walter always wears a hat. And that's because they've got little scars on their heads, which we'll find a bit more out later on. Um, so what's Roderick and the art dealer's going to have on it over his skull? 
It's some sort of party beret. hat, wouldn't it? Yeah, like a beret or something. Oh, but it's a beret. A fez. Ooh. Imagine Chris wearing Trisha. a fez. Trisha. Saying, talking like that old white guy, but it's Chris. Best, can you do your best Tommy Cooper? What's that? One of them. Go over there. What's that? Just like that. Oh. Just like that. I don't know. Really. Just like that. So the worst thing, if you don't know who Tommy Cooper is, is a British stand-up comedian, um, and he and died. Magician as well. A magician. He died live on stage, and you can see him die on stage on YouTube. It's the weirdest thing ever. He just stops performing and dies, and it's and like he sort of what the thing. fuck? And they yeah. kind of put him off screen under the curtain. Weird as fuck. How have we got from Get Out to Tommy Cooper? That is mental, isn't it? Tommy Cooper. Our tangents are getting so bad. It's um, brilliant. Before before he sees takes the photos of Gardner, um, we do need to point out a very quick bridge where his phone wasn't on charge again. He ch- oh, yeah. He woke up and his phone's almost dead. It's like for fuck's sake. It's he like trying to charge up his phone. It's like someone's trying to stop the. You know, you have to address phones. One of those things. Uh, he speaks to um, Rose and says, "I had a chat with Walter earlier. What's going on with him?" She's like, "What do you mean? He's been like he worked with my family for years, and and he's like." Mm. He kind of made some weird comments, like, does he fancy you or is he jealous that you're with me? And she's like, I'll go and speak to my dad about this right now. And he's like, no, 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 no. You don't need to speak to your dad. It's fine. Uh, it's just a really weird conversation I had with him. Anyway, suddenly all of these black limousines arrive. And, oh, oh, yeah, lots of black cars. Yeah, and they're full of uh, predominantly white people um, getting out who look very rich it and very like a old. It's funeral, though, doesn't it? It is. Um, <clears throat> these are the people who were friends with her grandparents. And Chris is paraded around now. Um, everyone's acting very strangely with him. It's such a pleasure to meet you, Chris. P- parade is a good word. Chris, you, I've heard so much about you. It's lovely to meet you. And then they start saying weirder things like, uh, like you said, that old guy's like, do you play golf? And he looks at him and he's, it's because the guy's thinking, I could I could be in your body, actually, and I play golf. And he's, then he says, I know Tiger Woods. And you're like, for fuck's and, sake. And obviously, because you're black, you're going to be as good as Tiger Woods. That's what you're saying, isn't and, it? And then a man who has got breathing apparatus, his wife says to Chris, that he, well, she says to Rose, is it true what they say about uh, black guys? Is it better? Is it better with one? And they're like, what? And he's... At this point, he's like, I've got to go now. I've got to get some air. This the is getting guy, black is in fashion. Yeah, he says, uh, black the is in... He says the, turned. He said, the pendulum has swung. It used to be all pale skin and pale faces, and now black is very much in fashion. And Chris is just like, these guys are straight up racist. There's like some fucking weird shit here. He wanders off, and this is where he comes across the um, the blind guy. Uh, actually, you know, before he does that, we, he meets the guy in the hat... He sees another brother. That's what he says. Yeah, he it's comes like, up oh, and he says, "He says, oh, I'm so relieved to find see another brother here." And he turns around and he says, "Hello, how are you?" And he's speaking like this really old white guy, and it's the guy from the beginning scene, um, but just wearing very weird clothes. Yeah, who's married to a woman thirty, a white woman thirty years older than him? Doesn't recognise Chris or doesn't act like Chris thinks he should act. In fact, Chris goes to fist bump him at one point. And he, and he shakes does, his fist bump. He just shakes his fist, that awkward fist bump. I, I, so... I, I did that uh, many, many moons ago. I was a little bit stoned. And uh, I was in a, I was in a, I was in dance too. Jazz T was in there. He's, he's, he's quite a well-known DJ, and he he, he gave me a, went to give me a fist bump, and I just wrapped my hand around his fist and shook it. Oh, and god. I just looked at him and just turned around, and walked out, going, "Oh my god!" Well, Chris turns around to himself and says, "What the fuck?" Because that was a pretty weird conversation that he's had with this Logan character. <clears throat> and he goes off to get some peace and quiet and he bumps into a, an art dealer who's blind and the art dealer has heard of Chris because Chris is starting to become quite famous with his photos um, and he says so how, how, how are you an art dealer if you're blind and he's like well I have an assistant that basically ex- describes everything to me in detail and I hear from what I hear your pictures are incredible you're a real talent um, and don't worry about those guys over there they don't mean any harm they're just trying to sort of relate to you it's and quite you think, nice. This yeah. guy's nice. He, he's like, you know, when when I have that comfort blanket when the police are called and all that sort of stuff. He's he's that sort of thing. Um, I like it. Have you seen Office Space? Yeah, I love it. Yeah, he's he, in that. He's yeah, looking yeah. for a stapler, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. On another tangent, did you know? Speaking of Office Space, that's Mike Judd. Did you know Beavers and Butterheads coming back for two more seasons? I did hear that. Yeah. How cool is that? 
Well, it worked though, because it was a very, very much a thing of the nineties. Yeah, but I think they're doing it with, especially what's going on. I think Mike Judd's like, what's going on right now? We need Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> we need Beavis and Butthead. Yeah, for president. I've got to be honest. I fucking love the Beavis and Butthead do America movie. It's, it's incredible. It's so good. Oh, we should cover that. I don't know if we can do that. I don't know if we can even. <laughs> Beavis and Butthead do America and South Park bigger, longer and uncut. Oh, wow. A very God. random episode that we do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Chris goes back up inside and this is the scene that everybody talks about when this when they talk about this film. Do you want to describe it, Gav? What 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 scene is this, sorry? <laughs> Chris goes <laughs> inside and starts going up the stairs. Oh yeah, it, it's the classic uh, in the, the slaughtered lamb. You walk in the slaughtered lamb, and everyone shuts up. It's literally he goes upstairs, and somehow even the people who aren't even looking at him up the stairs know that he's just gone at the right point, and they all go, and they all go quiet, and they look upstairs as he's walking up. Then it's just like that is just this is uh, this is confirmation now for the audience watching this film that th- that this is fucked. And the he, situation is fucked. And then he gets upstairs and his phone's not charging and it's dead. This is just getting from worse to worse. He tells Rose, um, you know, my fucking phone's been unplugged again. He manages to ring Rod um, on the little bit of battery he's got. And Sex he, slaves! He, he talks about the wind and this is where Rod's... He says, I think her mum hypnotised me. And he's like, oh man, come on. White people, sex slaves, man. They're going to turn you into sex slaves. You know what white people are like. And he's like, oh, for God's sake, Rod, you're just winding me up. I've got to go now. And he's like, no, no, I'm just connecting the dots, Chris. I'm connecting the dots. You're putting the dots out and I'm connecting them up. He's just talking, talking, talking. It's so funny. Um, and then after he's finished speaking to Rod, Georgie, George, um, Georgina walks in the room and she apologises in a very strange manner for unplugging his phone. No, 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 no. What was that later on? She no, this is now, and she she doesn't get any modern lingo. Chris says, "Look, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to snitch on you." She says, she says "Snitch." Tattletale. You mean tattletale? And she talks like an old white woman, which she is. You know, we find out later on that she is. With with that hairstyle and stuff like that, she just comes across perfect doing this. But then she. This actress now, with this scene where she starts crying and laughing at the same time, that is just. That's what I'm adds saying. To the the, the, the performance part. that Jordan Peele got from these characters, everybody is fucking top notch. Would you agree? Yeah, uh, hundred percent. Everybody's everybody, on their A game. Everybody in this, in this like the party goes, every person in this, even the fucking deer that got ran over at the beginning. Dear me. Oh dear! The Jap- <laughs> they walk outside, and there is one guy there that isn't white, and there's a Japanese guy there, and he says, <laughs> "He says, excuse me, would you say as an African American, it's been an advantage or a disadvantage wow. being in America?" Wow. And, and, and everyone's just like, and "Oh yes, a- do, do tell us, Chris." And he, he's like, "He's a he's a karate master, that guy." Just for yeah, I heard that. Yeah, I heard he was a karate master. He was not really an actor. Well, Chris basically is so awkward here that he spots the guy, the black guy from earlier with the hat. So he's like, hey, he says, hey, can you take this? And he says, well, uh, I don't think I find it. I could say either way, whether it's been an advantage or a disadvantage. But then I haven't been out of the house much for the last few months. And they kind of w- he winks at his old woman wife and they sort of go, oh, yes. <laughs> so they've obviously just been banging away in the house for the last few months. Oh, God. But while he's telling this story, Chris thinks. Six I'm take a pic- <laughs> well, while he's telling the story, Chris sneaks his phone and he t- takes a little snapshot of Lucas. But then the flash goes off. And that does something to Lucas. It breaks him. And his nose starts bleeding, and he runs up to him, and the real guy, the actual guy from the beginning, not the white guy running this body, runs up to Chris and says, get out, get out, get out, get out, get out, get out. Peter Griffin would be really happy right now, if in Family Guy. He loves it when they say the movie titles in the movie. (laughs) He does love that shit, doesn't he? Yeah. (laughs) I always say that to Alice whenever they say it. Every time it comes up, I'm like, oh, Peter Griffin would like that. Or sometimes I go, yeah, they did it. <laughs> it's not often they do, though, is it? Oh, no, you'd be surprised. Get out. They say Candyman and Candyman like five times every time they looked in a mirror. Yeah. There we go. So, yeah, that's pretty fucking freaky because it's like his old self is coming out and telling Chris to get out. And we cut, cut to them sitting around the sofa and being told 
by Bradley Whitford what what happened and the, the it's fact that anxiety. Oh, yeah, and the, the thing is, though, that flash when your flash went off, so then he comes in and says, "I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to apologise. I uh, I seem to have made a fool of myself." Uh, I'm says, gonna... You'll have to, you'll have to continue the party without my sense of humour and good wit. Yeah. I should get along and go and have a rest now. And and something that um, Bradley Whitfield and his wife say to a lot of the black people in this is, yes, you need to go and have a lie down and have a rest. So it's almost like they, they're wearing themselves out running these new bodies. And they say to him, go and have a rest. And this is where and now... They, they say that to the grandmother later. This is where now Chris... I think Chris goes off to, with um, Rose for a chat and we get this time for bingo. And this, this is, scene, this I, scene now. At this point, still in the cinema, first time watching it, I still didn't know what the fuck was going on. And I thought at this point, oh, they're going to hunt him down. This is bingo to hunt him down. That's what I thought. It was kind of going to be like a sort of slave, because, slave type thing, and they're going to hunt, hunt the, hunt the black dude. You know. Well, it's very reminiscent of slave trading because they would have all bid using paddles. Well, um, well yeah, they're they're bidding on uh, a black person's life. So yes. But 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 the way it's done, the way the camera pans across initially, you're just seeing them holding up these bingo cards, and then suddenly behind Bradley Whitfield, you've got a picture of Chris in a frame, and they're all silently bidding on on this chap. And it's just fucking terrifying, really. The blind guy wins the auction, and you think, hang on a minute, he was nice to Chris. Now he's fucking won him. What does that mean? What does he get to do to him? What's going to happen here? Chris says, I want to go. And Rose says, all right, we'll go, we'll go. It's fine. He says, yeah, I just I just want to go. And he manages to send that text of that, that guy, that picture, to his buddy Rod. And Rod rings him up and says, do you know who that is? That's Andre, the guy that went missing. I've looked him up. You must remember him. And then Chris is like, yes, I thought I recognised him. That's why I took the picture of him. And they realise that he's not called Logan. He's, he was called Andre. And obviously this is the guy from the opening scene who was kidnapped by a man in a helmet. Spoiler alert, it was Rose's brother wearing the helmet. And this is where Chris is like, we've got to go now he's really adamant that they have to leave right now she's like all right all right all right we'll go let me get some things together she goes out of the room and he spots her little cupboard open door this, open this doesn't is, he this this apparently this is what rose does every time she has a boyfriend she likes to leave the door open just for the just for her own little horrible evil sort of pleasure so because just in case the boyfriend looks in there and it makes it all worse for them she does it on purpose what does he find in the cupboard, though? He finds a load of photographs of her with different men, even the woman who is her grandmother. Yeah, Georgina. So at one point, whether she was a friend or she had a sexual affair with her, I don't know. But basically, it looks like... They all, even look, though, like, they all look like a, a relationship photo. The first, the first thing she said to Chris in the first scene of this movie is, no, I've never had a black boy boyfriend before. Well, she's had about 10 black boyfriends, judging by these pictures, and even maybe a black girlfriend. So he's like, what the fuck does this mean? I... I don't even know what this means. Um, he says to her, he doesn't question it. He just says, where are the keys? And she's like, oh, oh, they're in my bag. Hang on, let me get them. They start heading downstairs and Jeremy's blocking the door he's with a lacrosse stick. He's very hostile, isn't he? He's got a lacrosse stick. And he's like, hey, the party's just got going, man. Where are you guys going? And they're like, we're leaving now. We've got to leave. And Rose says, oh, um, Chris's dog is really ill and been taken to the vet. So again, she's, she's still, still playing along. Oh, so we're all leaving. What and he's bitch. like, what? And then the mum steps out with a little teacup. Does anybody want a tea? Oh, put that fucking teacup down. Then you see the dad looking into the uh, the fireplace and he starts reciting some weird... I don't even know what he's trying to say, really, about it. And then he says to Chris, what is your purpose, Chris, in this life? What is hey, your hey, purpose? Chris, Chris is just on edge he's just like what the fuck just rolls give me the keys and he's, he's just screaming at her in front of her parents. he's to the point where i don't give a fuck and she's just like she's she crying the, she's going i'm trying to find them she and then, and then the she keys. just goes and she says you know i can't give you these keys and he just goes fuck. his face is incredible in this when he that scene where he changes and he realizes his situation is worse than he thought and that's when ding 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 on the cup sink into the floor Oh. Did you and see how hard he dropped? Yes, I did. Now move him along. Move him downstairs. You've already damaged them enough, Jeremy. Move him downstairs. And he's in the sunken place. 
And and you hear you hear from the sunken place in that tiny little square in the middle of the screen, you hear Rose saying, You were one of my favourites, Chris. You were one of my favourite ones. And Jeremy says, Do you hear that? You were one of her favourites, Chris. And you're thinking, What the fuck? Yeah. Uh Rod at this point it can't get him. He's trying to call Chris. No answer. His uh, phone's off. He goes to the flat where, because he's been kind of feeding his dog and stuff, he goes to the flat and he's still not home. So he's just a bit concerned at this point. Yeah, yeah. It's quite a cool little side story, really. Um, it's nice to go back to that because we're stuck in this world. So to go back into this safe zone is quite nice because it's quite a, <laughs> it's quite a horrific movie, really. Like and, Rod, Rod, and Rod's just a normal... He's one of those guys that you'd be mates with who would just back you up. He would... You know, he would come out in the middle of the night and pick you up or something if he needed it. Do you know what I mean? He, like, he definitely he, wouldn't be a uh, uh, Majiggy's character in uh, Ravenous, just jumping off a cliff. <laughs> I love how you've gone back to that. Chris wakes up in the chair, in this leather chair, strapped with his hands and his legs strapped to it, and there's and a deer this, head. Yeah, well, it's supposed to represent a buck. A buck was supposed to be a black young male or something. Well, they called black men's uh, black slaves bucks. So, so this buck is going for however many got dollars a, during the auction. one above your head, I can see from here. Yeah, it's actually a buck, actually, as well. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean anything, and I'm certainly not racist. <laughs> um, I just hate animals. I love the TV in this room. <laughs> that TV is so old school. Yeah, it's real sort wooden of wooden uh, cabinet. Wooden cabinet style. It reminds me of like Twilight Zone or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I don't know why you get that kind of. Yeah, and the TV turns on, and we get to watch this program or a video, almost sort of advertising I love something. The music when it comes in and stuff. And basically, this this video that we watch now, this is Chris's. I'm sorry, this is Rose's grandparents who are in the body of Georgina and Walter, saying. This is our program. This is what we're planning on doing. And they basically say that what they're going to do is put a person's brain or mind into a younger, fitter, and in this case, a black person's body. Um, And you even see Bradley Whitfield as a younger man, and you see Rose and Jeremy as children in this video. So this has been going on for a long, long time. Like I said, they were groomed from a very young age to, to take part in this weird cult. And he explains, this is what's going to happen to you. Um, and he thinks, what the, what the fuck? It's fucking nuts. The teacup appears on screen, and he passes out again. We get a hilarious scene now where Rod goes to the cops. And uh, you think that this one woman detective that he tells the story to believes him. She's like, hang on. Then the next cut to two other fellas in there <laughs> standing behind her. This is comic time. And he says it again, he says, and, and what I think, my friend Chris, he's gotten this woman, it's a white girl, she's, he's gotten to a house in the country, and and they're all sex, sex slaves. slaves! Sex slaves! That's what they are! Sex slaves! Sex and, slaves and shit. I, mean, telling, I mean, that's shit. And, uh, yeah. and because he's telling this story to three non-white cops, you think, oh, they're going to definitely believe him. And they just end up pissing themselves with laughter. And the girl, the main cop detective, she says to the other guys, don't tell me I never do anything for you. Come on, this has been hilarious and he's like they don't fucking believe me and, why would they it's a mental story absolutely and he's by himself now <laughs> you know he, he's he's all alone with this whole theory what's he gonna do which is quite nice he says, that he's, you know. he says to them um you remember andre that went missing well look my buddy found him and he's called logan now and look at the clothes look at him a guy from brooklyn wouldn't wear clothes like this and he's going out with a 30 a woman 30 years older than him and he's like well that's probably why he's wearing those clothes if a thirty a woman thirty years older than him is married to him now, and they just keep like, ah, now you're talking shit, you're talking shit. Um, he gets hold then of he a, phones, yeah, he gets hold yeah. of it, doesn't he? Well, he phones Chris's phone. Oh, that's and, right. And Rose picks up. And Rose picks up, and she does this incredible bit of acting where her face is just dead. Nothing's happening, but she's acting scared and sad and upset. Chris left two days ago. I haven't seen him. He left his phone here. Have you seen him? She's such a pro. It's like it's she's done it like a million times before, which she has. And the family are all watching from just outside the bedroom door. They're watching their precious daughter act act this little scene out over the phone. And so he he tries to call a bluff and says, what was the taxi firm that uh, Chris used to get the taxi out of the place? And uh, she's like, ah. And he's like, It might might have been an Uber or something. He's like, hang on. And he he stops it and says, oh, you're a lying bitch. And all that sort of stuff. It's, It's hilarious. 
And then he says, she's a fucking genius. She's an evil genius. It Maybe was, there's magic involved. No, it, it can't be magic. It, it might have been <laughs> even more comical that he actually didn't put her on silent and she's just listening to him. <laughs> well, then she tries to flip it by saying, I know what you've rung. You want to fuck me. You've been looking at me anytime we've been out. And he's like, what the hell are you talking about? Chris is my best friend. Fuck you. No, don't fuck you, actually. No, I don't want to fuck you. What? And then he hangs up. And that's when he's like, she is a fucking evil genius. And he's like... <laughs> This girl's twisting me, man. It's horrible. Yeah. Um, funny scene. Again, a little bit of tension relief in the middle of everything that's going on. It's nice. It's really well done. Chris is still in the chair with the TV. And well, this wakes time... up to it. It's a little... Uh, it, it, they start going through the procedure. Phase one, yeah, it's, phase it's a two, two and phase two three. Now, because the blind guy who's going to be having Chris's body... He is saying to him, look, you can talk to me. The intercom's on. Just want, We need to be on the same wavelength. Otherwise, the brain won't, com- the mind won't really be compatible with your body. You know, these are the phases. The hypnotism was phase one. This bit is phase two. Then my mind will be taken out of me. I don't quite know. They never really explore what they're going to do, whether it's the whole brain or a piece of the brain. I think, it's it, be put it, into- I think it's a piece because I, I think if he's going to take the whole brain out, I, I assume. Well, then again, they do c- cut off the whole dome top dome of the head so um but it's it's terrifying because he says to him you understand that once i'm within your body you will have no control i will control all motor functions you'll you'll essentially be be a passenger and he says the sun can place and he goes the sun can place yeah he says i'll be the driver you'll be the passenger at this point this is like this can't be real this must be a dream i must be in a really horrific nightmare we get a little Chris. element of that of that kind old blind guy that he first met because he says, can I just ask you, why black people? Yeah. And the guy says, I don't know. There's nothing in it for me like that. I don't care what colour you are. Uh, maybe it's because you're stronger, faster, cooler. It's nothing to do with that for me. I just want your eyes. And well, he just wants to be able goes, to see again. I want your eyes, man. And it's a bit like, oh, just because he says the word man afterwards, it makes it like, a little bit more personal. Uh, I want your eyes, man. Well, Rose's dad starts the procedure, doesn't he? This is what he said. He slices the top of the blind guy's head off and he's going to remove a piece of the brain. And um, the teacup's on screen again. And Chris is watching that. But, uh, it's not very nice. The, the bald guy gets sculpted, basically, and he's getting he's going to have his brain bit taken out. But Jeremy arrives in the room. And as far as he's concerned, Chris is out cold, sat in the chair. And he starts unstrapping him. And he turns around to get the wheelchair ready. And Chris stands up silently with a croquet ball in his hand. And he smashes him over the head about three times. It's nice. It's it's well deserved as well. And the reason he didn't get hypnotized this last time is because he managed to pick cotton out of the chair, which is just incredible. Jordan Peele said he he, he understands the irony is not lost on him. The fact that (laughs) picking cotton has saved an African-American's life. (laughs) But it's fucking brilliant. And he he's put it in his ears so he didn't hear the last bit of the hypnotism. So he saved himself. So he cracks Jeremy with the head. Yeah. He then runs out and attacks the dad with a buck. So he's using a buck on the dad. Again, that it's reference a, that we talked it's a about. Like, a bit like Lost Boys, isn't it? It is, yeah. Mm. But there's no death by stereo in this death one. Death by stereo. <laughs> Um, yeah, so dad gets killed with a buck. Mum confronts Chris, and there's this like little bit of a standoff because there's a teacup just within reach, and she just goes to reach for it, and he smashes it. Um, and doesn't he stab her in the eye with the spoon or with, with the knife? She uh, he definitely stabs her through the eye. I, well, before before that, I, I love the fact that he st- he gets stabbed in the hand, and then. He doesn't That's she feel the, the pain. He, he shuts his eyes and takes the pain, and it almost looks like pleasure. He pushes his face up against her face, and they kind of just go together almost romantically for a moment. And I, I such a weird choice. And I wonder if this was uh, <clears throat> um, Daniel's choice as an actor to do this, and it's just one particular take. But I thought it was just so like. I don't know. There could be something in that even, you know. Maybe he's still a bit hypnotised and that's why he didn't feel the pain, maybe? No, 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 no. I think he's looking at her as in, like, like the mother figure and the figure she is. Or I I'm, I'm looking into it too much. I mean, as much as he knows, he's just killed two people, um, you know. He could um, just be literally in shock and his head face just touches her face and they just 
they're just in contact. But it just seemed weird. He's holding on to it with no pain. Then he goes right. He kills her right now. I'm he kills gonna her fucking too. Have you? Yeah, and he has. A, yeah. You don't really see that very well, but you don't, and you don't need to. As he's about to leave, Jeremy is actually still alive. Uh, and this is where he does his jujitsu holds on um, on Chris. And Chris remembers earlier on in a conversation that he said, jujitsu is like a game of chess. You always need to think about two or three moves ahead. And so he uses this because he reaches for the door and Jeremy kicks the door shut while he's still choking him. So he of does it again. And, he does. Back. Very good, and, then, and then the third time he thinks, I'll do it once more. And this time he does it. And as he does that... Because he's uh, pushing his knee up, so as he pushes yeah. his knee up, he puts knife down and he can get more force and impact. With the and knife. he stabs him in the leg on the third go. So he's tricked him with his own set of rules that he revealed that, to that's Chris. very, very, very fast thinking. Because if you're being choked out, you got you know you don't have long. But I do get the impression that Chris is a really intelligent guy. Absolutely. Um, you know, he's he's an artist, and he's well, he's, he would think of these. He's things. well, he's the only one who survived. Fuck yeah. He's the final girl. Um, he, yeah, he gets out. And of course, she said to him in the opening scene, it's not like my dad's going to be on the lawn with a shotgun. Well, actually, it's Rose that's on the lawn with a shotgun. So another little bookend there. And uh, she fires at him and he sort of runs off a bit. And she says, get him, Grandpa. And this is where Walter is confirmed. Walter is actually her grandpa in that body. And he, she, he runs at him because he was a sprinter many, many years ago, and he runs at Chris, knocks him down, and they sort of have a bit of a tussle. Um, I can't remember what he does to um, to Walter, but he basically steals Jeremy's car, doesn't he? The white car from the beginning, and he finds the helmet in the car as well. We never said before, uh, uh, while this was all going on, the fight inside the house, Rose was upstairs, that bit where I told you of the milk and the black straw. Uh, yeah, yeah. And she she's very slowly going through pictures on the, like a uh, a Tinder. She's trying to find your ne- her next victim. Next date, next date, yeah. And it's so um, funny. She's just slowly doing while well, eating she, very slowly, one cereal at a time with her hands, like a child. She's being as white as white. She's got a glass of milk. She's got a uh, a little bowl of cereal, no, no milk that she's eating, what, like, she and she's listening to? to the Dirty Dancing soundtrack. Yeah, the dirty dancing it's just soundtrack. like she's gone back to trying to go back to that childhood she's completely missed by grooming into this weird fucking family. But yeah, so we go back outside now. The grandpa's gone chasing after him. He uh, rugby tackles him. He gets in the car. Chris steals the, the Jeremy's car. And as he's driving, he accidentally runs over Georgina. And he says to himself again, it's a bit meta, he says, don't do it. Don't get out of the car and check on her. And then he thinks of his mum and thinks... I'm going to have to go and check on her, aren't I? And he gets out, and uh, this is where Rose sort of catches him, um, shoots at him again. Um, she attacks Chris, and I think, what happens next? Oh, she shoots at Chris. He runs He runs away. Uh, and then, what bit is it when the... When does Rod turn up? Hang on, I'm a what bit confused you, by the... You're really confused by this film. Uh, I'm excited. I think you are. Um, he gets away in the car. He runs the maid over. He goes back. He puts Grandma into the car. So he's driving down the road with Grandma. That's it. And then Grandma all of a sudden comes up and she just attacks him, pushes him, drives straight head first into a tree. She says, but you he ruined my house. You ruined my house. She, she <laughs> I, I, knocks herself out or kills herself. I know her eyes are open. I think she kills herself uh, in the car crash. So that's her that's done. Right. But then obviously got Rose all of a sudden with a fucking shotgun like a hunter coming come towards the car shooting away that's right and then this is where his phone goes off as Walter is attacking him and the flash goes off and makes him revert back to his original self and he turns around to Rose and says give me the gun I'll do it and he takes the gun off Rose and Walter shoots Rose and then he blows his own brains out yeah he, he, the the flash brought him back to his senses just at the right moment. Luckily, um, yeah, Chris Chris again being a very intelligent character. And at this point, I'm thinking this is a black guy. There's a whole family of white family killed. Oh, he's How on top. Of, he's on top, strangling, him? strangling her, and then she's just that point when he's strangling on top of her. And she's just like wanting to go, and I can't. Sm- slightly smiling, gone. I'm gonna still win because if you kill me, like you're fucking going down. She, you know, she's like, she's 
terrible. She, her acting is incredible because this yeah. cop, what we think is a cop car, pulls up now. And, every, and what does everybody think? He's going down. That's it. Boom. Like I said, it's a black guy in this, this murder the, this scene. Would it's be not going to look what, good for him. What we think is happening is the alternative ending to this film. But that's obviously cut for because the audience went, fuck that shit. So we well, get as, this scene. Well, she turns around and she goes, please help me, please. And she's really putting it on again. She thinks, ah, oh, great, the cops are here. But as the door opens, it says on the side, airport security. And out steps Rod, our hero. And Rod has managed to track him down. Um, We're TA. We handle shit. Yeah, we handle the mother... T- what it says? T-S motherfucking A. Yeah. We handle shit. Consider this shit handled. Yeah. And then he looks at Chris and says... There's a pause. And then he says... I told you not to go up in that fucking house. I told you not to go in that house. It's and, like the best... And- I told you so ever. And he's right, but we wouldn't have a movie if it had said that. It'd just been a very strange short film. And they drive off, leaving Rose bleeding out in the road. I'm guessing she's dead, unless they ever make a sequel. And that they're not. John Pill wouldn't make a sequel to this. I think he's a. I think he's. He knows. He knows. He that said that's not. He said a thing he would you'd never do. rule it out. I read I, something to say that he would never rule it out. I would say if this was, I I would say it wouldn't be a sequel. More a brother to the side and have an offshoot in another place. Mm, yeah, I wouldn't want to see a sequel. I'm happy as a standalone. You, it's just taking the mythos to another place. It's kind of like hostile, ho, um, host, hostile. Um, but I don't think you should leave it. It's fine. It's great. You don't need to. Brilliant movie. So you Thumbs touched up. on you touched on uh, a couple of alternative endings very quickly. One of them was that Chris was shot and killed by a cop. Another one was that he was taken off to prison. I've not seen him shot end, and killed by a cop. One. I don't think they filmed it. I don't think they filmed it. It was in the original screenplay, but this you, was the end that they went see, for. Because you can see the other one on YouTube. The alternative cut. I just, I just much prefer this ending. Really, you need it. Really, of course. Yeah. Anyway, um, it's, it's, a bri- it's, it's a brilliant film. It's an incredible movie with millions of layers, of layers, loads of messages. Incredibly relevant. Um, will always be relevant, but even more so right now, and, and will always be. And but taking all the racial stuff out of the movie, it's just a great horror movie anyway. Um, science fiction horror, bits of comedy in it. Well mm. written, well acted. Mm. Get out! Everyone knows it, man. It's I thought just you just turned me get out then. Get out, Gav. Get but, the fuck out. But, oh. <laughs> yeah, thumbs up for me, obviously. Yeah. Thumbs up. What more can we say, really? What a movie. Not really. I'm getting I'm getting sore in this chair. I feel like we've been here for a while. Alright, well let's uh get G- Bill in here, shall we? Give us a little rub. Bill, rub it. Bill, rub me. <laughs> Hi, welcome back to World of the Strange. Word of the strange. It's a strange old world. Yep. So I've only got one little story for this uh, for this episode, and this comes courtesy of our patron, our friend, our listener, Kate Pollock. She posted this up, so some of you guys might have already read this. I haven't actually read the story. Oh, splendid! Just saw the headline. Just saw the headline. That was you and I are both going and... blind. Yeah. Well, here's the headline, Gav. Mm. Leech swims up man's penis and drinks a pint of his blood before the doctors pull it out. Mm. Oh, God. Up the uh, urethra. <laughs> up the urethra Franklin. The urethra Franklin. <laughs> um, so, Doctor, I'll just read this out. How big is it? it? There's a picture of it. Oh, I, well, I'm it, glad I can't see it. I would it. say it's probably about five inches long. Really, really thin, like a like a tapeworm type thing. No, no, no. It's not. Oh thin. my it's, god! It's what? like as thick as a slug, and probably about five inches long. Have you ever had anything up your urethra? No. I have once. It's not very pleasant. Was it an animal? No, no. It's been having like tests. You got when you have an STD type test back in the day, you know. 
you always hear that story about people that go swimming in the Amazon and that there's that fish that goes up in there and then sticks its spines out and you can't get it out. Mm. Lays eggs. Well, let's read through this story together then, and we can discuss it. So doctors in Cambodia recently removed a leech uh, that had entered an elderly man's penis while he was swimming and had drank a full pint of his blood. So it was full of his blood when they took it out. Oh, God. <laughs> the, the unnamed patient first knew that something was awry. Yeah, after I know when he first knew, when something started going up his cog. He started experiencing severe pain whilst trying to use the bathroom. Oh. He went to hospital where a tiny camera was inserted into his penis, oh. which revealed the culprit to be a big fat leech. Oh. <laughs> Horrible. Um, the poor soul told doctors that he went swimming in a river earlier that day. And they worked out that uh, this little parasite had swum up his urethra and into Ugh. his bladder. Indeed, the hospital warned locals in a statement afterwards, saying the waters in these areas are rich with leeches and other insects, especially during the rainy season. Don't go swimming. <sighs> Unfortunately for the, the patient, though, the, uh, the removal was complicated by the fact that the leech had ballooned up much much larger than its normal size as it was full of a full pint of the victim's blood i'm almost gonna puke <laughs> hence his pain whilst trying to urinate not only that but it also injured parts of the man's internal organs with its teeth oh dude this is getting horrible i'm really not liking this at all does it finish soon it's soon <laughs> You can blame Kate for this. I didn't, I, to, I didn't read this when I saw it. Just, you know, just reasons. To safely extract the leech, doctors were forced to use a tiny probe with electric nodes and cutting tools on the end to kill the leech first before yanking it back out the way that it came in. <gasps> oh, my God. Oh my I've always finished that. Fortunately, the man was released from hospital 24 hours later and is said to be doing okay. Did he? Was he under a, a local? <laughs> it doesn't say. I hope he is under heroin. Apparently, this also happened to somebody in 2018, but it went up their nose and drank a pint of blood and they had to pull it back out of his nose that's, in China, that was. That's fine. Patient said, I've got nosebleed. And they said, yeah, you've got a massive leech up your nose. So um, that was that story. I'm going to post this up if anybody wants to see pictures oh of the leech. Oh, my God. Don't ever show me them pictures. Yeah, well, just avoid the Facebook page for a few days. But I've just up. found that really, really stressful. <laughs> I need to lie down after that. Well, there we go. I think we better get out of here pretty quickly. Oh. That was a very short and sweet. <laughs> Look at your face. His face, everybody. <laughs> I'm it's gonna, got a bit pale. I'm going to say, Dan, go and get, go upstairs and get a small rod and put it up your reefer. Yeah, I don't want to. See how that instead. feels. Then imagine Ren read this back again. Um, okay, Bill, can you get us out of here as quickly as possible? Gab's about to throw it up. Bill, <sighs> that's all the time we've got for this week on World of Strange. Next week, though, give me Ira. Hairless pets. Weird. And we're back again. Yay. We're back for episode 93. Gav is just still getting over the story about the leech. So um, I do apologise. But thank you again to Kate for that story. Thanks, um, Kate. Gav is gone. So, so pale. It's brilliant. <clears throat> well, that was episode 93 with us celebrating and discussing black representation in horror we hope we've done it justice it's a, a really relevant and topic that we wanted to be extremely respectful of and careful of um, but also to be ourselves so we feel we've done that um, yeah there we go and as mentioned and this will be the last time I mentioned it but I just want to mention that we are proud uh, supporters of Black Lives Matter and are giving our doubling our patron payout for the month and giving that to the Black Lives Matter Cools. So there we go. A little bit of donation from us just to try and help out as much as we can. Uh, it's nice to be able to use a platform like this to do something like that. Well, Gav, uh, it's been a fun episode. It's been a really interesting episode. It's been fantastic to talk about Get Out it's and a classic like Candyman as well. I, I thought it was really good to ha just have these conversations. Um, really, really good. I, I don't often be able to uh, have con converse in such a lengthy conversations <laughs> like it hell you're still thinking about the leech <laughs> um 
about well, such matters is what I mean. So yeah, it's nice to do it with you. Before we talk about what's coming up next, I just want to give a shout out and a thank you to our latest patron, hey, Kevin. Thanks, Kev. Kevin, thank you so much for your very, very kind message. Uh, lovely to hear from you. We really appreciate your support in every way. And we're glad that you enjoy what we do and love what we say. And I'm glad that you're a Hollyoaks fan. Little secret private uh, yeah, joke there. Thanks. Thanks <laughs> for the email. It's very, very nice. Very sweet. Yeah, it's really lovely. Um, so, what is coming up next? Well, episode 94 is time for more probing. This time it's going at the bum. <laughs> Where else was the probing going to be? <laughs> well, the leech was at the front. Oh. So, uh, this episode 94, we're going to be doing some UFO movies. We're doing Fire in the Sky. Oh, that's sweet. And we're doing The Fourth Kind, which. Hopefully that doesn't scare me as much as it did the so, first time I saw that. So does that mean I can watch lots of alien shit? Yeah, loads. And you can tell us about the time you thought that you had uh, like a... Been getting probed. Yeah, something like you had a growth or something. But we'll, we'll get into that. We've talked about it many, many years ago, but it'd be fun to talk about that again. Um, that's 94. 95, we are going, getting all hairy because it's time for Dog Soldiers and American Werewolf in Paris. Yeah. Can't wait for that. Yeah, that's going to be fun. Werewolf, CGI werewolves. Oh, yeah, in Paris. Yeah. Werewolf, werewolf boobs in that one, if I remember right. It's all a bit weird. Hairy, hairy werewolf CGI boobs. Oh, no, no, they're not, are they? There's a legless werewolf as well at one point. There if is, I on the bed, yeah. Mm-hmm. And he gets off, the, pulls the bed down and cut a and tries to pull himself along. And episode 96, we are excited to be doing our third John Carpenter special. And for episode 96, we'll be doing... We've picked a movie each, so I picked They Live, and Gav has picked Escape from New York. Bit of Kurt Russell. Dun, 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 dun. Brilliant stuff. So that's, that's your next episode, isn't it? Got that right. Uh, dun, 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 dun. That's no, that is, precinct for, that's Oh no, precinct you are right. Yeah, yeah, of course you are. You're right. <laughs> you should uh, know. You're, you're the music man. Uh, also, Gav, cast of Cthulhu. Yeah, I was on uh, the recent uh, Cast of Cthulhu uh, uh, show was uh, released and it came out just a couple of days after we released our last show, so I couldn't mention it then. Me and Tom were on there uh, talking about Dead Bolt films and uh, Lovecraft stuff and things like that, etc, etc. Um, it was, um, uh, yeah, it was alright. Those guys themselves actually had on the episode prior to that they actually had an epi- uh, a conversation about uh, Lovecraft and the fact that he was a massive racist and the fact that they're doing a, a podcast based on Lovecraft and f- yeah. Lovecraft in films so that is actually quite an interesting discussion between the two guys they're two um, New York fellows Jim and James um, yeah it's quite interesting So it's um, a really a really interesting you, interview with you and Tom as well oh cool I haven't listened to it back um, but yeah yeah it's okay. really fun Oh, cool. Thanks, man. Um, and we talk all about Deadbolt films and stuff. But yeah, Cast of Cthulhu, you know, it's Lovecraft stuff. I'll, um, I'll repost it back up on the Facebook page. I did post it up uh, a week or so ago, but I'll repost it up along with the pictures of the leech so um, that everyone can see that We as well. did also just release episode four of the High Strangeness podcast, me and Sarah. Um, uh, uh, we're talking about Munchausen's by proxy and that whole thing um, and we talk about some crazy sort of story and it's quite a more lengthy episode it's about 2 hours 20 minutes um, it's quite a full on story in that episode yeah it really is there's lots of tangents and things um, of the story itself um, but yeah check that out if you're into that sort of true crime type shit um, and uh, what we're talking about other podcasts I've got another little guest slot coming up on RJ McCready's show Bite Size Cinema uh, I'll be discussing the classic 80s vampire movie Lost Boys it's, which I'm excited it's, it's to it's do it's lockdown isn't it that's why we're doing so much stuff at the moment podcast wise I know it's crazy isn't it it's brilliant it's because of yeah, well, yeah until it comes back again and we're like right listeners we'll be back in five months <laughs> patrons all dropping off no one bothering anymore <laughs> yeah well we will try and keep it up as much as we can but sometimes it probably won't be as quick as we have been as recent but at the moment it's it's okay so yes well, uh, sorry I, I interrupted you there continue all good, that's all good we're talking about patrons as always want to want to um, thank our patrons so RJ McCready Lemiao Kate Pollock Rachel Elizabeth Sarah Kay and Kevin S. Fife our newest patron thank thanks you guys so much guys support. 
Um, and to anybody else that wants to support us, you can find us on Patreon. And like I mentioned in the intro to the show, you can contact me or Gav if you can't find the link. Uh, if anybody wants to support us, it really does help us keep producing shows, equipment, etc., etc., etc. And we really support, we really love the support, and we're thankful for it. So thank you guys. Um, as always, we are a proud member of Legion Podcast Network. Where can you find us? You can find us on legionpodcast.com, along with all the other shows on the Legion Network. We're most active on our Facebook page. Just go on Facebook and search for the podcast on Haunted Hill. Same with Legion. There's a Legion podcast page and just a great place to chat about horror movies, movies in general, silly things, anything, anything to set your mind off all the weird news and stuff that's happening out there. <clears throat> we're, we're available on most podcast platforms, including Spotify, YouTube, uh, Podknife, the Apple Podcast, Podcast Addict app and the Podbean app. We're on Twitter with at Haunted Podcast. Uh, we're on Instagram with the podcast on Haunted Hill Insta. And Gav mentioned Deadbolt Films just now. And you can find out more about our little production company, Deadbolt Films, uh, on deadboltfilms.com. There's also the Deadbolt Film YouTube channel where you can find lots of our shorts and silly little movies and things that we've done, including Gav and I running around a graveyard at midnight and me shitting myself. That was a fun well, time for me. That was years ago. We got to a new one. We should do a new one. Oh, also, Deadbolt Films on Instagram and Twitter is at Deadbolt Films. I was going to say, with my uh, my new camera that I purchased earlier this year, to film lots of new things, then the pandemic swept across the world and I've <laughs> filmed one music video, which comes out this Sunday, actually. Oh, I'll quickly plug, plug that. Uh, Saw Teeth. If you're into uh, metal, um, uh, Saw Teeth's a band, and they've got a video coming out this Sunday, which I made. Um, but that's it apart from that what I was going to say is that the camera I did get it works really well in the dark I can light up stuff which you can't generally do very well um, so we could really get some good <clears throat> shit at night time walking around graveyards well um, you said you recent- got a good graveyard there, you, didn't you yeah, I was just about to say recently um, well not recently um, up until lockdown I was walking through a graveyard and back every day on the way to work and it's one of the biggest graveyards in Bristol and <clears throat> it's pretty open it doesn't lock at night, uh, so we could go in there at night. And uh, yeah, at one point, actually, Alice and I were walking through there at like 6 a.m. on the way to work, and we got really freaked out and then realized it was just a statue at the end of the path. But the positioning of it, it looked like a figure nice. stood at the end of the path. So imagine what that would be like at midnight with should, my, with me. You know, well, we should the, try and get someone else with us as well, so it's like three of us. That'd we could bring, uh, I mean, I'd say we could bring Alice, but she, we get, wouldn't get, get her. Oh my god, Kate would shit herself. Absolutely. You'd be shitting yourself, wouldn't you? Yeah, I mean, I tell the story about me jumping out of Kate in the cinema that time. That was brilliant. What was so, that? Uh, we went to, I can't remember what movie we went to watch now, but uh, we came out of the the movie. There was like a bunch of us from my where we worked together and a couple of others. And I hid around behind a pillar, and as she came out of the women's toilets, I jumped out like, and she screamed the cinema, man. I oh, fucking hell. I thought I was going to get arrested. <laughs> But it was hilarious, so I'm sorry, Kate. For being like a pervert. Is this, is this man a pervert? I wasn't in the women's toilets. I was outside the women's toilets. I was just generally saying you're probably a pervert. Okay. Okay. There we go. Well, it's a good night from Candyman. Yeah, it's a, it's a good night from... I don't know. Jordan Peele? I don't know. It's not very inventive, is it, of me? It's a good night from the... Uh... Time, time, ladies and gentlemen, that's time. No, no, that is me with I my cup and scissor, you donut. I know it is. I don't think it's you and a bland lord. Time, ladies and gentlemen, time. Time at the bar. Time at the bar. And it's a good night from Tommy Cooper, I guess. We mentioned him earlier. It's a good night, Tommy Cooper. It's a good night from you. And it's a good night from me. It's a good night from you. And us. And everybody. Me. Yeah. Well, guys, stay safe, love each other, look after each other. Thanks again for listening, and we'll be back very, very soon. Take it easy, ladies and gentlemen. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the podcast on Haunted Hill. We will be back again real soon.